good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants of International Conference for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure 2021. My name is Sandeep Pondrick, and I am the Director General of CDRI. I welcome all the participants on the second day of the International Conference. We had a great day yesterday. We started with the inaugural session in which we heard global leaders, including Honorable Prime Ministers of India, United Kingdom, Fiji, and Italy on their vision of how to achieve climate and disaster resilience, and also what are the actions urgently need to be taken for achieving that. As Prime Minister Modi said, no one is safe till everyone is safe. And in our quest for resilience, we should not leave behind any community, any place, or any economy. The second session of the day was on health infrastructure, where policy makers and experts discuss the impact of COVID-19, not only on health infrastructure, but also on other infrastructure systems. And one of the key takeaways of the session was what Ms. Lauren Brown said that one of the important things in tackling COVID-19 is to put factual information in the public domain so as to prevent the spread of misinformation. The next session was on global risk and resilience assessments where experts from leading institutions in the world discussed risk and resilience assessments which are need to be taken. And as Professor Jim Hall of Oxford University said, that these tools and data analysis will enable us to design better interventions as per the need of the societies and economies all over the world. The next session and the last session of the day uh, was where we heard high-level functionaries including Dr. P.K. Mishra, the Principal Secretary to Prime Minister of India, Mr. Akim Steiner, the Administrator of UNDP, and Ms. Mami Mizotori, the UNDRR Chief. While Dr. P.K. Mishra brought out the significance of need of countries to leapfrog to integrated planning for infrastructure systems using the latest data analytics and tools, Mr. Akim Steiner brought out the fact that only 16% of the stimulus packages announced by countries are addressing green recovery or green development. And Ms. Mami Mizotori made a strong statement that we were never on road to climate resilience even before COVID-19. So yesterday was a great day with visionary speeches and scintillating discussions. We are now moving into the second day of the conference. And we are starting the day with a very, very important topic that is climate risk and resilience of small island developing states. As all of us are aware that small island developing states are prone to extreme weather events and climate change threats. They also have the additional constraints of remoteness from markets as well as connectivity issues. They have critical challenges as well as significant opportunities which can be, which can lead us to resilience. As the Honorable Prime Minister of Fiji in his speech yesterday said, there are no shortcuts to resilience. It is a process of planning and execution. So we will be dis discussing these issues in this session. I will be now handing over the session to Ms. Noel O. Brown. Ms. Brown is the principal climate change uh, and, uh, specialist in the Asian Development Bank, and she has large experience working in Africa as well as East Asia in the, on the issue of climate change in DFID and ADB and other multilateral organizations. Over to you, Ms. Brown. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Director General. Um, I'm very pleased uh, today 
Um, so let me begin with warm greetings from the Asian Development Bank in Manila. Um, let me, uh, our keynote speaker today is Dame Meg Taylor, um, and let me introduce you to her. Uh, Dame Meg Taylor is a national of Papua New Guinea, and since 2014, she has been Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, the first woman to hold that position. Under her leadership at the Pacific Island Forum has revitalized its approach to regionalism through the framework for Pacific regionalism and has guided the forum's reinvigorated engagement as a collective entity under the Blue Pacific identity. Dame Meg is a lawyer by training and she began her professional life as private secretary to Chief Minister Michael Samare in PNG. She was admitted to the bar in 1977, and she has practiced both public and private law. Dame Meg attended Harvard Law Business Law School in 1985, where she obtained a master's in law. Prior to her appointment as Secretary General, Dame Meg was appointed the Vice President of the Office of Compliance Advisor Ombudsman of the World Bank Group in 1999. She set up the CAO and led the office for 15 years, establishing a rich body of work on accountability and recourse for communities impacted by projects supported by the private sector arms of the World Bank Group. Under her leadership, CAO has become internationally recognized for its cutting edge work in addressing corporate community conflict around the globe. Dame Meg has served as ambassador of PNG to the United States, Mexico and Canada. She has been recognized by her government for her exemplary public service in 2002 and was it made a Dane Commander of the Order of the British Empire. As Secretary General, Dame Meg also carries the role of Pacific Ocean Commissioner and as such advocates for the secure future of Pacific people based on sustainable development, management and conservation of the Pacific Ocean and its resources. Um, and let me, without further ado, let me welcome Dame Meg. Thank you very much, and uh, let me um, just say how delighted I am to be with you all this afternoon. So, Your Excellencies and distinguished panelists and ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon from Suva here in Fiji, and thank you for the opportunity to address this virtual conference on a topic that is pertinent to small island developing states across the Pacific. Small island developing states face uh, unique, vulnerable, unique vulnerabilities, and most especially here in the Pacific region. We are now faced with a three-pronged crisis. The crippling impact of COVID-19, the devastating effects of climate change and disasters, and the fragile economic well-being of our region, which has been exacerbated by the current pandemic. At the core of the Blue Pacific's resilient development agenda is a fundamental need to reduce the vulnerability and exposure of our people, communities and infrastructure to risks emanating from climate change, natural hazards, as well as health epidemics and pandemics. While this is our aim, our countries are constantly faced with cascading risks occurring in parallel, such as the recent experience by the Pacific Island countries in responding concurrently to COVID-19, tropical cyclone Yasa, Anna, and Harold. And this often puts significant pressure on public systems of small administrations and the role of government to manage the economic impacts from those risks. Pacific Island Forum leaders have recognized climate change as the single greatest threat to our Blue Pacific region. Each year, more frequent and severe cyclones, floods and king tides bear down on the Pacific, wreaking devastation and winding back years of development gains. Disaster-related economic losses are higher in the Pacific Islands than almost anywhere else in the world. Indeed, four 
Category 5 cyclones have hit our region since 2015. And just this year, three cyclones have already wreaked havoc in Fiji. Cyclone Pam in 2015 caused damages equivalent to 64% of Vanuatu's GDP. In 2016, Cyclone Winston wreaked havoc in Fiji with damages totaling 31% of GDP. In 2018, Cyclone Gita caused destruction in Tonga, equivalent to 38% of GDP. So these are just a few examples of how climate exacerbated disasters can wipe out decades of development gain in a matter of hours. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the Pacific is faced with a constant state of recovery from disaster related destruction to public and private infrastructure. This has exacerbated the debt burden on Pacific Island governments, which, further, which has further worsened due to COVID-19. Regional, <clears throat> despite these challenges, our Pacific leaders continue to be proactive in the global fight against climate change. Following their strongest ever climate change declaration in 2019, the Kanaka 2 Declaration of Urgent Climate Action Now. This declaration calls for climate smart development towards achieving a 1.5 degrees by the end of this century, essential to safeguarding the future of our blue Pacific continent. Globally, our region is the first to have adopted a regionally integrated approach to resilience through the framework for resilient development in the Pacific, which seeks to enhance resilience to climate change and disasters, promote low carbon development, and strengthen disaster preparedness, response, and recovery. The Pacific Resilience Partnership brings together government, private sector, civil society, and development partners to realize the goals of the PRDF. Sorry, the FIDP. A valuable lesson learned from the onset in ensuring impacts of COVID-19 is that our world is interconnected and the impacts of transboundary issues are unavoidable. This year, 2021, will no doubt test our Blue Pacific resilience. What more can we do to retain resilience in the face of multiple threats that we are forced to contend with? This is an opportunity for our region, for the world at large, to consider climate smart response and recovery measures. Over the months and years to come, economies will recover. But this is a chance for nations to plan and build back better, to include the most vulnerable in those plans and to shape 21st century economies and societies in ways that are healthy, clean, safe and more resilient while also focusing on the overall well-being of our human condition. Let me turn to the challenges and opportunities in Pacific Island countries in incorporating resilience infrastructure systems in their development agenda. Many of our members already recognize the importance of integrating resilient infrastructure systems in their development agenda. This is reflected in their national development plans, strategies, infrastructure investment plans or country program pipelines to global funds such as the Green Climate Fund. Your Excellencies, let me share with you three key points on how we can better respond to the infrastructure needs of the SIDS. Firstly, a key challenge that we have observed in the Pacific in the implementation of infrastructure project is the lack of close coordination between line ministry leads on infrastructure, on the projects and national planning focal points. If we had coordination, it would ensure the sustainability of infrastructure projects and the budgeting of any subsequent maintenance costs that may arise without placing undue stress on the national budget processes. In Tuvalu, the government has recently established a special infrastructure fund. This is currently 100% domestically funded. However, there is an intention that donors can contribute up to 10% of the value of the future infrastructure investment projects for ongoing maintenance cost. 
So donor support for such in initiatives is critical. The approach in Kiribati with the South Tarawa, um, the South Tarawa Road Rehabilitation Project was supported by the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank and the Government of Australia. And it includes climate proofing with the intent for no maintenance cost over the next 30 years. Secondly, during disaster events, both public and private infrastructure are damaged. While there is momentum in climate proofing public infrastructure, support for building resilient private infrastructure, including residential homes, remains limited. This is due in part to the lack of appropriate building codes and affordable insurance options because of the associated costs. Both government and development partners can have a role in subsidizing costs to ensure the resilience of private infrastructure. And thirdly, we in the Pacific need to transform our development model so that we are not always dependent on external support. We need to be more innovative in finding sustainable solutions to our challenges. An example of this is the work progressed on the Pacific Resilience Facility, a unique forward-looking Pacific owned and led initiative aimed at mobilizing up to 1.5 billion US dollars to allow the region to invest in upfront, low quantum and high impact, small scale community resilience, building and disaster preparedness infrastructure projects. A global pledging conference is planned for the second half of 2021 and any support from the private sector and international community is most welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, the climate change and disaster crisis are cross-cutting. Both require a holistic and whole of government approach. They are crises that, are, that also require government to reach out to civil society and the private sector as integrated innovative solutions are needed. For Pacific Island countries, this is an opportune time to prioritize risk-informed and risk-considered development planning. This will enable our infrastructure systems and facilities to withstand unforeseen pressure from the impacts of climate change and disasters, including pandemics such as COVID-19. Infrastructure development that supports building back better will be a key part of the second phase of COVID-19 recovery efforts for Pacific countries. It helps stimulate their economies and get people back to work. Countries may, must prioritize infrastructure planning, and investments with high economic returns, short payback, and strong multiplier effects. In closing, allow me to reaffirm two points. Firstly, innovative solutions within our region should be encouraged and supported. And secondly, sustainable and genuine partnerships are needed to enable a resilient pathway for infrastructure development in the Pacific, in the, in the, in the, in the Pacific. I look forward to the support of all development partners in making this reality in our Blue Pacific region a reality. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dame Meg, for those very insightful uh, words. Um, just you've really highlighted the, uh, the challenges that the Pacific is facing uh, those huge numbers in terms of GDP losses with the tropical cyclones since 2015 are, are, are really striking figures in terms of percentages of GDP. And then even the recent ones in the last uh, 12 months with TC Harold and, and Yai etc. Um, and also uh, very much appreciate your insights into the recommendations that you've given us today. These points about close coordination, uh, the support for building resilience of private in infrastructure, the, the focus on building codes and insurance, um, and also uh, your initiative on the building resilient, the, the Pacific Resilience Facility, and the fact that you will have a pledging conference later in 2021. Um, this uh, notion of this, the need to support innovative solutions is, is, is her, I think, her, heard loud and clear from you for, for each of the SIDS. So I know your schedule is extremely busy. 
Um, so I want to say um, thank you on behalf of the organizers and, and the participants today for giving us the time and um, very much appreciate the, all of the work that you've done uh, with PIF over the years. Thank you. Um, let me move along now and introduce you to our panelists and our discussants for today. Um, I hope that uh, you can, can see everybody. Oh, and um, also one of um, Dane Meg's colleagues will, will be joining us also for the remainder of the session. Um, our first panelist today is uh, Ms. Fasiti Soko. Um, she has spent many years working with the government of Fiji and she is now serving as the director for the National Disaster Management Office in Fiji. She is skilled in GIS, databases, environmental awareness, report writing, geography, and cartography. So we're very pleased to have you with us today. Our spec second speaker will be Mr. Mamura Satoro, who is the advisor for the Global Environment Department of JICA in the government of Japan. Now, Mr. Mamura has been working with J JICA for, for 26 years. And he has served in a range of fields, including uh, global environment, disaster risk reduction, and sustainable development. He joined the Global Environment Department of JICA in June 2020, and he is now assigned as a chief advisor for the promotion of regional on the, the regional initiative on solid waste management in the Pacific. Uh, this work is being implemented through uh, Japan's technical cooperation with the Secretary of the Pacific Environment Program, SCREP. So welcome to, to you, Mr. Mamura, for this panel. Um, our third panelist is Ms. Barbara Reichson. Uh, she is the team leader for the economic cooperation, investment and agriculture at the European Union delegation for the Pacific. Uh, based in Suva, Fiji. Now, Barbara believes that addressing climate change and promoting green economic growth will be cornerstones of sustainable development in the Pacific region. Working in a team with seven enthusiastic and experienced program managers and thematic experts, she is the lead for the EU-funded programs to support diversified, sustainable, and resilient economic growth to strengthen economic governance. Uh, Barbara graduated from Wageningen University in the Netherlands with a Master of Crop Science. Um, she has also completed a Master's of European Governance and Administration combined with the University of Potsdam and the Sorbonne. Since 2005, she has been working with the European Union with a focus on rural development and development cooperation. Outside of the office, she combines her passion for gardening with the loving care for her three children. And our fourth uh, member of today's session will be Mr. Robert Johnsey. Uh, Ro Robert is the Chief Inv Investment Officer for the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific now. And prior to joining AIFFP, Rob spent 20 years with the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank, including as ADB's Regional Director for the South Pacific from 2014 to 2018, and also as the World Bank's Regional Coordinator from 2009 to 2014. So he brings a very in-depth experience with the Pacific. In these roles, Rob has involved, been involved in mobilizing over $1.2 billion in new financing for the region, including for major infrastructure projects such as the South Tarawa Road project that Meg referred to, um, also the, uh, the, the Avatu port in Cook Islands, uh, the ICT cables for Samoa and Tonga, airport runway construction and rehabilitation in several countries, and um, of also uh, a lot of work in renewable energy generation. So thank you to everybody for joining us. I'm going to begin now with some questions to Ms. Um, Soko. Um, and I'd just like you to begin with sharing your experience on the recent, the impact of the recent catastrophic events 
um, such as the tropical cyclones that have been impacting Fiji and various sectors of the economy um, and critical infrastructure. Thank you, Ms. Soko. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, for the uh, for Fiji's case, uh, since uh, tropical cyclone Winston in 2016, which was a Cat 5 cyclone, the um, number of people affected equivalents to 540,400. Uh, number of evacuation centers activated at that time, 758. Um, that was a Category 5 cyclone, uh, and we matched it against tropical cyclone Yasa that happened last year. The number of people affected uh, was 139, with numbers of evacuation center activated 312. This gives us an idea of the implications and the category of cyclones that have been hitting our region that is causing people um, to, to either uh, be severely affected but also causing displacement across the board here in Fiji. Uh, with regards to the pattern of the cyclone, uh, what we've noted in our studies here, uh, since 2019 to 2000, um, since 2019 to 2016, uh, an average of one cyclone is experienced in Fiji. Uh, however, from 2017 <coughs> to this year, an average of three cyclones uh, are now being experienced in Fiji. And uh, just for last year alone and this year, a tropical cyclone Harold with category four cyclone, um, we responded within the confinement of COVID-19. So Fiji was already experiencing tropical cyclone Sarai, which was a category three, while we were still responding to category three cyclone, uh, we had COVID-19. And so restrictions were put in place before TC uh, Harold hit Fiji. Um, so in, in the context of um, the implications on our infrastructure, uh, not only has it been severely affected by the, the recent cyclone, but also implications to the life of Fijians. Um, COVID-19, uh, across the world has severely affected our economy. Fiji has been bombarded not only with COVID-19, with TC Harold that hit, has, uh, that hit Fiji in 2000, uh, and 2019, a category four, and then we were again hit by TC Yasa in, uh, uh, to, in this year, uh, followed by Anna, which uh, accompanied a lot of rain. So our infrastructure uh, was exposed uh, at all level. Um, having said that, um, the importance of implementing resilient um, mechanism in place to ensure that investment are put to good use. And this is something the Fijian government uh, is working towards through, through the endorsement of the National Disaster Risk Reduction Policy in 2019. Um, and can I ask you specifically, Vasiti, uh, where do you see the infrastructure of vulnerability and disaster risk? Can you maybe focus in on that and how you see the differentiated risk? Sure. Uh, I'll give an example in this case. Uh, in 2000, uh, after TC Winston, uh, the impacts after TC Winston affected a lot of our infrastructures. The Fijian government put a lot of emphasis on rebuilding schools and public building. And I'm happy to report that when we had TC Yasa, um, the uh, 68 of these public schools, uh, public building that was within the path of TCSA maintained minimal damage. Um, that shows the significant, uh, the importance of resilient uh, development and including the mitigation of disaster risk reduction into our development. Um, we've noted through the, uh, the increased number of residential homes that have been affected every year in an aftermath of a cyclone, um, there is uh, a need for Fiji, which we are currently doing, reviewing our national, disaster, national building code to ensure that the residential homes are also able to withstand uh, category uh, or uh, all cyclone winds that hits our region. Um, so uh, again, pointing out the importance of uh, resilient building uh, that will not only save lives, but also save money um, in future. And you've started to talk about some of the government policies. You've made reference to the building code. Do you want to um, elaborate the work that the government of Fiji is doing? Sure. 
Um, so for the Fijian government, uh, we align ourselves to uh, different aspects of international uh, frameworks. Uh, we uh, re report to the Sendai framework. We also report to the Paris Agreement, the SDG goals, the Boy Declaration. Um, through those international alignment, we develop national policies, uh, such as the Green Growth Framework for Fiji, uh, the Dipl Displacement Guideline, uh, the National Development Plan, and as I'd mentioned earlier, the National Disaster Risk Reduction Policy. In these policies, are uh, elements of resilient building and a resilient economy. The Fijian government is very particular and is moving towards nature-based solution. So the need for us to actually uh, look into localized knowledge and see how best we can um, adhere to those knowledge uh, to ensure that we not only save lives, but also save money and build back better. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think you've, you've really uh, shared with the participants those catastrophic events that, that are impacting Fiji. Um, and also with that, the importance of preparing your infrastructure for those events, and then the importance of how government policy is supporting those efforts uh, with your aligning uh, with the international frameworks, but then um, matching your national policy for those. So, so thank you very much for sharing that experience from Fiji. I, I would now like to direct um, some questions to Mr. Mimura. Um, uh, Mr. Mamura, from your experience of implementing infrastructure projects in the Pacific Island countries, what mechanisms have been adopted to integrate resilience into infrastructure planning and development? Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, um, small island countries have this advantage of narrowness, remoteness, and diffusion. So special consideration for these is required for development. And um, they are under high exposure to natural hazards and uh, vulnerability to climate change. In particular, uh, these characteristics increase disaster risks, as well as the damage caused by disasters and uh, delayed uh, recovery. So uh, disaster resilient infrastructure facilities are needed to reduce disaster risk and damage. And they also secure access for restoration work after disasters. And uh, uh, I think it is necessary to apply uh, appropriate technologies that meet the severe natural conditions of island countries. And uh, we are striving to improve the quality of infrastructure facilities, um, such as resistance to cyclones. And um, I will talk about some cases. Um, bridge replacement project in Samoa, uh, in its capital, uh, just opened last year, uh, incorporates those factors into its design. The bridge construction project uses a hundred year flood resistant designs and uh, uh, salt resistant materials. In case of Tonga, uh, their wind farm have a structure that allows them to lie down in strong cyclone winds. Um, including us, the developing partners support construction of high quality infrastructures to protect vulnerable, vulnerable land. Um, above all, um, it cannot be done without the administrative capacity for the island nation to formulate and implement uh, policies and the budget for the maintenance of facilities. Um, so uh, human resource and the capacity, de capacity development is indispensable for island countries to do these things autonomous, autonomously. Uh, for many years, uh, we have provided financial assistance for infrastructures to small island countries, as well as support for human resources development. Uh, every year, we invite people in charge of disaster management from the Pacific and the Caribbean islands for training courses. 
And uh, last year's course was supposed to be conducted remotely due to COVID-19, but it provides an opportunity to learn about soft and hard from uh, our disaster risk reduction and uh, build back better experience. We believe that not only uh, financial assistance, but also capacity and human resource development is indispensable for the introduction of appropriate quality infrastructure in the Pacific Islands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now for Ms. Bixon, um, what are the different initiatives undertaken by the European Union that have worked in addressing disaster and climate risks um, that have, they've supported the PICS uh, to enhance resilience? Yes, thank you very much. Um, namaste, good afternoon and a heartfelt Buddha Pinaka from the European Union delegation in Fiji. Um, as you may know, climate action is at the heart of the European priorities. In uh, 2019, the European Commission has presented its ambitious European Green Deal, which is guiding Europe in the fight against climate change in close collaboration with its international partners. With the European Green Deal, the European Union will scale up its climate-related actions and we will increase our efforts enhancing resilience in Europe worldwide and definitely also here in the Pacific region. Already now, we are very much engaged in addressing climate and disaster risks. For example, we are currently collaborating with the government of Samoa through policy dialogue to support the development of resilient infrastructures. This policy dialogue uh, takes place in the, content, the context of a 25 million euro budget support program. We experience a great mutual commitment with our partner countries here in the Pacific notably when addressing climate change and disaster building uh, and building disaster resilience through budget support. It is the strong advantage of budget support that it puts our partner countries into the driving seat regarding the development and the implementation of climate and re disaster resilience targeting policies and reforms. Another interesting example is the scaling up of Pacific adaptation projects. This 80 million US dollar uh, project is currently under implementation in 10 Pacific Island countries. It contributes to the implementation of the 2017-2030 framework for resilient development in the Pacific, which has been endorsed by the Pacific leaders in 2016, as well as the Paris Agreement. This unique project distinguishes itself from former projects because it is designed as a response to lessons learned from prior actions successfully implemented under the Global Climate Change Alliance Plus. The Global Climate Change Alliance Plus is an European flagship initiative, which is supporting small island developing states to increase their resilience to climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, Mr. Mamura, can I come back to you and ask you to highlight some of the learnings and the challenges that you've faced while implementing those infrastructure projects in the Pacific? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, since the uh, Pacific Island countries are small in both population and economy, uh, it is necessary to secure a budget for their own expenses and uh, uh, persons in charge of project management. Even when facilities uh, being developed with the support of partners, securing administrative offices with 
these experience and uh, skills is essential. Um, in small island countries, the most of construction materials are often imported from overseas, so uh, which adds a transportation cost. The high cost is a, a headache for all the uh, uh, administrative officers as well as the uh, um, uh, development partners. Uh, combined with the high labor cost, um, construction costs, uh, sometimes tens of percent higher than making the same in Asia. Uh, but small island countries are very vulnerable and they need quality infrastructure that, uh, that are as good as or better than uh, continental nations. Um, uh, this picture is about the uh, uh, bridge project in Samoa, as I mentioned before, and the next one is the uh, uh, Tonga uh, wind ban. And um, we need this kind of uh, uh, high quality infrastructure, especially in the uh, small and vulnerable uh, island, but the cost is a very big headache. And uh, uh, when we think about the uh, um, efficiency or uh, uh, economic efficiency of, uh, of the project, uh, the beneficiary population in small island is relatively small. And the uh, economic value of the asset which was protected by being developed facility is also low uh, in the island. So uh, the cost benefit analysis figures for infrastructure development are always low in small island countries. Um, yeah, this is a very headache for the development partners when they explain the economic adequacy of the project. However, this is a matter of life and uh, uh, island may, may disappear while we are concerned about the economic figures. So uh, as for island nations, we need to change the way of thinking and uh, uh, interpret the adequacy of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and Barbara, can I also ask you to highlight some of the uh, major challenges that the European Union has highlighted with implementing projects in the Pacific? Yes, of course. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, same question, almost same answer also from us. Um, there are two uh, major challenges I would like to highlight here. And the first one for us is the high frequency of natural disasters in the Pacific. And secondly, it's uh, very similar to what uh, Mr. Mimura Satur already mentioned. It is the small size of Pacific Island countries and their population and the resulting high cost of disaster resilient infrastructure. Climate change has influenced the prevalence of natural disasters and the Pacific uh, countries are no exceptions in this. Actually, the Pacific is one of the most disaster prone regions in the world and in terms of recurrence, severity and the scope of natural hazards. The region is particularly affected by natural disasters, such as tropical cyclones, as we already heard uh, from the first speaker, droughts or flooding, causing significant economic damage. Since my arrival here in Fiji six months ago, I already met, uh, witnessed two uh, major cyclones, Tisiasa and Tisiana, uh, an earthquake, and a tsunami warning. Now, this might not mean much for uh, many of us here in the audience, but if you come from a small country like the Netherlands in Europe, um, these events, and especially their frequency, are quite impressive. I noticed that uh, responding so to such events occupies the limited uh, capacities and financial resources of governments. 
distracting them from long-term reform efforts. I therefore feel that upfront preparedness and the capacity to reduce such risks deserves our attention now more than ever. It means investing in strengthening of early warning systems for natural hazards and improving the institutional arrangements for risk management and disaster preparedness. The other major challenge that I mentioned relates to the unique geographic situation of the countries in the Pacific. The Pacific Island countries are among the most remote places on earth with beautiful dreamery beaches and small populations are dispersed over many islands. It is not rocket science to realize that this comes with a high transaction costs. For example, for transportation, as already highlighted, or the import of building material. As a result, the very high cost of disaster resilient infrastructure are even further increased. And with that, I pass over back to our moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Barbara. And I think we've we've heard some really key points there. Some to, for all us all to take away this um, need for the infrastructure infrastructure to be resilient to cyclones. This questions about the operation and maintenance of infrastructure after investments are, are constructed. Uh, the importance of cap capacity development. Uh, we've heard about the EU initiatives, uh, specifically about the Green Deal, uh, but also your Pacific adaptation projects, scaling up adaptation efforts, and then these challenges. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go back to that I, in the interest of time. I'm, I'm going to move along and come back to um, Ms. Uh, Soko. Um, could I ask you to highlight the high priority areas of Fiji's infrastructure, which requires attention over the next five years, uh, particularly in relation to long-term uh, building of resilience. Uh, thank you very much. I just have four uh, very specific ones for us this afternoon. Uh, the first one is a robust national regulation related to resilience. Uh, this includes building codes and other sectoral standards that are priority. Um, Fiji, in the last month or so, have developed a technical working group for uh, disaster resilient infrastructure, which is a, a mixture of both the private sector as well as government stakeholders. The key finding of this technical working group is to ensure that we share each other's projects and lesson learned and knowledge to ensure that we embed or embrace each other's development within the confinement of resilient infrastructure. Uh, the second one is resilient recovery codes and standards to be applied in the cost of resilient recovery efforts for infrastructure. Uh, as I mentioned, over the years with the different cyclones that we've had, infrastructure stands to be the highest sector with the most incurred costs. Uh, for that reason, the need for the Pacific to have uh, resilient infrastructure has never been needed than ever before. Um, and therefore the technical working group will be looking into these codes and standards to ensure that every development within the infrastructure sector is uh, resilient or climate proof to some extent. Um, the third one is the disaster data for infrastructure is a gap. Uh, this has been alluded earlier by the previous speaker. The role of disaster loss, uh, the data for infrastructure method of its collection and reporting this needs to be strengthened. Uh, lesson learned from previous projects that have been implemented in Fiji, uh, the need to localize the development of this methodology to ensure that we are able to rationalize with the recommendations that are within um, this report. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the methodology and the collections is very much uh, in need to be localized so that it's easier to adapt considering climate change impacts in the Pacific is more prominent now. Uh, and the final one is just the inclusion of private sector standards and disaster data are also relevant for the private sector. Uh, Fiji government has taken the initiative by including the private sector in the technical working group for disaster resilient infrastructure 
to ensure that we speak the same language, to ensure that the policies that the government develops adhere to the needs of also the private sector because they okay. contribute to the economy as well. Can I just ask you very briefly, just one in one minute, can you explain how does the government of Fiji use the technical and scientific data to support risk-based approaches? Just very briefly. Okay, uh, thank you. I was just doing, uh, for that answer. I mean, I was going to give you a breakdown of the Fiji. For Fiji's case, 27% of Fiji population lives within one kilometer of the coastline. 76% eh? live within five kilometers of the coastline. So you can imagine the populated area in Fiji uh, in terms of infrastructure stress because of the current locations of our population. Uh, so when it comes to uh, use of science, uh, the development of nature-based solution is what the government of Fiji is now investing into. Um, the, the use of hybrid seawall, this includes mangroves and vetiva, to ensure that villages that need to be relocated are improvised in the near future uh, so that further studies can be done to them before uh, a final decision is made in regards to their relocation. We also use vetiva grass uh, as, a, uh, as a solution towards landslide. We've just relocated, okay. we've done it. Okay, I was going to add more, Sorry, we'll, we'll, we, I can see lots of questions also coming in from the audience. So uh, Mr. Mamura, uh, would you um, recommend that the development needs, how would you recommend that the development needs and priorities as highlighted by Fiji can be addressed? Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, I think the uh, building codes uh, is it is very important for to to save lives uh, of the uh, people and uh, uh, we JICA have been uh, provided the uh, technical cooperation uh, the training courses uh, for building uh, to to to. Uh, improve the building code in the developing countries. And uh, uh, also um, uh, the response and recovery from the uh, uh, di big disasters. Um, I can introduce the several new initiatives uh, underway in Fiji. Uh, Fijian government and the JICA um, have signed a, a disaster standby loan contract in 2019, uh, and uh, it is the first case in the Pacific okay. region. And uh, based on the agreement, about uh, uh, 20 million uh, US dollar was disbursed for the disaster caused by the uh, cyclone Halol uh, last year. So, okay. and also ADB and JICA uh, are collaborating uh, to uh, mitigate the uh, uh, flood risks in Nadi, the international yes. uh, nearby the international airport of the country. Yeah, thank okay, you thank you very much, Mr. Mubura. Um, Barbara, can I come to you and just briefly, uh, could you share some of your recommendations? Yes. Um, uh, only two days ago, in the build-up of the to the COP26, Fiji's Prime Minister uh, Baini in Marama. Uh, called for stronger commitment and collaboration in driving co co comprehensive action to combat uh, climate change and to build climate resilient uh, societies. So keeping this commitment as a top, uh, top priority on uh, the political agenda is a key element uh, to continue addressing climate change. I also would like to congratulate Fiji uh, on its efforts towards the, the draft climate change bill, which is a very comprehensive piece of legislating aiming at embedding Fiji's commitments to the Paris Agreement into national law and therefore further translating its official ambition into action. I am pleased to say that Europe is committed to support Fiji in its front-runner role in the fight against climate change. 
in the for the coming seven years, our target is to dedicate 30% of our financial assistance to climate related actions. But we will not stop here. Europe has more to offer than financial support alone. And an example that I would like to mention is about the use of technical and scientific data for risk management and disaster preparedness and re the response. And in particular, the use of Copernicus data and services. Copernicus is Europe's Earth Observation Program. It provides on a daily basis 12 terabyte of Earth observation open and free data. It is the third largest data provider in the world after Amazon and Google. These data coming from Copernicus can inform evidence-based policies and interventions on disaster preparedness and response. As is the case in other parts of the world, the European Union stands ready to support countries in the Pacific region to get access to those data themselves. We can also provide expertise, know-how and training to increase the uptake of Copernicus uh, data. And this data can help to improve the efficiency and the robustness of civil protection measures, thus increasing the resilience and the, of the entire region to natural and man-made disasters. And by that, I give Thank back you. the floor. Thank to you very much. Uh, we, had, we have a huge discussion a huge region for a very short time. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to our discussant, Rob Johnsey. Uh, Rob, with all your years of experience based in the Pacific, working with the World Bank, uh, ADB, and now the AIFFP, uh, it would be really good to hear some of the highlights that you've taken from the discussion so far. Thank you very much, Noel, and let me thank all the panelists I'd particularly like to acknowledge Dame Meg, you know, while she, she has had to leave. Um, you know, she's an absolute Pacific legend, um, you know, an illustrious career both with the PNG government and the World Bank before two successful terms um, as the Se Secretary General of, of the Forum um, and a leader in outlining the vision of a blue Pacific continent, which, which I'll come back to. You know, one of the things I've heard from all of the speakers is highlighting um, just how vulnerable small remote Pacific Island communities are. The Pacific really is on, on the front line uh, of dealing with both climate change and disasters. Um, you know, just as one uh, small factoid, since 1950, the Pacific has experienced almost two and a half thousand cyclones. That's that's an average of about 40 cyclones a year, um, causing about 10,000 deaths in that time. Um, and as Dame Meg noted, um, several Category 5 cyclones just since 2015, three of them, Cyclone Pam, Cyclone Winston, Cyclone Gita, causing over a billion dollars um, of damage to, to the island economies. Um, I think as Fiji Prime Minister Bani Marama um, and NDMO Director Vasiti have noted, disasters cost Fiji, for instance, about 100 million US dollars a year on average. That, that's about 2% of GDP each year, every year. Um, lost from, from disasters. And obviously climate change is, is going to exacerbate these risks, particularly but not only for, for the low-lying atoll states. I think, as Dame Meg reminded us, also worth remembering that risks come in many forms. Um, thankfully, the Pacific to date has managed to avoid the worst of, of the COVID pandemic. Um, but we do see risks increasing, including in, in Papua New Guinea. Dengue and measles outbreaks in the Pacific over the past few years have highlighted vulnerabilities and the economic impact from border closures, even when countries have been able to resist the virus, has been tremendous. Fiji uh, economy is likely to contract about 20% this year as, as a result of COVID. So many, many risks. But despite all of that, you know, one of the things I, I, I hear is 
you know, and I think again, Dame Meg reminded us, and and Pacific leaders have have been determined that the Pacific has also proven resilient despite its vulnerabilities. Um, and I think this is something Dame Meg and, and Pacific leaders have highlighted with their vision of, of a blue Pacific continent. Um, as Samoan Prime Minister Tuliepa uh, told me once, you know, the Pacific are not just SIDS, small island developing states. The PM said they are the boss, big ocean states. Um, and I think it's worth remembering Pacific Island, Pacific people have been voyagers for millennia. Uh, the Pacific people are custodians of, of the world's largest ocean, covering a quarter of the, the, the globe. You know, Kiribati, just uh, as an example, a population of 100,000 people, but an exclusive economic zone the same size as continental India. Um, so I think, you know, a, a lot of experience dealing with vulnerabilities, dealing with disasters, a very resilient population and the starting point to me for any discussion about building resilience has to be about how do partners like us um, listen to um, and respond to the priorities and the advice from Pacific people themselves. Um, you know, I think they make highlighted the importance of overcoming what she described as, as the constant state of, of recovery. Um, you know, I heard several consistent themes uh, coming through uh, the presentation by most speakers about what this might mean in terms of solutions. First, I think I heard a message that we all need to support Pacific countries to build their own capacity to respond, to build buffers. Um, you know, it's just one example. Small states over the past decade have worked together to dramatically, dramatically increase the revenues they get from their fisheries resources. And I think by you know, mechanisms like this, the countries themselves build economic buffers, build their own capacity to, to respond. Second, I heard a message coming through most speakers that external financing needs to be provided very flexibly in a way that supports Pacific countries' own priorities and capacity to prepare for and respond to disaster. Both Barbara and Mimura-san highlighted the way uh, the European Union and Japan are increasingly providing budget support very flexible financing um, to be able to help uh, Pacific countries respond and to put them in the driver's seat um, in terms of developing and implementing climate change strategies. And this is something the banks and other partners like Australia uh, are also considering. And I think Dame Meg outlined the Forum Secretariat's uh, proposal to establish a, a Pacific resilience facility again, to support Pacific communities build resilience to, to disasters. So, you know, a clear message about the importance of donors providing finance, partners providing financing in, in very flexible ways. The third theme I heard coming through most presentations was the need for preparedness and resilience to be built in to all infrastructure investments. Um, BG Prime Minister Bani Marama and NDMO Director Vasiti spoke previously about the power of planning um, and the importance of building back better. And I think a highlight of this, you know, schools and other assets that Fiji was able to rebuild after Cyclone Winston in 2016 were able to survive Cyclone Yasa um, more recently. Similarly, I think Memura-san emphasised the importance of high quality uh, infrastructure, building to a standard that requires limited maintenance for long periods of time, such as the South Tarawa Road. And I think a clear message that partners need to support domestic efforts to ensure appropriate 
long-term financing for infrastructure maintenance rather than just building new assets, whether that's through budget support, through more project-specific interventions. And the fourth theme I, I heard coming through most presentations was that a new approach means bringing in the private sector. Um, there's potentially a couple of elements to this. One uh, is about how to expand insurance coverage for households, building standards, and that's something uh, Dame Meg and Mumura-san and the CD all touched on. Um, and similarly, particularly at a time when governments are facing you know, limited capacity to expand uh, spending, particularly as a result of, of COVID, how do we look to attract new private investment, uh, whether that's in renewable energy generation or providing infrastructure services to government in a way that won't increase debts uh, for specific governments. Finally, um, if you'll allow me, I, I just want to note um, Australia is obviously committed to working uh, with Pacific countries and other partners to support the Pacific Zion efforts to build resilience. I think the Prime Minister has announced a, a major Pacific step up, including giving Pacific people opportunities to more closely work either in Australia or to increase Pacific exports to Australia. <clears throat> the Prime Minister also announced that Australia would provide 500 million uh, over five years from 2020, specifically to help Pacific uh, countries with renewable energy, climate change, disaster preparedness. That's part of our annual $1.4 billion um, cooperation program with the region. And of course, we're very pleased with the new infrastructure financing facility that should make $2 billion of financing available to the Pacific over the next few years. But of course, you know, we're only one part of the solution. Um, we need to work with Pacific Island countries, with other partners, um, to reflect Pacific countries and Pacific people own vision and priority. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, Rob, for that excellent summary. Um, we have quite a few questions coming in from, from the audience. Um, so if I could address the first of the questions to uh, Ms. Soko, um, based on your experience, what kind of support handholding would the Pacific SIDS require to achieve disaster and climate resilience for infrastructure? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, the question is quite general. Um, uh, for it to be a bit more specific, if I if I if I speak on building code, as uh, alluded earlier, um, PG, um, we we've done our groundwork. Now we're looking for, or we are in need of a technical assistance, who's an expert, not only in uh, putting together our um, our legislations and the work that already been done, but also uh, empowering. Uh, the building code to have the resilient uh, component in it. Um, this is something that uh, the Fijian government is very uh, passionate about to ensure that all developments moving forward since Winston has a resilient component in it. Um, so from Fiji's, uh, with regards to the building code, the fact that we need to update that. Uh, this was done back in the 90s. Um, the need for us to have further support on technical uh, assistance or technical expert uh, to bring in that resilient component and to bring the document together before it's tabled back to government. Um, and there are so many other elements uh, for for instance, uh, for, uh, for the director and DMOs in the Pacific, the, the different needs that rises from their different area of expertise. Um, again, for preparedness uh, component in Fiji, uh, the Fijian government uh, together with Japan are looking to extend our tsunami siren. Uh, with that extension of the tsunami siren, the need for us to also um, invest into, uh, you know, the facilitation of uh, bu buoys that can so also act as tide gauge. Um, so the, the, the equipment and the technical expertise are two things that need to be considered uh, when bringing uh, further support to the Fijian people and the fact that we need to localize the, um, you know, the terms of reference that for those that come to work in the Pacific to ensure that the reports that are done 
uh, will be implemented and um, in a way uh, that is also useful for government to, to further refine uh, in, in, in future. Thank you very much. Um, and I think that's a really excellent example just uh, about how much work is involved in, in just implementing the sirens for tsunamis. And, and can I bring that uh, an associated question to Mr. Mamura? Um, what is your view on the technical and scientific data that is currently missing um, for the development of disaster resilient infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, due to the uh, um, lack of the uh, uh, facilities uh, to get the data, I, I mean the in we have been working with uh, um, uh, world meteorology organizations about uh, enhancement the capacity of the uh, data collection and uh, weather forecasting in the Pacific. But the uh, uh, islands are so much scattered and uh, it's not easy to get the uh, uh, sufficient data uh, covering all over the Pacific. And uh, also uh, the lack of the, uh, um, the, the uh, number of officials who deal with uh, such uh, uh, business. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mamura. And I just have time maybe to ask one question to Barbara. Um, and I know it's it's a short time you've been in the Pacific, but maybe do you have any comments on the role of the private sector, especially micro, small, medium enterprises and how they can contribute to resilient infrastructure? If you can just share with your, your thoughts with us briefly. Sorry, uh, I had a little bit problems with unmuting uh, the system. Um, yes, thank you very much for uh, your question. And indeed, uh, I've been here only for a very short period of time. And uh, but it's good that you also raise uh, the the role of the private sector here in the Pacific in, in this field uh, of uh, interest. Um, Actually, what exactly would be the role of the private sector is not so much uh, uh, my expertise to say it like that, but uh, certainly what we make as a policy here at the European Union is that we very much would like to involve and to stimulate private sector uh, investments in Fiji in general, but of course, very much targeted on climate change and disaster resilience. So this has a very uh, strong, is very much in our focus. It's one of our priorities. Um, we are just at the start uh, of our new investment uh, program. Um, so we are just building the whole environment to be um, in the situation to enable private sector investments more. But certainly it will have a, fo a focus on climate change and disaster resilience. Okay, so I can see that. The, thank you very much, Barbara. I can see feel that the curtain is closing in on us. So um, before I wrap up, I really just want to say thank you very much to again to Dame Meg and the team at the PIFs. Very much appreciate your time uh, to Mr. Um, Memura, to uh, Miss Bixon, to uh, Miss Soko. Uh, thank you very much for fielding questions. Um, I think uh, Rob, Robert Johnson gave an excellent uh, summary and I think I wanna just leave you uh, with some of those key points. Um, everybody today has just uh, brought out the sheer number and intensity of the hazards that are facing the Pacific countries. This can not be understated. And in terms of other points we've heard, uh, the huge importance of seeing these small island states as big ocean states, they are responsible for huge parts of the ocean. 
um, and the need to listen to the people from the SIDS as we take recommendations of how to move forward. Uh, we've heard a lot about building capacity, uh, that capacity is included in, 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 in the example of the revenue generation and the huge successes around the fishery sector. We've also heard about development partner and the need for these flexible financing arrangements. That, that, that's a, a very clear message to us. Uh, we need to build in resilience and preparedness into all of the infrastructure, um, not, just, not just, I think, even into the design, but also planning and location are factors that, that we really need to consider. And then private sector, Barbara has touched on the role that the European Union is taking, but we've heard about things like the building codes, that especially for, for the private sector, uh, we've, we've touched on insurance and we know that there's a whole range of insurance initiatives being explored in the Pacific from, from the full sovereign insurance to, to micro uh, level household insurance. So I think, um, I'm, I'm, am I correct that I'm now over time? And so um, I'm going to hand back to the CDRI team. And once again, uh, thank you very much to all the participants. Thank you so much, Noel. This was really a very enriching and wide ranging discussion on the perhaps one of the most important and critical challenges before us about how to make the small island developing states resilient to climate and disasters. We had, a, we had many important points discussed, but I think the I, two quotes I am taking with me, the one is that SIDS are in a constant state of recovery and the other that SIDS should be called not small island developing states, but big ocean states because they cover so much of ocean. So with that, we will be closing this session. CDRI will be working on the critical challenge and opportunities of small island developing states. CDRI is building up a program, co-creating a program with our member countries and organizations in consultation with the small island developing states, the already established mechanisms and facilities, and obviously our members and member countries and organizations. We will also have a discussion on the Caribbean region in the evening, that is 8 p.m. Uh, Indian India time, where we will discuss the specific issues related to Caribbean. So thank you everyone for joining this session and we will be back at 14.30 India time for an exciting session on innovations and emerging technologies. Hope to see you back to discuss and to see and to learn about what is happening on the cutting edge of technologies in the climate and disaster resilience arena. Thank you. We will be back at 14.30. Thank you, everybody. Have a good
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants of the third international conference on disaster resilient infrastructure being organized by Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Today is the second day of the conference, and for those of you who were not able to join us yesterday, let me briefly recapitulate the first day's happenings. We started the sessions by the inaugural session, where we heard the Honorable Prime Ministers of India, United Kingdom, Fiji and Italy about their vision of resilience vis-a-vis uh, vis climate and disasters and the urgent actions to be taken to achieve that. As the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi said, no one is safe till everyone is safe. And in our quest for resilience, we cannot leave any place, economy, or ecosystem behind. The inaugural session was followed by the session on health infrastructure, which was really very topical in view of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the experts and policy makers discussed not only impact of COVID-19 on the health infrastructure systems, but also on other infrastructure systems. One of the quotes from the session was that, which was made by Ms. Lauren Brown, that putting factual information in public domain and communicating it is of vital importance so that spread of misinformation can be prevented. The third session of the day was about risk modeling and resilience. Experts from leading institutions who are working on risk and resilience studies discussed the resilience aspects and studies and need of such studies. What Professor Jim Hall said in the session that the data analytics and such technical studies can help us in designing the interventions in such a way that they are in, as per the need of the societies and economies in all parts of the world. The last session of the day was when we heard high level functionaries like Dr. P.K. Mishra, the principal secretary to the prime minister, Mr. Akim Steiner, the administrator of UNDP, and Ms. Mami Mizotori, the UNDRR chief. Dr. P.K. Mishra emphasized the need to leapfrog countries from, uh, to integrated infrastructure planning so that they can use the advanced data analytics and tools which are available now. Mr. Akim Steiner mentioned that only about 16 percent of global uh, stimulus packages which have been announced by countries are addressed to green recovery and green development. And Ms. Mami Mezotori made a strong statement that we were not even on, on the road or on the path to climate resilience even before the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So that was the yesterday's conference, a day of speeches with vision and scintillating discussions. Today we started the day with a session on one of the most important geographies of the world, that is the small island developing states in the Pacific region. We had the SIDS representatives as well as the Secretary General of Pacific Island Forum and other representatives of institutions who are working in the area. And some of the key quotes which I can say now were that the Pacific has proven its resilience in spite of the vulnerabilities. SIDS are in the constant state of recovery because of the frequent disasters and that the Pacific countries should not be called states, but boss, the big ocean states, because they are the custodian of the largest ocean of the world. So now, with all that background, let us move to the next session, which is an exciting session about innovations and emerging technologies. As all of us know that whenever we are in a state of adversity, we turn to innovations and technology. And the last one year and more has proven that. 
we are holding this conference only because of the advances in digital technology. Our homes have turned into our offices and we are able to get in touch with our colleagues across the world using digital technology. The unprecedented pace with which vaccines have been developed again show the strength of technology in biological field. So to discuss these and many more important issues, now let me turn to Dr. Arunabha Ghosh who will moderate the next discussion. Dr. Arun CEO, Chief Executive Officer of Council for Energy, Environment and Water. He is an author, a policy researcher, a columnist and as co-founder of, as a founder CEO of CEW, he has taken and led this institution to one of the leading institutions and research institutions of Asia. He is also the, he is also the co-founder of Clean Energy Access Network, which is in short called Clean and the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council for Clean Air. So before handing over the session to Dr. Ghosh, let us see a short video on innovations and emerging technologies. Disasters disrupt all aspects of our lives. Our health, the houses we live in, the cities we inhabit. Disasters are everywhere. And they are becoming more frequent, deadly and unpredictable. So, how can we become resilient? We innovate. In simple words, innovation is the creation of something that improves the way we live our lives. Creativity and innovation can help us to develop solutions for big and complex problems. Recently, innovation coupled with high-end technologies have helped us to face disasters efficiently. After the Fukushima earthquake in Japan, underwater robots helped in finding the missing nuclear fuel in the reactor core. During COVID-19, strong telecommunication infrastructure allowed people to work from home and helped in the tracing of COVID patients. New technologies of data collection and computing power can provide more reliable information to support building of disaster-resilient infrastructure. 3D printing, virtual reality and biomimicry are the next big things with the potential to revolutionize design and the building of infrastructure. The enormous potential of innovation and technologies is being recognized globally. Governments and institutions have also launched innovation competitions and incubation centers. As we imagine a disaster resilient world, we cannot imagine it without innovation and new technologies. So let's come together. Let's imagine. Let's innovate. Let's make the world a better and a more resilient place. Good day to all of you from wherever in the world you are watching us. We've already entered the second day of the International Conference for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure and I'm delighted to welcome you to this very important session on what innovation can do to help us make our infrastructure more resilient. I'm Arunabha Ghosh. I'm the CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water here based in India and we work across uh, many emerging uh, economies across the world. What is infrastructure and what is innovation? Infrastructure is not just engineering and concrete, although that is very important. Infrastructure is not just about the digital backbone that is often needed, although that is important. Infrastructure is also about governance capacity and infrastructure is also about the resilience of communities. When we bring these four legs of the stool together, the technology, the finance and business models, the governance capacity, as well as the resilience of communities, then we can be looking at innovations across all of these domains to make, make sure that whatever we are working on lasts not just for now, but for many decades into the future and keeps delivering value for the purposes that this infrastructure has been built. It is in that vein that innovation also has to be oriented towards the way in which we use infrastructure, not just the way in which we build infrastructure. How does the physical asset 
the natural environment and the human capital interact and where are opportunities for innovation to make each of those elements resilient. Where are opportunities for technological innovation and where are opportunities for innovations and financing mechanisms? Are the best technologies being deployed or are they being sidelined because they are found to be too expensive or too risky to be invested in? If we begin to think about infrastructure in this holistic manner, if we think, begin to think about innovation in this design oriented manner, then perhaps we will manage to, pun intended, create a bridge between the resilience of infrastructure on one side and the innovations that can drive it on the other. Today you are going to hear from a stellar set of panelists and keynote speakers through the afternoon. And I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce all of them before I turn to our first keynote speaker to speak. Dr. Anil Kakotkar, the former chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission of India, former secretary to the government of India for the Department of Atomic Energy, could be considered the doyen of the nuclear energy establishment in the country. He joined the Baba Atomic Research Center way back in 1964 and since then was instrumental in all the atomic energy innovations that India developed through the decades. He currently devotes his time on various issues relating to energy, to education and to social development. He has been propagating in fact an idea called silage, how a knowledge based ecosystem can bridge village and city technology gaps to make the economy far more resilient and vibrant. And it also gives me great pleasure to say that Dr. Kakotkar serves on the board of my institution. Dr. Kakotkar's keynote will be followed by three outstanding technical presentations on different innovations from across the world. You will hear from Ms. Jacqueline Hood, who is the Highways Market Director uh, for Amy Consulting from the United Kingdom. Ms. Hood has a background in geography and has been leading the strategic consulting team at Amy Consulting um, and has worked extensively with various institutions such as um, the UK uh, Highways Authority, Transport Scotland as well as local authorities. She works with these institutions to identify and deliver the data driven solutions and technologies with the goal of driving better decision making in real time but also transforming infrastructure and driving value in that investment. Amy will be followed by Mr. Ahmed Dinur, who is the CEO of Seismic AI, a company based out of Israel and the winner of the World Bank Tech Emerge competition. Mr. Dinur has been leading high tech ventures in Israel for the past 15 years. He joined Seismic AI as co founder and has revolutionized earthquake early warning systems making it quicker, more accurate, more reliable and more accessible, effectively democratizing earthquake warnings. He now is leading his team with the application of physics based array seismolo seismology to enhance tsunami early warning systems and you will hear a lot about this in his presentation. We will then hear from Ms. Olga Plumakers, who is the director for Nellen and Schumann's a company based out of Netherlands and again a winner of the World Bank Emerge, Tech Emerge competition. Ms. Plumaker started her career as a hydraulic consultant at Nellen, at Nellen and Schurmans after she completed her, her masters at Delft University in the Netherlands. She specialized in the field of urban water management and climate adaptation and then became the head of the department for urban water management. She has been involved in the development of 3DI, a state of the art hydrodynamic simulation software for pluvial, fluvial and coastal floods and in, in 2019 she was promoted to the management team of her company as a director of the business line for consultancy services and from her you will hear about how innovation solutions can be looked at in terms of predicting and responding to floods in different domains. After these three technical presentations we will get a little bit of a sense check 
and how do we shift from that innovation, the technological innovation story to the systems dynamics that we also want to ensure that we have an eye on. And for that we have Professor Bani Banerjee, the director for Stanford's climate, Stanford Change Labs and who's known for his pioneering work on systems innovation. He's been working in this area of innovation and design for 30 years and is well known for his pioneering work in design thinking and more recently in advanced systems based innovation methodologies and systems leadership based uh, uh, systems leadership models for large scale transformations. From Professor Banerjee, you will hear why it is important to not just look at the technological side, but to understand those interactions within the wider ecosystem of governance, of community, and of other systems with which our infrastructure interacts to make sure that the resilience is not just a one-off, but is embedded across these systems. Of course, it's not easy to do any of that, but that's why we have to keep our eye on those important matters. And to close off the session, we will then hear from Brazil. Dr. Osvaldo Luiz Leal de Moraes, Director of the National Center for Monitoring and Early Warning of Natural Disasters, the SEMADEN, in the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation in Brazil. He is a graduate and doctorate in physics from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. His field of expertise is in atmospheric science, sciences. Currently, he's acting as the director of SEMADEN. He's also the chair of the Standing Committee for Disaster Risk Reduction from the World Meteorological Organization. And previously, he's been director of research and development policy and programs in the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation in Brazil. So, as you can see, we have a panel comprising people from across domain areas, from across geographies, and from up across elements of that innovation and infrastructure bridge that I was referring to. But first we want to hear from all of you. If you look at your screens, there's a tab for a poll. And we want you to answer the question that I'm going to pose to you. In your opinion, which types of innovation can be most effective in building disaster resilient infrastructure. The options you will see are technological innovations such as high tech products and process innovations or system innovation focusing on policies, on governance models and administrative capacity or three, social innovation, wider inclusion of community, community behavior and of course the local culture and four, financial innovation to enable the investments in resilient infrastructure. So please take a couple of minutes to go to that tab and give your results, uh, give, your, give your opinions, and we'll convey those results back to you in a few minutes from now. But now it gives me great pleasure, and in fact, it's my privilege to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Anil Kakotkar, to provide his systems level view on infrastructure, on resilience, and ensuring that our urban, our rural, and everything in between is built to last. Dr. Kakotkar. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Am I audible? Yes, Dr. Kakotkar. We can hear you. OK. Thank you. Uh, so let me first of all express my, my thanks to the organizers, the organizers of the conference on disaster resilient infrastructure and in particular this particular session on innovation and emerging technologies for uncertain future. I want to begin with an anecdote. I happened to be traveling in a train on holidays when tsunami struck India on December 26, 2004. And uh, the area that was affected also included uh, Kalpakam, where our nuclear research center, there are reactors, power plants, they are located. And I got the news that there is uh, uh, kind of, you know, the tsunami has hit, and particularly in the residential community 
which is uh, several kilometers away from nuclear site there have been many many casualties i reached uh, the kalpakam site immediately thereafter there was obviously uh, a uh, very bad scene scene of deluge as it were and uh, there was on one side uh, the important and urgent thing to take care of the uh, the serious damage to life that has taken place in the residential colony and also there was a lot of anxiety particularly among people about what is happening or what has happened to the nuclear facility and uh, i had actually worked on uh, to look at you know safety and uh, disaster syndrome earlier and that was my testing ground to look at this and i found that one big factor was irrational fear and that driving people at that time in a scenario like this and their second is a disaster syndrome and two are not the same but uh, and both are actually different than the what one may call a, a rational view about uh, about safety i'll come to this point a little later but it's important that when we talk about disasters we have all the three elements in view when we talk about infrastructure again as was mentioned earlier uh, you know we have to deal with all kinds of infrastructure the critical infrastructure uh, which uh, are of course important and they have to be engineered to take care of extreme events extreme events triggered externally or extreme events which could be triggered internally within the system and uh, we must have the design of the infrastructure done in a manner that in the rarest of the rare extreme event the uh, the infrastructure will stand then there is general you know the habitat the cities the townships and so on now uh, i think there is it's, it's equally necessary that there is a reasonable level of disaster resilient and uh, or disaster resistance and climate resilience in the dwellings which we have for the people and i think this is an area where we need a lot to lot to do i was involved in shaping the technology vision 2035 when i was in taifat and there uh, one of the statements which has been made in those documents is to ensure that all dwellings are disaster resilient resi resistant and climate resilient and there should be a possibility of medical evaluation uh, promptly in any case no later than 1 hour and there should be a helipad in every panchayat the local self government but the view of infrastructure is not limited to that it actually goes beyond uh, it it actually talks about the society and the uh, infrastructure which is utilized by the society and the recent example when there was massive distress reverse migration from cities to villages during the following the lockdown in the recent pandemic has shown serious weaknesses and livelihood instability in our urban infrastructure so that's another important element about infrastructure now when we design infrastructure for extreme events we also need to recognize that the definition of extreme event or the design basis event as it is called uh, 
it's not a fixed entity in time even for natural events like cyclones floods and things like that uh, i think there is an interference between human activities and what happens in nature climate change is a classic example so even if i had designed an infrastructure for so many thousand years return period uh you would find that the intensity to which the infrastructure is likely to be subjected during its lifetime becomes somewhat larger than what it was designed for and there is a need to carry out review and retrofit and there must be some scope to accommodate this additional need in the design or at least uh, uh, the, there should be a design for accommodating such uh, such retrofits and this This has been felt the need uh, uh, time and again, and I'm sure some of our eminent experts would address uh, this. Uh. The next aspect is early warning system, and there are technologies which have evolved quite a bit, including uh, earthquake. And I'm glad that we are going to have a presentation on that. But it's important that you have very dependable, credible, and robust early warning system. which gives us as much of lead time as is possible and finally after having incorporated all these elements we must have area by area or facility by facility emergency response plan uh, which includes preparedness response and recovery in order to lessen the impact of disaster so the disaster management framework has to cover all this at multiple levels uh, because it's a question of uh, management organization of resources and responsibilities for dealing with all humanitarian aspects of emergencies so which includes evacuation sheltering relief supplies transportation communication which must be both secure and reliable a control center from which you can guide activities and which must have the required level of smartness and intelligence and a very dependable and robust decision support system and you would immediately notice that all these areas are matters of really high technology which has been evolving continuously and uh, and so there is a lot of scope for for innovation now having made that broad introduction for uh, uh, aspects related to disaster and the resilience that we need to build in uh, i want to make three specific points first is uh, to recognize that uh, the there is a continuous dynamics at work whether it were talking about natural phenomena or whether you are talking about man made phenomena and as i said earlier the two are inter interrelated now to me in the context of disaster management uh, sustainability actually amounts to minimizing interference of man made activities in natural processes you know you design an infrastructure and you find that uh, the assumptions made as to maximum flood or maximum storm uh, that you would see they become no longer valid uh, in a period of 10 years or 20 years and uh, one needs to carry out review is actually a result of uh, man made activities on the natural process that interference and secondly it's important that we should be able to quantitatively understand these interrelationship and their impact and this is an evolving area i think uh, uh, we are in my view we are still at very early stages of this knowledge domain but i think there is great need to be quantitatively correct on this understanding now adaptability 
ability to resi resilience against disaster uh, you know this issue keeps on coming because uh, the instability in events which cause disasters natural or or even man made or even natural uh, is because the rate at which things are changing and uh, with the uh, call it impact of man made activities or impact of advent of technologies i think the rate of change has become uh, much faster than it was earlier and so uh, i think we are creating a lot of gradients in both man made processes as well as natural processes and in complex systems many of these gradients do lead to instabilities and then that becomes an extreme phenomenon and so while we must improve our understanding quantitative understanding of these phenomena i think it's important to realize when we are all talking about sustainability we must realize that, that you know the way we conduct ourselves the, the way human beings are you know what is our concept of development and uh, we factor that in in a manner to make sure that we don't contribute to heavy instabilities getting into the system so that is the first point that i wish to drive the second point that i wish to drive is related to to understand the disaster syndrome which i mentioned earlier and this is actually linked to human mind and nobody wants anything that might cause a disaster or that has a semblance of a disaster in his or her backyard there is that nimbi syndrome operating so we need to treat infrastructure and neighborhood together and have a robust response plan where there is a shared ownership between the facility or the infrastructure and the society at large and the uh, the two should act in a manner that we keep these extreme events under check now uh, i said that uh, the infrastructure could have uh, you know issues can arise because of infrastructure on the neighborhood or the vice versa and so one important element in uh, in ensuring that infrastructure is robust is to depend on what are known as passive systems because you know the chance of active systems failing is somewhat higher compared to passive systems failing and so that is one element and even uh, very large uh, complex systems one can configure them with maximum passive safety and you will get more robust performance but it's not as if passive systems don't fail and that has something to do with the ethics in human society which i suspect are getting degraded so uh, you know the these passive structures also tend to age passive structures also tend to fail because of various flaws or defects that get left in and so we need to in fact think of an innovative society that is creative and so, and sensitive both with respect to technological innovation but also with respect to way uh, infrastructure should be configured with a society i want to end with the last point and that is with respect to cooperation or potential cooperation among the cdri partners i think it's important that there is uh, active knowledge sharing experience sharing and resource sharing and there could be many innovative approaches right within that framework and also uh, we must deal with transboundary aspects in case of disasters and that also has multiple dimensions so early warning relief rehabilitation and and so on so friends uh, uh, it's a large domain a very important domain uh, an evolving domain 
and i'm sure the experts uh, who are a part of this panel would enlighten us in terms of how the innovation uh, will play an important role in spite of the fact that there is so much of uncertainty in the context of uh, disaster or disaster resilience thank you very much thank you dr kakotkar you for outlining the uh, the step by step framework that we need to build resilient infrastructure but also those critical insights that you brought out in terms of recognizing those continuous dynamics in creating a society in your words which is both creative and sensitive and hopefully if we have societies like that across nations then we can also have the cooperation that you are seeking um i'm going to quickly give the poll results we have uh, in first place with 40.6% uh, of the votes coming in for system innovation and in second place for 29% with 29% of the votes for social innovation and with 24.6% of the votes technological innovation uh, only 5.8% of the votes have gone for financial innovation i guess we assume that if we can get the systems and the social framework right and the technology to embed the money will flow but let me now turn to the technologists and see whether they would agree and without any further ado let me invite jacqueline hood of amy consulting to make her technical presentation we are running a little behind time so i'd request all the technical presentations to stick to their time limit of 7 minutes thank you jacqueline Hi everybody. Uh my name's Jacqueline Hood. Uh I'm a market director at Amy Consulting. Um what I really want to focus on if we could go to the next slide please. Um what I'm going to focus on in the next 5 minutes or so is um using data, innovation and technology to actually drive decision making around our infrastructure. So using those aspects to make better decisions around operations of things like bridges. Um but also using that data and, and and technology to drive better understanding of where our risk areas are in terms of those assets and infrastructure and this has never been more important with the ongoing climate emergency we're seeing more and more severe weather events more variability in our weather and we need to understand how our infrastructure is behaving during these events um but also to then manage those uh the the infrastructure after those events as well so we don't get any surprise failures as we saw in Italy in 2018. Oh, if we could go back one slide. Thank you. Um where Amy Consulting has done a lot of work in this space around using data and technology to drive these better decisions um is up in the Forth Road bridge uh, up in Scotland. So this is an area um or the the bridge I should say is a massively important uh, piece of infrastructure for that part of the world connects Edinburgh to the north of Scotland. and as millions of commuters uh, each year that use that bridge to get to work. Um and unfortunately in 2015 there was a truss end failure at one end of the bridge and this was caught through a routine inspection um was fairly uh, unexpected but a serious failure that caused the bridge to close for several months and it's through you know repeated weather events that these kinds of failures happen. Next slide please. Our solution was uh when we we had a stop take after the event we realized that we needed better data and better information uh, to ma manage the bridge in the future and ultimately prevent those kinds of failures from happening in the first place so we stood up an infrastructure monitoring and analytics platform cloud based that actually ingests sensor data from sensors across the whole span of the bridge at strategic locations feeds this information back in real time so that we can fully understand how a bridge is behaving at any given point So for the fourth road bridge we were able to oh we have to go back just one thank you. Thank you. Um for the fourth road bridge with those sensors actually we were able to visualize that information for operators live in the control room so they've got a picture there and then of how the bridge is behaving. You know it's part of business as usual but also as part of severe weather events when they do come round. Um and you've got that intelligent um alarm system as well in there that can send immediate text messages media emails to the guys in the control room to ultimately if if a threshold is met for a certain risk factor so for example wind or ice um accretion on the bridge 
they can close that bridge immediately to passengers um, using it, to customers using it. Next slide. So this is one of these sensors in action. Um, so this is actually showing a storm that happened um, that led to about 200 millimeters of longitudinal shift in a bearing, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you scale that up over the whole structure, that could be quite, uh, quite impactful and could lead to a larger risk of failure. And actually this, this is information that the control room for the bridge has live. So they can see through a weather event, what is happening on the bridge, how is it behaving? Uh, that not only leads to better operation there and then, making sure that we, we're running a bridge that is safe, but ultimately means we can inform our maintenance schedules as well. So we can make better decisions about when and where we target our inspections and maintenance to make sure no failure is gonna surprise us. Here we have a bit of an example uh, of one of these urgent um, alerts. So here um, we had a threshold met on a wind gust uh, that then led to a recommendation of closure of the bridge to pedestrians and cyclists and ultimately making sure the bridge is safe um, for them to use. But we also have a series of these other alerts for things like ice um, to prevent ice bombs on the carriageway, which are genuinely a threat to life sometimes. Next slide, please. We also, I mentioned, we have that machine learning element in there, that intelligent analytics. And this is the really, really interesting bit for me in the solution that we've helped build. Um, so actually we use that historic data that we've got, the raft of data we've had since 2015 to fundamentally predict and look forward to how a bridge could react and could behave in the future. So we know ahead of time, as we have weather events coming in, how the bridge might react to that, and ultimately, this means that we can target inspection and maintenance before an event to check, check that things like bearings and truss ends are all in good shape. Um, but also then we can check afterwards as well, because we know how that bridge is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, react to the event. So actually, we're using that historic data to better inform our response and our decision making around those future events. Next slide. To kind of conclude on all of this, um, obviously, as we see uh, climate change um, really take hold, we're going to see more variability, more changeability in our weather, which generally is going to put um, aspects like those truss ends, bearings at risk continually. Um, and actually, without data and technology such as we've used on the Fourth Road Bridge, we aren't able to make the best decisions we need to make to ensure safe operation day to day, but also that making sure that we make the right decisions around maintenance of the bridge to prevent incidents like we have uh, have had in Italy. Um, and using these new technologies around machine learning um, and knocking that data is really critical to this, to mean we're not making anecdotal decision making, we're actually using and, and making decisions based on data. Um, and the final point I'll make as well is that that data doesn't have to be real time to be valuable. So. There can be quite an obsession about, you know, I must have real time data. Actually, having that bulk of historic data is is part of underpinning how you respond in the future. So there's value on all counts on that. And thank you very much. That's it for me. Uh, I think we have I, Mr. Amir Dineur next. Yes, thank, thank you so much, uh, Jackie, for outlining through your example exactly what Dr. Kakotka was saying, that, that quantitative understanding of those continuous dynamics. And your last words is, I think, the difference between information and knowledge. The real-time information, when built up over time, delivers that knowledge base for us to make better predictions. Amir, over to you to tell us how real-time seismic information can make our infrastructure more resilient. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't see my presentation. So, ah, here I see. Yes. yes. It's up. Great to see you all. Uh, my name is Amir Dinur. <clears throat> I'm the CEO and one of the founders of uh, Seismic AI. It's a startup company uh, together with uh, Tel Aviv University and other uh, universities around the world. If you can kindly uh, switch to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, so one of the problems uh, we see in the world that almost uh, if we exclude Japan and, and some part of California, the uh, rest of the world is not covered uh, with uh, seismic uh, early warning system in real time, in regional uh, orientation. And we can see that even in those countries that you have partial solution, they won't uh, detect earthquake uh, out of their network. So if something is coming from the ocean uh, level or something is coming from other country, for example, in India, 
if something will start 500 kilometers away from the Himalaya in China or in Pakistan, uh, you won't get a real-time uh, solution alerting the people. When I say real-time, it's less than a second. Uh, so we, uh, if you can kindly uh, switch to the next slide, what we managed to do uh, after research of uh, more than 10 years, can uh, kindly switch to the next slide? What we managed to do in, in uh, research, and you can find the publication of our solution in several, um, <clears throat> in several, uh, in the best places uh, in the academic world, uh, we managed to, to uh, develop a system that first of all, can run immediately. So we don't need to, uh, to have any empirical data to our solution. We can install it uh, in everywhere in the world uh, in a few days, and it can be operational in a few weeks. So if you compare it to the Japanese system or to the American system, it took them around 50 to 20 years just to calibrate the system. With our technology, which is a combination of uh, a lot of artificial intelligence and a lot of new ways to uh, detect effort using uh, array technology, I don't have time to, to share it with you, but if you want, you're more than welcome to talk with me. We can be uh, operational in a few weeks. Uh, the second thing is instead of having uh, very dense networks with billions of dollars of, uh, of investment, you can do it in a few uh, millions of dollars and you can cover huge areas in, in, in few stations and you don't need to put every uh, station every five kilometer. So let's talk a little bit about the impact. So if we will uh, alert even people five to 10 seconds before something happened, we can save their lives, they can take cover. Same go to uh, nuclear plant, power plants, and uh, transportation. If we will alert on time, even a few seconds before the effort is coming, we can, uh, we can actually reduce dramatically the, uh, the damage. We can save a lot of lives. We have a lot of uh, research publication about it and case studies all around the world showing how we can really save lives and reduce dramatically the damage. If you can kindly uh, switch to the next slide. Okay, uh, even the next slide because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, the, the last thing is super important and we, we learned about it uh, from the Japanese and also from our conversation with uh, the federal uh, in the US, business continuity, which means after an earthquake, I don't want to be in a situation that I don't have hospital to go or I don't have water to drink because everything was uh, destroyed. So we are actually working today uh, with the infrastructure in order to uh, minimize the damage once uh, in the way that we can actually have automatic shutdowns for relevant uh, infrastructure and machines inside the infrastructure show before the effort is going to hit, we can reduce the pressure of the gas. We can stop engines. We can stop uh, pumps. We can open valves automatically, even uh, half minute to one minute before something has happened. And this is dramatically can change the situation. Now let's move to the next slide, please. I just want to show you uh, some case studies. We are working all around the world. We have networks in India, in the Himalaya. We have networks in Turkey. By the way, in Turkey, we managed to detect earthquake 12 hours after we uh, put our system uh, 100 kilometer in the sea level, which is something that even the Japanese don't know how to do. Um, so in, in the Himalaya, for example, we have a small network in Uttarakhand, and we managed uh, with this system to uh, detect earthquake also coming from China, 500 kilometer away, from Pakistan, 800 kilometers away, so we can be actually the eyes, for example, of India out of the uh, political border. So if something starting far away, we can actually alert on time and give, get a lot of time before the effort is coming and alert people. So actually I'm done. Uh, I would be happy if you have any question, if you want to contact me and I will uh, not let all Dr. Olga now to, to have her uh, session. So thank you so much. Dr. Mekas, uh, I'll go over to you and let's please restrict the presentation to five minutes.
So, we will have some time for questions. Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Olga Pleumakers. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands where half of our country is beneath sea level. So, you can imagine we have some uh, experience with keeping our feet dry. Uh, next please. I started my career 10 years ago at Nederland Schuurmans, which is a water management consultancy and IT company. And our mission is contributing to a healthy, safe and resilient environment. And we achieve this by making the best information available to the, de to the decision making using uh, our IT and consultancy services. My personal goal is to translate the in-house IT solutions into uh, applied service for cons uh, customers in the water and climate domain. And we do that in the Netherlands a lot, but also uh, abroad. Um, can you go back, please? Uh, we are developing two main uh, IT services. We call them Lizard and uh, 3DI. And where Lizard is uh, an online geodata warehouse and analytic platform, and 3DI is a state-of-the-art hydrodynamic simulation software for floods. And the flood forecast service, uh, where this pitch is about, is based on the combination of both <laughs> Lizard and 3DI. And you, go, you can go next, yeah. For many years, our daily business is flood modeling. And over the years, the input data become more detailed and more accurate. And beside, beside that, we also improved the simulation software where we made it both more accurate and much, much more faster. And since a few years, please go back, uh, we use our flood models to create a climate atlas for regions and cities. And it's an online address where we show the impact of uh, the climate change, but not only by showing uh, the water depth and flow velocities, but also translate them uh, to vulnerable objects like the impassable roads or damage to buildings and hospitals, but also failure of the energy net. And for this uh, translation, we use an asset database and advanced algorithms. As you uh, can imagine, this climate atlas gives you a lot of information. This is also very static. And the maps are calculated in advance and show potential risk. And our next, next step was to use uh, our hydrodynamic model and the data warehouse to set up a dynamic forecasting service. Um, we made this, um, please go back one. Uh, we made an automatic data import to the data warehouse, uh, for example, rainfall radar data and weather forecast information and water level measurements. And at the same time, there's an accurate flood model available to uh, the specific catchment or city. And this model is automatically fed with the measurements of rainfall forecast of the area. And we use both, uh, we uh, use it both at the boundary condition for the model, but also for the external forcing of the model. And with that, uh, we will uh, run the model automatically and the flood uh, results will also be automatically stored in this data warehouse. And from there, predefined impact analysis are executed, which are based on uh, predefined threshold values. And an alert will be sent out at the moment uh, these threshold values are exceeded. Next, please. And because the service is cloud based, all steps can be run and followed through mobile phone. And the results of the flood model and the executed analytics are visualized in these kinds of dashboards. And they can also visualize on your mobile phone, as you can see in the next slide. And messages can be sent out by, the, uh, by social media uh, to inform civilians, but also by text messages to the security services. And in the flood forecasting service, we do not only provide information about water depths and flow velocities, but also about the impact of that. Uh, for ex example, if the roads are passable or not, if buildings were flooded and where, if there are risk of failure of the electricity network and so on. So with this kind of information, it's possible to react fast and location specific to the predicted floods. I want to finish this pitch with three important questions about the flood forecasting service that we hear more often. Next, please. Uh, first, is the model uh, and the service accurate? Yeah, for the model and also for the service applied, the garbage in is garbage out. So the accuracy mm -hmm. of the service itself is very high, but you need accurate data on rainfall uh, forecast measurements and also geo information to build an accurate flood model. But the calculation core itself is very, very accurate. 
The second question, is the service real time? The flood forecast is, is as quick, quick and as good as the weather forecast, of course. Simulations and analytics are very fast. And at the moment, the weather forecast is available. The flood forecast is calculated in minutes to hours, depending on the area um, you, you calculate. And last question, what are the things that you need to prepare in advance to impl uh, implement this kind of service? Uh, first, you need to build a calibrated hydrodynamic model. And because more and more data uh, is available, uh, this is not longer a challenge for many countries. And to execute the analytics, you also need a measuring network and KPIs and a list of decision criteria to automatically send out notifications. So far, my short presentation about our innovation flood forecast service. Uh, I hope it gave you an idea of where we're working on and how it can help cities or countries uh, to respond on flood, floods in the future. Thank you so much, Olga, for sticking to five minutes and for ending the presentation with those very clear questions. I'm going to change the format a little bit and I'm going to first bring in uh, Professor Banerjee to give his speech and then I'm going to come back with a question each for each one of you before we go to Dr. Morais. Uh, Professor Banerjee, you've heard of each of these elements of real-time information, but then providing that information in a way that is usable uh, by administrative systems, etc. But where you come at this from, uh, how do you see these innovations, the technological innovations fitting in in the broader resilience framework? Over to you. Um. Thank you for having me, uh, Anurabha, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, you know, by uh, Anurabha mentioned that I work in the area of systems and where the challenges that have the attributes of extreme scale, complexity, urgency, are uh, often very, very critical to function and also, generally speaking, with great threats to resilience. And with the moment you take a system's point of view, the boundary conditions, the first thing you do is, is increase the boundary conditions. And then the hard infrastructure and the technological layers become uh, enmeshed with many other layers. So the other layer, the other components that you were talking about, the four legs mm -hmm. uh, are, are, you know, the, uh, are many uh, parts of the system, but, but this moment you do that, you go from the complicated regime to the complex regime where uh, tight deterministic uh, relationships get coupled with much more looser and dynamic uh, relationships where feedback loops and choke points and so on become really, really important to understand. And also the capacity to understand them becomes uh, incredibly important. So when you have that system and then you look at technology, you realize that uh, while particularly now in the, in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution with frame changing technology and the kind of technology they are talking about, which can uh, give us entirely new uh, categories of, of thinking, decision making, response times, etc. The, the, our enemy is the degree to which we are technocentric in the way we think about using the technology. Because when we have these kind of technologies available, then the magic often becomes how we integrate those technologies with the non-technology layers, so to speak, and the other way, the, the, the heuristics and the, and the entire infrastructural, uh, sorry, the institutional capacities uh, or the social capacities that are enmeshed with those. And how do you design for that? Um, and so, and, and also we are, we are talking about uh, resilience risks and an, and an era where we are entering uh, uh, I, I would say an epoch with with uh, greater risks of of uh, of m a multitude of tsunamis coming at us with greater frequency, with greater intensity, and meanwhile a, a whole lot of uh, the uh, the infrastructure that we've built, including our institutional capacities, are relatively brittle in 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 its face, and so when such events happen. Uh, given the heterogeneity of the system and the unknown nature, uh, failure is inevitable. And so the question is that we have very many different time um, uh, constants uh, from the way we design systems and the, and the way we design institutional capacities to the extremely short periods of time that we have to respond to them, but also not just respond to restoring uh, the function of the infrastructure, but the fact that the infrastructure is a bedrock of a whole stack 
of the the of the the societal the functions that rely yes. on the infrastructure and those when they have broken down uh, what does it take to restore those and and how are you going to leverage uh, the more distributed functions uh, such as the ones that uh, dr Kar Karkotkar, uh mentioned uh, and that is a really important uh, point so once you take a systems approach uh, the question i would uh, uh, i would i guess that is posed in front of us is that we have to transition to uh, much more fault to tolerant and, and, and resilient systems. But as we do that, uh, we absolutely cannot sidestep the fact that the, the forces that threat have caused this issue to be uh, 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 an important issue. Uh, the, the shape of the infrastructure and, and uh, and a definition of, of, uh, of progress and the architectures with which we've created it, the centralized ways in which we've created the relatively rigid institutional ca uh, capacities and the brittle nature of the architectures of the, of, of the infrastructure itself also has been extremely culpable in contributing to the magnitude and the nature of the forces that attack us. So to uh, Dr. Kakotka's point, uh, it's uh, we absolutely need to not have those be externalized, but internalized into the way we do it. Mm -hmm. But infrastructure is extremely uh, large and expensive, etc. And what we realize is that when you look at systems, it is extremely prudent to you know we uh, to look at systems and ask ask where you might intervene with the greatest amount of effect. And so we have a methodology that we call system acupuncture, where there's a whole bunch of, a whole new philosophy of how you look at building that kind of intellectual uh, ability, uh, the agility, the institutional agility, and also the directionality of what is it that we are designing. Because currently we are not only designing transitions to resilient systems, but also the next generation systems. And and yeah. at what point are we going to uh, shape, uh, reshape the entire architecture. And the moment we look at it in this way, we realize that the way we even use words uh, have tremendous import on how we think about it. So if we think of infrastructure, we immediately think of dams. But if we yeah. think of, let's say, water security, access and equity, and everything else serving that, then a dam becomes a piece of it. And so uh, reconceptualizing uh, not only what we are doing, but building completely new capacities that build agility and a much more systems perspective because the challenges are systemic and are in the com complex room. And I'm, I'm going to uh, pause for that. Th thank, thank you so much, Professor Banerjee, for, for illustrating for us this notion of what a systems acupuncture approach could look like. I'm going to rush back to the panelists with literally a one minute question here because we have to close within the next nine minutes and we have Dr. Moraes also after this. I want to go first to Jacqueline. You just heard from uh, Professor Banerjee about you know, the, the brittleness of infrastructure. Um, so when you look at the, uh, the way the bridge is functioning, who should be responsible for handling that information to make sure that then the response uh, and that learning, uh, that, that long-term knowledge management that you were referring to is embedded through the system and not just episodic. Yeah, so it's a really interesting area that actually, because ultimately the asset, the bridge, if I use FRB as a bit of an example, Transport Scotland are fundamentally the, uh, the asset owners. They are responsible right. for that bridge. Um, they bring in the likes of Amy Consulting, among a series of other partners, to actually come in and operate, manage, and maintain. It's almost pushing the risk. It, it spreads the risk a little bit so that um, the likes of Amy are, are kind of managing that risk um, in, in, in terms of that bridge operations and function, and if there is a failure. Um, and it's a very interesting point because actually suppliers will have a contract for a set period. It might be five years. It might be 10 years. But actually, after that, that's, that supplier might well move on. And mm -hmm. all of the data and intelligence that, that they had, um, there is a genuine risk that it doesn't move on to the next supplier who takes on that risk for um, the ultimate asset owner, which I think it's a challenge. Um, I think the way that you overcome it is 
is making sure that you know when you're building these kind of databases these systems technologies actually you're not building it so it's so specific to your own supplier use case so yeah. making sure that the, the work that we've done is able to be transferred over to the next supplier because ultimately if you can't do that that supplier is almost starting back at square one and you lose all of that intelligence and progress that you have just made um okay. in particular so i think it's all a right. flawed it's potentially flawed but there's there are ways and means to progress it okay thanks jackie um quickly amir over to you um this real time information on the on 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 the earthquakes how do we democratize this this system even more so what you've done is you made sure that you can quickly deploy this but how do we democratize that information so that there are more responders uh, ready to act so <clears throat> thank you for the question so all the, uh, the data in real time is actually available uh, in, in several levels, uh, and we believe that uh, we will never, as a policy, we will never uh, stop uh, the information from the from the population. So it's it's it it is a commercial solution, but in every country that we have the network, uh, we won't charge uh, the population for that, and we will uh, enable. We already enabling a very very easy internet API. So you can connect us uh, with us in, in, a, in any platform. It can be your mobile, it can be website, it can be even your alert system. Uh, you can, everything is connected via the cloud. We are working with, we are cooperating with Microsoft and right. soon also with Amazon. So everything is shared and open. We okay. do have commercial aspects for uh, cities, for, uh, infrastructure, but in, in general for the publication, it's totally open. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, Olga, to you, Dr. Kakotkar talked about, you know, cooperation across countries. So how do we use your flood warning system in transboundary situations? Yes, uh, for flood forecast service, you need a simulation model of the entire catchment and the border doesn't determine the extent of the model. So the catchment does that. And from the uh, technical point of view, it's no problem that the catchment lies in two different countries. And most of the time, the input data, uh, like the elevation map, um, satellite images, are also not restricted by national borders. So for an example, okay. uh, besides using the Dutch rainfall ra radar, we also incre uh, integrate the rainfall radar of Germany and Belgium, which, uh, which are neighbor countries. And the flood forecast uh, service itself is uh, most of the time restricted to a specific governmental authority uh, with specific requirements, but the flood model is not. Okay, we'll jump straight to Dr. Moraes. Uh, so you have five minutes uh, and then we'll have to close immediately after. I'll try to uh, bring in a question for Professor Banerjee. So over to you, sir. Dr. Moraes. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Well, uh, Thanks a lot. Well, uh, many thank yous, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning for all attending uh, uh, this section. And many thanks for the invitation uh, to be present in this uh, section. Well, uh, usually, uh, <clears throat> innovation is related with the development of technology. Uh, however, uh, innovation can be intangible uh, as opposed of technology, uh, which is tangible. Uh, you can even apply the innovation process for, uh, to your everyday life. Uh, technology can be used to implement innovation, but technology itself doesn't produce innovation. Uh, I will briefly address uh, how innovation can be useful for resilience, not only for resilience uh, of infrastructure, but mainly for people using infrastructure existing in risky areas, risky areas for disasters. Let me put a different overview on how to use this disruptive uh, innovation 
in the field of disaster resilient infrastructure. Uh, the start point is to look what means uh, disruptive uh, innovation. Uh, in business theory, uh, uh, disruptive uh, innovation is uh, innovation that creates a new market uh, and value network and eventually uh, disrupt an existing market and value network. Displaced uh, establishing market leading firms, products, and alliances. However, uh, uh, disruptive innovation can also be considered uh, disrupt a complex system. Through identifying and analyzing systems for possible points of intervention, you can then design changes focus on disruptive interventions. Uh, it's important, uh, uh, in this point, I will exemplify here very quickly how the Brazilian National uh, Monitoring and Alert Center for Disaster uses a methodological innovation to issue alert so we'll have to wrap in deaths. a minute and a half. Yeah. Okay, thank you. This innovative but very simple process go behind using an alert for an extreme event. Uh, well, I will show to, uh, I will briefly to explain. For instance, in Brazil, there are more than 50,000 risky areas for mass movement where lives more than 10 million people. How to use an innovative procedure to make the schools that exist in these areas? For instance, in Brazil, there are more 2,000 schools existing in, in risky areas for disasters. Then uh, you develop a system to create not only the resilience of this structure, but the reason of the students and the teachings that stay in these areas. Right. You use a methodology uh, and the more important contribution for a resilient society in, is a, a resilient of the people and not only the resilient of the structure. That's the, 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 okay. the, in a simple way what I would, I would like to exchange with you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you so much. We are exactly at time. I wish I could come back to Professor Banerjee also for a question. Unfortunately, I can't, but uh, I, will, um, I will have to conclude. But I do want to just use one phrase each from each of the speakers to illustrate the range of interventions we've had. Dr. Karkotkar talked to us about the need to understand continuous dynamics. Um, Jacqueline then talked about that the data need not be real time for us to learn. Amir talked about business continuity, so how quickly we can bring societies and businesses back online. Olga referred to how we need to ask ourselves if it's accurate, real time, and are we prepared. Um, Dr. Professor Moraes, uh, Dr. Moraes talked about resilience of the people. But most importantly, I want to re-emphasize this point that Professor Banerjee made about systems acupuncture. If we don't keep testing and stress testing the pressure points in our overall infrastructure system in a system dynamics way, we will struggle to deploy the innovations that we've heard from today. And if we did that, they would actually transform the way we engage with our infrastructure from mm -hmm. resilience at one hand to criticality on the other. Thank you so much for your attention.
welcome back to the session of ICDRI 21 from a very, very interesting discussion on innovations and emerging technologies. Now let us move to a related session that is on digital infrastructure resilience. Now as I said earlier that digital infrastructure is perhaps one of the key infrastructure systems which has enabled us during the last one year to, uh, to work to some extent even despite of COVID-19 pandemic. We were able to talk with our colleagues, hold meetings and make turn our homes into offices due to the video conferencing platforms. The present and future predictions about digital infrastructure show that the need for digital infrastructure will, will rise exponentially and not linearly. It will become and perhaps has already become a lifeline infrastructure system and all other infrastructure systems may depend to some extent on its resilience. Resilience of digital infrastructure is not limited to high technology companies or high technology industries. People in the remotest areas are dependent on resilience of digital infrastructure systems on mobile networks for their communication needs, for their life livelihoods and disruptions of mobile communication coverage during or after the disasters lead to loss of livelihoods, loss of communication and it, it impacts daily lives of people. During the session, we will have a keynote address from Honorable Minister of Government of India, Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad, who handles the communication, electronics and information technology portfolio in addition to law and justice for Government of India. We will also have other experts. Now I will like to hand over the session to the session moderator, Mr. Abhilash Panda. Mr. Panda is the head of infrastructure resilience in the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Mr. Panda heads, is the deputy chief for intergovernmental processes, partnerships and heads, head of infrastructure resilience. He has worked extensively in resilience issues and he has authored many publications and peer reviewed articles. Abhilash also serves at the board of two ISO committees and in the committee of International Journal of Disaster Resilience in the built environment. So without further ado, now I hand over the session to Mr. Abhilash Ponda. Over to you Abhilash. Thank you very much Sandeep uh, for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be invited as the moderator to this very important and I would say very urgent session. Now, as you rightly said, uh, technology is all around us. The digital transformation we have seen over the last few years has increased the emphasis on being always online. Now take India for an example. In 2015, India had roughly 7.5% of its population connected to the internet. By 2019, this percentage has increased to 34. Now, Indian mobile data users consume roughly 8.3 gigabytes of data each month on average. In fact, India is digitizing faster than any other country. This is, could be also said for a lot of other emerging economies and the markets. Now, on one side, the digital transformation that we are seeing has opened doors to elevate poverty, create opportunities, monitor and improve emergency response, but this has also added a new layer of vulnerability. A single disaster caused by natural or man-made hazard could lead to serious damages to the critical information systems and trigger the failure of the whole networks. The title of this session very aptly resonates with the status of developing resilience policies and practices. We are indeed at the exploration phase, but the fast digitization of the world spurred by the sudden challenges of life and businesses under COVID-19 means that we need to significantly increase our engagement and efforts. As you rightly said, Sandeep, today we have a diverse panel of experts and specialists from various sectors. 
with whom we will discuss this perspective and their opinions on some of the challenges and solutions. But before starting our discussion with the panel, I would like to give the floor to Honorable Minister for Communications, Electronics and Information Technology, Law and Justice for Government of India, Mr. Sri Ravi Shankar Prasad for his opening remarks. Your Excellency, the digital floor is yours. Distinguished members of the panel, it is indeed a matter of privilege for me to address International Conference on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. We are indeed living in very challenging times. COVID is still to leave us. It keeps on coming with alarming reg uh, regularity, creating problem for large number of human beings, deeply stressing the supply infrastructure of government, including vaccine and other preemptive steps to prevent it. I'm very happy to note that this particular conference is going to really stress upon digital resilient infrastructure. In particular, I would like to share with all of you our own experience in India and how our Digital India program rose to great heights in mitigating the suffering of 1.3 billion plus people of India during the challenging times of COVID. When our Prime Minister Narendra Modi was campaigning in the year 2014 to be the leader of India, which is subsequently won twice with massive majority, he coined an expression that if people of India elect me, I'll try to create an India where IT plus IT is equal to IT, which means India's talent, IT, plus information technology, IT, is equal to India tomorrow, IT. And digital India is basically the overpowering theme to concretize that narrative. What is digital India? Digital India simply means empowering ordinary Indians with the power of technology, bridging the digital divide, and most important, bring in digital inclusion. And this must be acquired through technology, which is homegrown, developmental, and low cost. With this narrative of digital India, we sought to empower ordinary Indians. Certain statistics about India need to be noted. India's population 1.35 billion plus. India is home to nearly 1.18 billion mobile phones, out of which 1.16 billion plus are smartphones, close to 750 million are smartphones. Now, with this, uh, nearly 1.26 billion is Aadhaar digital identity to supplement the physical identity. And how we concretize this arrangement into a reality of empowering the common people. Just to give an example, we opened nearly 420 million bank account the poor who had no access to bank account. Link that with the digital identity Aadhaar. And we started sending all the welfare measure to the poor people in the bank account, the gas subsidy or ration subsidy or other welfare measures. And we have sent about $193 billion, uh, $195 billion directly into the bank account, which is known as DBT, Direct Benefit transfer. And we have saved close to 25 billion US dollars, which is to be pocketed by middlemen and fictitious claimants. Based upon this success, e-scholarship, e-visa, creating a digital marketplace for farmers to supply their uh, farm produce. Uh, then a public platform for procurement of goods, 
uh, e-hospital, e-health, all this really was very challenging in transforming India because the wide network of mobile phone, 95% coverage, people could really exploit it properly. And as our Prime Minister said, we will be very keen to ensure that governance must be available in the palm of every Indian. We also in accelerated uh, mobile manufacturing in a very big way. From just two mobile factories in the year 2014, India is now home to nearly 260 plus mobile manufacturing factories in the world. We are the second biggest country in terms of mobile manufacturing and other ecosystem. Now we have come with a new program of production link incentive, namely come, set up your factory, manufacture, export outside, or use the domestic market and earn your incentive. India is also one of the largest country in terms of app economy, in terms of uh, use of social media, almost close to one three point billion plus uh, social media users are there on various platforms. All this was available. Then came this tragedy of COVID. Now, the first thing we did was that in COVID, we uh, ensured that this direct benefit transfer continues uninterrupted. And we have <coughs> sent billions of rupees into the bank of the poor, including by the postal department, the entitlement of women, 500 rupees every month. Then our farmers close to, I would say, almost 100 million farmers getting bank account into their, getting their 6,000 rupees every year into the bank account again by DBT. Therefore, this direct benefit transfer instrument continued uninterrupted during the even during COVID. India, ladies and gentlemen, as you all are aware, is a big center of IT operations. How to continue work during challenging times when there was no rail, there was no air movement, there was no highway movement. Then India's mobile, landline, IT, postal operations came in very, very handy. I would like to just tell you. We develop a very unique India product, Aarogya Setu IVRS system. Contract tracing. In the event you are coming in contact with someone who has been afflicted, you please be on the guard. And nearly 200 million plus Indians have submitted their self-assessment to this IVRS system known as uh, Aarogya Setu. To help Indian IT operations work, we liberalized the entire regime and work from home became a norm where India's IT backup system, other operations could work from home, including international companies. And now we have ensured maturing of work from home to work from anywhere. This model has become very, very popular. Then <clears throat> COVID Southern system. What was COVID Southern system? We created a platform which is capable of sending targeted messages to millions of people who were in different quarantine centers of the country as to how they must behave, what caution, uh, precautions they need to take, and a variety of other aspects we encourage. It was important that the ecosystem of payment should continue. Uh, therefore, uh, when there was no ATM, there was no bank, uh, our government ensured through the postal operations of the postman to reach the far-flung villages of India and disperse money to the Aadhaar-enabled fingerprint system where you could be delivered the cash in a defined uh, quantity uh, so that you're, you can continue with your life even during these challenging times. This Bheem UPI payment the transaction stood at 19.96 billion transactions from April 2020 to March 2021. Uh, you know, India is governed by rule of law. 
we ensured that there is no interruption of that as well, be the Supreme Court or the High Court or the subordinate court, they all together had a hearing of nearly 7 million cases in a virtual form. The entire education also ran digitally in a virtual form. <clears throat> the point I'm trying to highlight is, even during this disaster of COVID, our digital India ecosystem came in handy in a very, very big way. Uh, we have uh, also ensured digital technology for uh, uh, people to get their vaccine, the co-vaccine or the COVID shield, as the case may be. Uh, India has done exceedingly well, including sending it to more than 70 countries globally. It has also become a big movement. If I just to concretize how the entire digital ecosystem has been able to help us uh, improve the lives, give succor, and not to cause big interruption during the most challenging times which the humanity has seen recently, that is COVID challenge. We could overcome that only and only because of this digital ecosystem which we have created. And our focus on digital inclusion, bridging the digital divide, has given us a lot of benefit. Uh, I can tell you, I just talked about Aadhaar. Aadhaar is again a technology made in India. There is one Ayushman Bharat. What is Ayushman Bharat? We give half a million rupee every year, five lakh rupees, to millions of Indians who registered by the government support. Again, Ayushman Bharat is being done digitally. I talked about GSTN, the General Sales Tax Recovery, again is done digitally. I've already talked about e mandi where farmers can sell their produce. Ladies and gentlemen, all these infrastructure, digital infrastructure, with inclusion as the focus of our approach, really gave us a lot of help during these challenging times of COVID. Now, I have shared my, our, our in India's experience. My suggestions for the distinguished panel is that there, there need to be a global consensus on the, uh, on the application and use of digital technology to mitigate the suffering arising out of disaster. In an experiment, surely can be of great help. Yes, the civil society <coughs> and the world has to rise in one rise in one voice to ensure that digital infrastructure must be safe. Digital infrastructure must be secure from hackers, from terrorists and others who try to disrupt so that people continue to suffer. The whole world needs to have a stake in the safety and security of this new invention, which we call internet. In India, we have taken a position very clearly that the internet is one of the finest creations of human mind, but it should not remain the monopoly of few. It must be used for the welfare of the entire human kind. And therefore, we always say that if internet is a global phenomena, it must have linkage with the local, local ideas, local culture. And in India, we have used internet basically to those objectives which we seek to fulfill, which we seek to fulfill to ensure inclusive development of ordinary Indian. And we in India have close to 700 million internet penetration rising every month every week. Our Prime Minister has said that we have got 600,000 villages of the country. We need to reach by the Internet Bharat Net project infrastructure in the coming 1,000 days which are working together. Once that ecosystem becomes available down to the remotest part of the country, I hope 
that the success of Digital India is going to give us further strong foundations to respond to any challenges which may arise from any disaster. I think what the government of India has done, it surely is something to be believed. We produce highest number of data and the data usage has also increased 137 times from 89.4 megabytes per subscriber per month to 12.1 gigabyte per subscriber per month. Even the broadband mission is taking on greater speed to ensure broadband availability in every nook and corner of the country. Why India is important in disaster, disaster management and mitigation? India is important because of its size. India is important because of the weight of population. India is important because of its diversity. And most important, all these challenges have to be have to be addressed within the parameters of a democratic society and democratic governance. And here, I would like to commend the stellar role of our Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, during most challenging times, he ensured that while he upholds the democratic value of consulting with all the states, the chief ministers, having proper distancing, uh, ensuring innovative products in the field of vaccine. But what is important is the relief must reach to every nook and corner of the country. And during these challenging times of pandemic disaster, our digital ecosystem was of great help. I thought I must share with you, maybe India's experience is something to be considered. With these words, my greetings, thanks once again for giving me this forum to address an issue of similar importance. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Excellency. Um, your opening remarks and also for bringing for a number of key points. The first one being that, that digital infrastructure has now become the cornerstone to bridge the di digital divide. The efforts of government of India are exemplary. In fact, you have coined a new term, uh, working from anywhere. You also raise the need of good governance, which is indeed critical for all aspects of risk management. Um, as Your Excellency noted, currently we have a limited knowledge and understanding of complex and cascading risks that threaten digital infrastructure and the connected services. Um, in fact, in 2019, uh, Cyclone Fani that struck the coastal state of Odisha in India ripped apart the telecom infrastructure with direct losses amounting to more than $70 million um, in losses. Another dimension of network services is, is the example from March 2015 in Amsterdam and the surrounding region suffered an out power outage that lasted more than five hours. The outage was caused by a technical fault at a network substation. And a third dimension is linked to the Malaysia cyber threats. So um, from hearing uh, His Excellency, how do we address the challenges we already know about and those we still do not know? As the Honorable Minister mentioned in his remarks, integrating resilience measures in regulatory processes and frameworks is one of the key actions that we need. And that's what good governance is all about. Now, before I give the floor to the panel, I would also like to mention that the COVID-19 pandemic has also pointed out how critical it is that digital infrastructure is not only resilient, but also equitable. Now, the digital divide has led to limited access to healthcare services to vulnerable groups across the globe. We just have 10 years left to deliver on the hopes and aspirations raised by the adoption of the Sendai framework, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Paris Agreement. Now, with trillions of dollars ready to be injected or already being put forward uh, for the recovery from COVID-19, now is the right time for governments and private sector and all other stakeholders to consider how best these investments can be resilient, green, and equitable. In our rush to recover from COVID-19, we must not miss a golden opportunity to reduce existing level of risk and avoid create, creating new risks. Now, sustainability and resilience are two sides of the same coin. Unsustainable infrastructure, whether digital or otherwise, undermines the resilience of those who are dependent on its smooth functioning. I hope 
today. Uh, we would gain some insights from our panel members and also hear a bit on um, what are some of the challenges and solutions to this. And now let me uh, introduce the, the very uh, long, good and strong list of experts I have on the panel. Um, first, I have uh, Professor Simon Petro Romano, professor, professor of Computer Networks, University of Napoli. Hello, everybody. He will be joined by Mr. Philip Lorek, advisor to the General Secretary of Ministry of Environment, Government of France. Hello, everyone. He would be joined by Mr. Brad Morel, Senior Advisor and Director of International Engagement for the United States Government's First Net Authority. He will be joined by Ms. Aruna Pitikti, Senior Vice President, Network Operations Head, Bharati Airtel Limited. Good afternoon to all. She would be then joined by Mr. Satoshi Sasakura, Executive Manager, Nippon Telegraph and Telephone Corporation, Network Business Headquarters. And lastly, with Ms. Vanessa Gray, Head of Environment and Emergency Telecommunication Division, Telecommunication Development Bureau, the International Telecommunication Union. Good afternoon. Uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming all my panel members. Uh, with less than 50 minutes uh, left with us, I would uh, straight away go to the first question, and I will start that with Ms. Gray. Um, so, uh, Ms. Gray, what what role does digital infrastructure resilience play for sustainable development, including the achievement of SDGs and Sendai framework targets? Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Very clear. Good. Um, Your Excellency, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, um, when one year ago the WHO declared COVID-19 virus a global pandemic, Digital technologies quickly became the new lifeline. The pandemic has demonstrated the essential role of connectivity worldwide and also the importance of having a robust, resilient and secure digital infrastructure in place for coordination mechanisms, as well as for social welfare, for the global economy and for sustainable development. And connected communities can help, uh, can access health information, education services, and receive life-saving disaster warnings. They can pay for goods and services and increase their productivity and competitiveness, which we've also obviously had, have heard from the minister um, from India. So for the um, ITU, the UN agency in charge of information and communication technologies, our mandate to connect the world really took on a, a whole new meaning. There are a number of roles that digital infrastructure resilience play for sustainable development. First of all, we realize that digital connectivity is a key determinant of how quickly we are able to recover from this dual health crisis and economic crisis and to reshape our world into some kind of new normal. For many developing countries, especially the least developed countries, this still means developing a sustainable and resilient internet ecosystem that is built on core internet infrastructure. This means core international and national backbone infrastructure, as well as the fundamental components that store and exchange data within a nation, internet exchanges, data centers, and cloud computing and hosting services. So this digital infrastructure will keep traffic local, reduce risks and costs, and help build more internet applications, services, and online content. We have delivered clear evidence of the benefits of broadband for economic recovery and sustainable development in every aspect of the 17 sustainable development goals. This includes studies to show that infrastructure investments can mitigate the negative economic impact of the crisis and we encourage leaders to make the right investment priorities and fund network modernization and expansion to underserved areas, especially in emerging and developing economies. Another important aspect is the resiliency of networks in terms of its capacity and its safety. Despite huge demand spikes over the last year and some outages and challenges, of course, the world's broadband networks have largely coped well under unprecedented pressure. Reliance on digital tools means greater exposure to cybersecurity risks 
and these threaten the confidentiality, integrity and availability of ICT infrastructure and services, increasing the level of cyber insecurity. Tech companies, hospitals, government agencies and others are investing in cybersecurity solutions to protect their business practices and of course the millions of customers that trust them with their data. ITU supports these efforts by tracking cybersecurity commitments through its Global Cybersecurity Index and assisting member states with the development of national cybersecurity strategies to manage cyber risks by coordinating actions for prevention, mitigation, response, and incident recovery. We also help countries develop national emergency telecommunication plans. Now, the pandemic has been a disruptive global force, but also an opportunity for us to rethink and build back better. This means investing in digital innovation and designing digital platforms with privacy, safety, and security in mind. More than anything, this will require a whole of government approach built on cross-sectoral cooperation and new and bold partnerships between the public and the private sector. Digital solutions and partnerships will be critical to use this last decade of action to achieve the sustainable development goals. A decade of action to build a better world where digital infrastructure is affordable, reliable and within reach of every citizen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. Um, you actually highlighted a lot of very um, interesting things. In fact, you all you laid out the bearings on the need of looking after the the most vulnerable, uh, the LDCs, uh, the role of technology in um, addressing resilience, uh, but also you indicated this the need of the whole of government approach and the role of PPPs. I think these are these are very strong elements uh, looking into the factor definitely. Now that brings me. Um, taking the PPP factor, but also understanding that a lot of uh, investments in infrastructure comes from the private sector. Um, I'll now move on to uh, Mr. Sasakura. Now, um, Mr. Sasakura, um, wh what according to you uh, are some of the challenges that um, your company or your corporation is facing in planning for and integrating resilience in the digital infrastructure uh, segment? Can you give us an example? Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Satoshi, Satoshi Sasakura. It is a great honor to be given this opportunity here. To be honest, it is my first time to make a speech in English. It might be a bit hard to hear my English clearly, but I would appreciate your understanding on this matter. Let me introduce myself briefly. I'm from MTT East in Japan. I am an executive manager in the Disaster Countermeasures Office. I have been with this company for more than 20 years and I ex experienced the Great East Japan earthquake as a manager in the Disaster Countermeasures Office in MTT. Today, I'd like to talk about my experience in this disaster and our challenge for the future. To begin with, I'll talk about the lesson of the Great East Japan earthquake. This was a huge damage in telecommunications facilities when the disaster occurred 10 years ago, you know. We received demands of covering telecommunication from many organizations, such as the government, critical infrastructure companies, and other private companies then. In other words, every organization could not use telecommunication. I realized that repairing networks is not only for local people and also for the organization, because Telecommunication is the base of social systems. That makes me think whether we could do triage to recover it in the context of various demands and social situations. Meanwhile, we could cooperate with the government and electric power supply for nuclear accidents in, in Fukushima. 
It was a kind of lesson about the importance of collaboration with other organizations. I think a great challenge is how to collaborate with the local governments and critical infrastructure companies and do triage to recover social situations. NTT East is a designated company by basic law for disaster countermeasures in Japan. That is why we are responsible for contributing to local governments for recovering when disaster happens so. So we have tried to understand the disaster prevention plans of local governments. Furthermore, we are trying to recognize what is required and at what timing by a disaster striking area. For the reason, we coordinate with them even in peacetime and try to be clear of their dependence on disaster countermeasures. First, we start making a structure to communicate with critical companies such as medicine, roads, electric power, and transport. For instance, DMAT is a group of the disaster medical systems in Japan. We make sure that use, they use mobile communication line primarily in the disaster medical field. And as another example, one electric power supply company uses private line mainly. The point is you, they use telecommunication differently on their activities. For that reason, we are trying to understand how critical companies and governments use telecommunication. In addition, we need to cooperate with the news media to manage the traffic congestion. The structure of cooperation with various organizations will help people in a disaster striking area, keep their lives and property and also regain their daily life rapidly. Also, we have done hardware countermeasures, for instance, march routes of network backup power supply. The effect of disaster is wider and it lasts longer and, and more. In conclusion, the most important thing is how to communicate efficiently with critical organizations and governments for disaster prevention and disaster mitigation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sasakura-san. Uh, um, those those challenges are indeed graving in nature. Um, I picked up a few, but I think one one which uh, which was a highlight for me is when you mentioned about how to collaborate with local governments. Uh, this is indeed critical in, in a point that we need to factor in. Uh, maybe we'll we'll get to hear uh, some solutions as we uh, go ahead with uh, our discussions. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll move to my third panel member, uh, Ms. Aruna PDP from Air Bharti Airtel. Uh, so, Aruna, my question to you would be, what are the vulnerabilities and risks to digital infrastructure that you think are the most prominent in your experience? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Panda, Abhilash Panda, and other panel members, thanks for giving me this opportunity to share my experience, especially in this important forum, very relevant uh, forum. As uh, you all heard that Indian infrastructure investment and focus on the digital transformation increased many fold. And we heard many examples of the projects from our honorable minister. Penetration of our mobile broadband, especially in the complete our pan India network and the optical connectivities, the, that is the communication among all these things. And also this power supply expansion and on top of that, with the expansion of our low-cost smartphones, enabled millions of our Indians to connect to the internet, and which enabled us having seamless connectivity to various services. That's how this entire digital transformation happened, and which has become the lifeline for all of our human beings, the connectivity. Since this is so important, the connectivity part, we as a telecom service providers or an essential service providers, we need to ensure to have a minimum disruption for the services or the connectivity. 
So in our domain, especially in the telecommunications, what are the various, you know, the risks or the vulnerabilities which we foresee as per our experience? So, you know, basically if I speak about in the past, what are the natural disasters impacted us? Like as Mr. Panda also mentioned, Funny, we had funny in Orissa, the coastal area, M fun, the recent uh, in the current year, M fun, Nivar, Nisarga. So there are many things. And also, apart from these cyclones, we also see the floods. The, this, these are yearly floods, you know, in some of the areas in India, especially in Bihar, Assam, these kind of locations where we see the natural disasters are increasing for us year on year. For, for if I see the data we, as per our experience in, in 2017, we have faced such kind of issues around six numbers. Now the same by 2020, it has become 12. That means on the average, every month we are facing such kind of issues, you know, at any part of the, the country. So thus it is very important for us based on our learnings, which we picked up over several years, we identified what are the risks or what are the mitigations, those things. If I talk about the risks, basically based on these experiences, which I say where in the complete Indian net, Indian environment, which states we can get cyclones, which states we get the cloud burst, which states we get the heavy rains, where the lightning or where, where are the areas, the earthquake prone areas? Where do we get the floods? So we categorize our all these states and then try to identify what are the risks and what are the vulnerabilities. Mainly if I speak about on the telecommunication domain on the vulnerabilities part, the, we have three, four important broader domains for it. The first domain is the data centers. The data centers, main switching units, which is heart of our total communication net. So the vulnerability comes for those data centers mainly. Where are these buildings located? You know, suppose if we take the funny as an example or the, the recent cyclones of Chennai as an example, is this building located near to that particular zone or is it away from that particular cyclone zone? So these are some of the vulnerabilities are the you know, uh, important criteria we have to take care when we build these data centers or switching centers. What is the accessibility, approachability of these buildings? And a minute kind of an, an uh, risks which we, which needs to be, be because these are these are based on our experiences. You know, how that air conditioning units are installed on usually we install on top of the terrace or adjacent to the buildings. How these installed that also my my the problem. These are also one of the vulnerabilities based on our own experiences, which we can. So we yeah. have a whole list of these, you know, vulnerabilities, which from the data center perspective, what are those? Similarly, if I go towards the consumer, the user side, you know, since uh, it comes to us, the towers, towers is mainly the cell sites where most of the coverage or connectivity will come to the users. Where are these towers located? If it is cyclone prone area, what is the strength of these towers? You know, are they vulnerable to the, you know, these wind speeds? Is the strength is capable enough? How is the connectivity part? You know, uh, the connectivity in terms of, is it connected on the microwave or is it connected on the fiber? That also matters, you know, because if it is connected on the microwave, Maybe the tower strength, you know, the tower load will increase. It may be one of the, the vulnerable or risk. How is the power connectivity in those particular areas? The power availability in those areas? Is the power is going through underground or is the power is going through the normal poles? You know, we have such kind of infrastructure in many locations. This also matters when we talk about the vulnerabilities which again, I can tell one of our examples when we seen in funny, why it took so many days for us to restore because of the, the infrastructure, the power infrastructure, those things took long time because these are all connected on the poles. So that's one of the reasons. But there are various kinds of vulnerabilities when we speak about needs to be considered end to end. Apart from this, when I come to the cell side, that is the user part, the third important point is the fiber connectivity, how these buildings are connected, 
how these sites or cell sites are connected from this fiber network. Obviously, whenever we see any natural disaster or anything, you know, the trees get uprooted, there will be huge winds, uh, all those things may cause a lot of disruption to the fiber. That means we will be losing the connectivity. So how do, what are the, you know, risks of these vulnerabilities? Where is this fiber located? Is it connected on underground? Is it connected on aerial? So these are the important vulnerabilities. We have to keep having our own database, you know, for the reason-wise, location-wise, which we see these are the main risks on that. Apart from this technical so one important criteria mainly on the people part. See, one is the natural disasters. The other one is manual errors. These also can cause a disaster for which we also need to have the really the mitigation plans for that. And what are the various challenges or the support in, in these disasters, especially as I mentioned, the infrastructure, the accessibility to the roads, the power supply availability, the fuel availability, there are various things which are really, really matter of considering as a risk or the vulnerability if we see in the current infrastructure. So both as an external and a internal, I try to point out what would be the various you know, risks in the current uh, service telecom industry. Yeah, thank you very much, Aruna, for that. Um, you definitely raised a lot of uh, um, interesting things. You know, the fact that the number of events have uh, basically doubled in three years period, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's already an uh, issue that uh, is putting a lot of investments and infrastructure um, uh, at risk. Um, I definitely would like to go to, into more uh, to what mentioned, but I have less than 29 minutes now. Um, and I definitely would like to take some questions that are coming in from our audience uh, from the floor. But before that, um, um, I would go to uh, Mr. Morrell, um, and because I'll be coming back to most of my speakers with additional questions, so uh, so uh, appreciate if you could uh, uh, keep your responses a bit brief here. Uh, Mr. Morrell, um, with uh, COVID-19, the dependency on the digital infrastructure sector has exponentially increased. Right. So where do you see the vulnerabilities, especially complex and the cascading risks coming in? Sure. I'm happy to talk about that briefly. So I understand FirstNet is the first responder network authority is a nationwide network uh, with dedicated spectrum, wireless broadband spectrum, just to the mission of public safety and the support areas that support that mission. So we're three years into a five-year deployment and build-out of this nationwide network, and it was just in time for COVID and all the exciting times that we've had in the U.S. this past um, year, and it was very helpful. Um, COVID brought a lot of major challenges, and as I heard mentioned before, it was a term we used here, the, the work anywhere concept, that um, you know we're used to the challenges in the evening in the suburbs and the rural areas of our three or four of your kids, you know, watching Netflix and YouTube at a time, and now... You added the mom and the dad and the, the parents and the family members and everybody working off of the network and just, just draining that bandwidth. Um, and a lot of times those missions and those needs were very critical to their, their business functions and other areas. In the same time, we had this um, demand of public safety that they have no fail mission critical data and mission critical voice requirements. So we're able to rely on this dedicated spectrum to FirstNet to uh, build up the bandwidth in areas as needed to uh, ensure that they were getting the connections that they needed and also take some of their traffic off of those commercial networks so that the, the public had a little more spectrum to use as well, giving them some more uh, resiliency and reliability. Um, at the same time that this was going on, uh, you, you know, we had the typical day-to-day -day disasters or seasonal disasters such as wildfires in the West, hurricanes in the East, um, as clearly everybody saw, there was a lot of civil unrest and protests and other issues happening throughout cities in the U.S. So we had to be able to find a way to make sure the reliability of the network was there for public safety at all times, um, as well as try and take that, again, that demand off of the commercial networks. We successfully did that in, in multiple areas, um, watching what the requirements were all the time. In many cases, we have a fleet, a large fleet of deployables dedicated to public safety. Kind of as you see in my backdrop, an aerostat that we could put an antenna up 1,500 feet, tie that into a, a sat colt, 
and you know cover an entire area if it was knocked out um, from a disaster or there was just a sudden need. Some of those sudden needs that were required during COVID, we were standing up uh, testing centers, we're standing up vaccine clinics, standing up treatment centers in stadiums and non-traditional areas that maybe didn't have enough fiber or copper in some of the older cases run to them. So we had to create wireless networks. Uh, we quickly put deployables out there to cover the increased need um, and successfully did that in many areas. So certainly for the demands of public safety, we're able to surge and meet those mission critical requirements. I think that continues to also show that resiliency that those wireless networks bring in the cellular area over some of the traditional LMR or land mobile radio networks that the density of cell coverage. So if we lose one cell, really not a, that devastating because we have multiple other cells that can pick up those coverage areas. Um, and we certainly had success with that and we're able to quickly respond to increase that bandwidth. Um, those are some of the areas, but I think the, the success of trying to stand up all these special um, quick ad hoc needs of COVID um, and rely on FirstNet to do that um, found great uh, promise for increasing this uh, demand, uh, a response to the demand. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Morrell. Um, in fact, you know, you already have given us uh, some possible solutions. Uh, that's already a headway into the to, into what I think we, we we would try to come out of this discussion as well. And thank you also for being awake uh, so early at your <laughs> end uh, and joining us on that. Well, uh, I've got the coffee. I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, with that, I'll miss, move to Mr. Lorek um, from the government of France. So, Mr. Lorek, uh, the the one area that I would definitely like to hear from you uh, coming from the uh, from from the government is and this all was also reflected a bit by, by some of my earlier, earlier panel members on the role of the private sector um, do you come across any um, good practices on engaging the private sector and ensuring that the assets and services they provide are uh, resilient yeah, thank you for your invitations and uh, your excellencies all speaker. Well, uh, the use of digital technology in infrastructure can be uh, considered in a very simplified view in two ways. Uh, first, better efficiency of services, I will say normal time, and uh, <clears throat> better resilience in case of crisis. Um, for us, digital technology is a risk and an opportunity for the critical infrastructure. Uh, indeed, uh, digital technology uh, is an opportunity to rationalize the criti critical infrastructure's network and to improve efficiency to industrial productions. Although it enables the reinforcement of computer protection means, it increases risk and favors the emergence of new risk. Indeed, it also fosters the emergence of new risk and a more complex applications framework, new type of actors and attack, causing a maximum of damage while implementing a minimum of means and with a minimum of for foreign or individual actors. Uh, no, the French systems, we say. Um, France has put in place a governmental framework uh, that extends one, for friend, from cyber security, we create a special service named NC, that is at the prime minister level to manage all the um, cyber attack for in the territory. Second, to infrastructure security, we have technical, physical, human and information system via uh, legal obligations and control processes by public services. And at the end, through the control of foreign investment for the concerned companies. Um, at one point, um, the, the resilience of critical infrastructure, I would say in time of the COVID pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, uh, I would say the pandemic uh, COVID was an opportunity to test the effectiveness of public and private resilience policies and strategies. And we, the following tools were implemented. First one 
we have uh, activity business continuity plans for the different sector of critical infrastructure, strategic infrastructure. And second, we, we have a strategy of social and financial support for main strategic industries in the infrastructure, um, especially, and maintaining vital service and infrastructure in water, energy, waste treatment, etc. Even some employers are sick or confined. As a main conclusion of I would say that this test is that the feedback, the feedback has led to the following conclusions. First, private and public companies, in consultation with the state services, each played, I would say, the role. Second, this coordination was answered within the framework of a crisis structure or so at the ministerial or prime minister level in the presence of representatives of the companies concerned. Third, we no supply disruptions during the crisis. And but in the end, the COVID pandemic is a major risk that is difficult to manage and its economic and human impact is significant, but it does not uh, have a hybrid character. And the origin and form of the risk are known. Even if we not, also during the, this period, several cyber attacks on hospital structure in France, for example. We have a, you, you know that at the same time, we must manage the pandemic crisis. And in the same time, we, we know that there is some, uh, some uh, cyber attack on the uh, hospital and uh, uh, structures. We must to imagine for this fact, we must imagine new methodology and digital tools to face this new hybrid risk. Indeed, hybrid risk are a mixture of risk, conventional or unconventional, and of targets, company or states. And they are often used by states or private organizations relying on non-state actors to evade accountability. This, appro this approach is concretized in a new project in, uh, named IPNET and by the writing of two new directives at the European level about critical infrastructure and cybersecurity that for the first time are linked together. It means that we have two directives linked together about cybersecurity and um, critical infrastructure and we have an umbrella named IPNET to manage this new kind of risk of hybrid risk. And to conclude, we, uh, there is uh, for us no such thing as zero risk and resilience also requires by the use of new technology, artificial intelligence, blockchain, semantics modeling, by preparing training for crisis management and also by the development of decision support tools Finally, the use, of, the use of digital technology is a permanent adaptation due to the appearance and transformation of increasingly complex risk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lorek. Um, you know, you, 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 you raised a uh, very valid point that it's, it's efficiency and resilience. It's the both dimension that comes into play. And I think that's where the private sector also comes in. Um, with that, I'll move to my last panel member, uh, Professor Romano. Now, Professor, we uh, we have been discussing a lot about what's what's happening, what is the current state of play, what uh, what are the risks and vulnerabilities based on the current infrastructure stock we have on digital uh, in the digital sector. Um, but from a scientific and uh, science perspective. Um, in the future, where do you see these vulnerabilities and risks coming in? And especially from a IoT perspective, um, I would request you if you could uh, respond uh, briefly in two minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll try and, and, and cut down my my answer time. No worries. So just let me thank you all for inviting me to join such a variegated set of brilliant brains. And I will try and be obviously very brief given the time constraints that we have. But basically. When we talk about the, the Internet of Things, I would say that we basically talk about the increasing convergence of the physical and the digital worlds. 
So we, we have devices that vary from internet connected power generation equipment that has already been mentioned in a previous talk uh, to wearable health trackers and perhaps smart home appliances. So all of these devices can uh, get connected to the internet nowadays. And this, uh, as with all benefits, also uh, brings in uh, some uh, serious risks, I would say. And the impacts of such risks range from, uh, you know, individual computer safety up to national security. And this has already been discussed, uh, fortunately. So obviously, cybersecurity is currently a, a relevant concern for uh, even if we just take into account the, the simplest household objects. I mean, you can figure out of events like uh, smart electric kettles that can be remotely set to, to explode. Or even if you just think of your children playing with their toys, there might be people who are going to eavesdrop on private conversations. And this happens just because of the fact that basically we are connecting computing technology to everything and then we are going to connect everything to the internet which is good obviously but this brings in a number of risks and uh, we should think carefully uh, of uh, these when we connect our stuff to the internet we should be very very careful uh, obviously uh, the IoT needs a reliable security throughout its entire ecosystem, I would say. And the issue, the main issue that we see as researchers is that the, the unsecure nature of the devices that make up the billions of nodes that are going to get connected to the internet are the, the major part of the problem. Uh, we currently have many vendors who bring inside the internet ecosystem in secure or poorly configured products and this is typically due to the fact that there is you know a need for responding to competitive pressures coming from the market and there is also a lack of a, a clear and i would say a a, a secure uh, set of development standards so i will really keep this short but basically i would also say that if we look at what is happening inside the regulation system, there are a variety of policies and a, a number of best practices that have been proposed, but we still witness uh, a, a lack of adoption of such practices. And basically everything stays voluntary. And uh, up until now, I have to say uh, from my perspective that there is uh, really, we, we have failed to, to stem, let me say, to stem the tide of the unsecure uh, IoT. So uh, this is a, an issue we still have to face. Thank you very much, Professor. Muted. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, you know, um, you, you indeed uh, laid the ground for uh, uh, looking into the issue of IoTs. I mean, in, when it goes to smart, it should not just be smart in the functioning of itself, but it should be also the R needs to be uh, doing the work of resilience within that. Um, and also the need of the competitive pressure of the market, but also the short term termism that comes with investments uh, from the market in itself. Now, I, 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 I have less than 10 minutes uh, or, or just about 10 minutes. Um, um, you know, uh, and there are a few very interesting questions coming from the floor, and I would definitely love to take that. But before doing it, um, you know, uh, I'm going to put one question to all my panel members, uh, and in and I would like you to answer that just briefly in, in a minute's time, you know, in 60 seconds if you could. Um, and the question that I have for all of you is, how do you see the future of infrastructure uh, digital infrastructure, and how can we ensure that that this future is a resilient one? So it's a it's one question which if we could be responded by all of you um, in a minute's time, uh, Professor. Maybe I'll start um, again with you, uh, just briefly in sixty seconds. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is a tough question, obviously, but uh, in a nutshell, really. I believe that we should look at something that the literature is starting to call um, with a, a nice term that is converged resilience. Uh, I mean, converged resilience is an acknowledgement of the fact 
that there is a clear interdependency uh, between the physical and the digital worlds. And um, this understanding should be leveraged in some way in order to build something that is um, a set of lasting and uh, uh, resilient, uh, once again, uh, strategies for uh, improving the overall resilience of the ecosystem that is a, a complex infrastructure that is made of a variegated set of different components. So I will stop it here, but the, the idea of converged resilience is an interesting one. Indeed, indeed, it's, it's very interesting. I think the word converging resilience, uh, combining physical and digital, definitely. Uh, can I move to you, uh, Mr. Lorek, uh, for your input? Yes, just to, com to complete what I said before, uh, to, to focus on one point, be beyond the use of digital technology to protect uh, against cyber attack, I think that digital technology can be used we said, to grow up the re resilience uh, when we in preparing for this time of attack by strengthening the expertise of teams and the ability to manage crisis. When, uh, we, when they occur in three ways, prevention, it means detection of shortcoming in the organizations, implementation of communication channel uh, between public and private international management, and third, crisis management. It means that crisis reflexes learning and crisis handling. That's all. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, three, three specific criteria, prevention, implementation, and crisis management. Very helpful. Uh, um, Mr. Morrill, can you can I have your um, suggestions in sixty seconds on the same question, please? Sure. We so we we have a saying in public safety: two is one, one is none. So making sure that you have good resiliency in there, look towards those public-private partnerships to create uh, what would be non-traditional areas. Um, and the answer is not always just throwing money at it, but throwing a lot of thought and inventiveness into what's evolving out there and finding creative ways to work together to build those resilient infrastructures. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, the PPPs are always definitely the center of, of the investment decisions and we need to carefully work with on those different aspects. Thank you very much. Um, I'll move to uh, Ms. Pidikiti with the same questions. Uh, I mean, you in interestingly laid a lot of facts and grounds on what's ha exactly happening in India. Uh, but could you, in a minute, um, put forward uh, to us, how does Bharti Airtel uh, plan to ensure the future of the digital infrastructure to be a resilient one? Yeah. So uh, if if I spoke what, what the vulnerabilities, etc. So if I see how Bharti Airtel is going to take care of these as a proactive steps based on our own learnings, you know, on this resiliency part. It's a very huge uh, subject, which will would be very, very difficult to summarize in one minute kind of a thing. But however, in the three important domains, you know, how these data centers, what are the best practices, which location it has to be. And if I give one or two examples on that, is the building electrical infrastructure redundant? Is the fiber infrastructure redundant? Is the roots of that fiber is redundant or not? And we also do the proactive coordination with the electricity boards, governments, and also many stakeholders of the diesel. When these are some of the best practices which we have, I just spoke about on the how we maintain the data center. If I extend similar kind of a thing to the cell towers, the connectivity part, the undersea cable, because you you know we also have an undersea cable. Like whenever we get the tsunami kind of a things, how do we manage those capacities? These are all part of our standard operating procedures, you know, which we built. And there is no end, but because these are keep on evolving as we keep learning new things when new situation comes, this is how we maintain and ensure the future is going to be intact with these kind of a plans on the disaster management. And Thank also you. with the uh, with the support of the government, you know, on these fiber connectivity part and easy accessibility during these situations, disaster situation and power availabilities, we will definitely strengthen further these mitigation plans, which will help the human. Thank you very much, Aruna. I can, yeah, I can, I agree. It's a very big topic to be summarized in 60 seconds. 
Uh, but I do take your highlights, redundancy, coordination, interconnectivity, interdependency, and the role of governance in itself. Um, now, that brings me to uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Vanessa Gray from ITU. Uh, as an international organization, um, what is what do you see or how does ITU see the future of this infrastructure sector and how can we make sure that this is a resilient one? You have your 60 seconds, Vanessa. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've heard a lot about, you know, digital goods and services that they're evolving at, um, at great speed and that we see often that 21st century policymakers and regulators um, are often lagging behind industry innovation. So I would like to focus on, you know, the, the regulation part and the um, need for countries to adapt. Um, at I2 so far, what we have done is we've identified five generations of regulation, um, starting with the first that's more of a command and control approach, um, and now through to the fifth generation that is based on collaboration and harmonized across sectors. And uh, just to give some concrete examples of what is happening in countries that are have now adopted a collaborative fifth generation of regulation, um, they have developed digital strategies, have regulatory sandboxes or test beds for new technologies. These countries have managed to overcome the lack of mechanisms that connect the ICT regulator with other sectors, for example, financial or data protection regulators, um, and they have introduced forward-looking competition policies and data protection laws. Um, we also see that these are countries that go through public consultation to guide regulatory decisions, so really very much a collaborative effort. So really what is key, um, what we see is that we require greater collaboration between policymakers, uh, the regulatory authorities and other stakeholders across the board to effectively harness technological progress and successfully address the challenges of digitalization and for resilient infrastructure. Thank you very much, Vanessa, uh, for that. Um, uh, regulations and collaboration definitely is, is, is the way forward from here. Um, I do have a few questions from the floor, but since I have two minutes left, I won't be in a position to take all of them, but I'm going to take one, uh, one interesting one, and I'm taking it from a perspective that risk and resilience is everybody's business. It's not just the role of just the business of the government or the private sector, it's everybody's business. So I'm taking this question from that perspective. I'm going to leave it open to anybody who feels like uh, responding to it. So we talked about the key risks of digital infrastructure um, and the roles of governments and the private sector. But what is the role of end user in all this? And how do we, what are some of the challenges we see on that front? Is there any of my panel members who is willing to respond to this voluntarily? I, I can take this one if no okay. one else is going sure. to take sure, the floor. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I think that the end user is the, the crucial part of the entire chain. And as usual, this might be even, the, the uh, let me say, the weak part. And I, I personally believe, obviously, being an educator, that there is a fundamental role that is played by education. We need to raise the cultural level uh, of people who are using the infrastructure, who are using the Internet, who are getting connected every day in their everyday life. And this is part of our mission, I would say. Uh, just to give you an idea, with cybersecurity, I tend to say to, to my students, that, to my colleagues, that we need to evangelize somehow. We need to spread information about what is needed in order to become a, a serious user uh, of the Internet, a user who is aware of the things that they're doing. And I will stop here. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, uh, Thank you. I was I was as Vanessa. You wanted to also come in here very quickly. I think it's fine because uh, Professor, the professor has really covered. I think was I was going to say digital skills very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think we have run out of time. There are some very interesting questions coming from the floor. Maybe uh, with the CDRI uh, colleagues, we should be able to document them and maybe re uh, respond back to them in a, in a written FAQ manner. Uh, I mean, for me, uh, it was a pleasure to have you all as the panel. Uh, 
listening to all of you was in, uh, very thrilling and interesting. Um, in, in to highlight a few takeaways that I had is, you know, if we if we want to increase the resilience of digital infrastructure, investments need to be monitored, and we need to measure their vulnerability, not just the investment but also the asset and the sensitivity, its interdependency, and most most all at the exposure to the risk. Uh, this shift will require um, not just government's role, but also the investor, operators, decision makers. And we need to make sure that the disaster and climate risks are considered in the location, design. Uh, Aruna talked about it on the construction, the operation um, of the plan, but also the future investments that's coming in. And now, equally, infrastructure regulators and operators need to facilitate this transition to be a more in resilient to the development and use of um, not just indicators or frameworks, but also to uh, recognize the patterns of change that are going through with the climate experience coming in. Um, I think I could, you would all agree that um, as we see with the COVID-19 crisis, in a, this is in a way already the first stress test of our interconnected digital infrastructure. The surge of demand for online services as a result of the pandemic has shown that digital connectivity and resilience is critical for business continuity. And not just for that, but also to build the resilience of the society and the community in itself. So thank you again for uh, for your time, for speaking to, to us, and also uh, sticking to the time, which was uh, which was already a challenge in this digital environment. Uh, thank you, thank and you have all. a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, bye. Bye. Have a nice thank day. Thank you very much. Bye, bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care. So. Thank you so much, Abhilash and the panel members. We had a very, very interesting discussion with panel members from ITU, India, Japan, Italy, United States of America, and France. And I heard really uh, quotable quotes, including IT plus IT is equal to IT. So from that quote from the Prime Minister of India, which was quoted by the Honorable Minister, to recurring themes like uh, cyber security, internet of things, and regulations lagging behind the changing technology. We had an interesting discuss discussion. I thank all the panel members who uh, accepted the invitation and joined them. With this, we now move on to our next session, which will start at 5.30 or 17.30 India time. But before that, we will uh, announced the results of our Youth for Resilient Infrastructure as a competition. As you are aware that the Youth for Resilient Infrastructure as a competition was announced on 15th of February and the uh, essays were received till 8th of March. In spite of a very, very brief period, we received 143 applications from 34 countries and the jury, a uh, very jury of experts has selected 20 of them from 19 countries as the top top line winners. We are going to announce the winners and the, uh, the essays in the top 20 on our website shortly. You can go to the website and look at the list of winners. I'm sure that youth will engage with disaster resilient infrastructure and they are the future leaders and decision makers. You can also go to our marketplace on the platform and look at various knowledge products and technologies which are being displayed by over 50 uh, solution providers. So you can use this time to do that. See you back at 17.30 for the Urban Resilience session. Thank you.
welcome back to this fourth session on the second day of international conference on disaster resilient infrastructure after having heard the panel of distinguished experts policy makers and high ranking functionaries of governments and organizations on small island developing states on innovations and emerging technologies and the resilience of digital infrastructure systems the next session will talk about a very complex issue of urban resilience now as we are all aware that urban resilience is really multi layered and it is a issue where multiple infrastructure systems need to be integrated to actually achieve some kind of resilience while we have been working on long term strategic goals and objectives for example land use planning the standards and codes related to construction in urban areas the present covid-19 pandemic has thrown some unexpected uh, challenges to the urban planners so for example how do you ensure social distancing in an urban environment in rapid transport systems like metros or for example how do you ensure that the high density areas which the urban systems are are able to prevent the uh, transmission of diseases uh, that is a new issue so urban planners have to basically evolve their thinking in view of the pandemic and to discuss these and multiple other issues we have a eminent panel of experts policy makers we also have honorable minister of urban affairs of government of india mr mr hardeep singh puri who will deliver a keynote address to the session so uh, i will be handing over to the moderator of the session mr amit prothi amit has a uh, career of over 25 years he has worked in over 20 countries and with the organizations like world bank asian development bank and numerous numerous other government and international organizations he has worked on thematic topic areas directly which are related directly to urban resilience including land use planning disaster risk reduction and flood management recently he has managed the preparation of resilient strategies across asian cities including seoul and chennai so to take the this session forward now i am handing it over to mr amit prothi over to you amit thank you sandeep ji uh, thank you for that introduction uh, i am really excited to talk about this topic uh, i want to thank cdri for inviting me to moderate this very important session uh, i think most of you on this audience already know more than half of the world's population lives in cities and we're expected to add something like 2.5 billion more urban residents by 2050 cities are also contributing a considerable portion of our global gdp so when a disaster strikes it's not just about people's lives that are put at risk but considerable portion of the city's economy can also suffer we see that today where the pandemic has severely affected local economies as cities look to recover from the current pandemic they will still need to focus on long term risk reduction particularly related to increasing challenges posed by climate change therefore there is a strong imperative to focus on resilient infrastructure in the urban context building urban resilience is about understanding risk both from a perspective of reducing risk in the infrastructure that is planned and build infrastructure that's aimed at reducing risk in the urban system resilience infrastructure is both about physical infrastructure and social infrastructure today we really have an excellent group of speakers who bring a diverse set of perspective on this topic the format of the session will include a keynote address from the honorable minister hardeep singh puri a stage setting presentation from dr tina combs from tu delft and a panel of discussant from three geographic regions david from ecuador mayor arujo from mozambique and ms sasha stolp from the netherlands and we'll have final comments from mr jagan shah senior advisor in the 
uh, advisor in the Foreign uh, Commonwealth and Development Office of the U UK government, given that there's a very important COP meeting coming up later this year. I also want to take a moment to welcome the participants of the Urban Resilience Masterclass, for whom this is the second session out of four sessions that has been organized for a global audience by CDRI. Lastly, but also importantly, we have Katie Chapel, who will be capturing the discussions of this session as a graphic. Katie is a virtual scribe and live event illustrator, best known for her fresh wobbly illustration and giant live window paintings. She has created live illustrations for global clients, including Apple, Facebook, Google, Chromebook, Dove, Nespresso, and many others. I'm going to take a moment here to see Katie's screen because I suspect it's blank. And then we will actually keep coming back to her to see what she's capturing graphically. So Katie, let's look at your screen for a minute. Great. So it's blank. It's coming soon. Um, let's get the session started. So it's really my honor to introduce Sri Hardeep Singh Puri, the Minister of State for Housing and Urban Affairs in the Government of India. Sri Puri has had a distinguished four-decade career in diplomacy spanning the bilateral and multilateral arena, having held ambassadorial positions in London, Brazil, and as India's permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva and New York. He is one of the few Indians to preside over the UN Security Council and the only one to have chaired its counterterrorism committee. Sir, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I am uh, delighted. Uh, I feel privileged uh, to join such an eminent group of uh, discussants. I would very much have liked to be with you throughout the duration of the program, but you will appreciate that since I'm under a three-line whip, uh, uh, for a vote which is likely to take in uh, take place in Parliament, I had actually pre-recorded my session. But then, when I saw a little gap, I thought it's much better to interact with you um, on a real-time basis than send you a recorded statement. I am very happy to see some familiar faces, including my uh, collaborator who introduced me into this arena, Jagan uh, Shah. Uh, many others I have had the privilege of. Uh, uh, knowing uh, over the years that I spent in another profession. Let me start by uh, saying that um, disasters uh, are both uh, natural and man-made. That goes without saying. Uh, and resilience is something that we have to look at, not only in terms of the traditional narrative, uh, disaster resilience, sustainability, uh, you know, how you look at... Um, the capacity of state systems to respond uh, in an evolutionary manner. Uh, but that's one dimension. I think at the end of the day, uh, urban resilience in general and our ability to demonstrate resilience uh, is largely anchored in the human condition. Uh, you can have the most uh, ecologically sustainable infrastructure you could have built your buildings um, to withstand, you know, uh, seismic shocks, uh, uh, you know, man-made disasters coming from uh, mistakes or willful acts uh, of uh, aggression. But at the end of the day, when you are dealing with large populations, as we are in India, uh, large populations which... Um, uh, means that these are populations whose livelihoods you have to deal with and you're rebuilding the country. One of the statistics that uh, Jagan ac acquainted me to, uh, with, and which I'm very fond of using, so if I've used it in the past with you, please forgive me. But, you know, we have to build something like 700 to 900 million square meters of urban space every year, which is the equivalent of a Chicago. If you look at a city like Delhi, Delhi had a population of something like 800,000 in uh, 1947. When we had our first census in 1950-51, Delhi had a population of, I think, uh, twice or thrice that amount. Uh, 
Now, Delhi, by using, I'm, I forgive me for using Indian terms, the last census we had was 1911, and uh, sorry, 2011, and we had a population of 1.6 crores. That's what. Uh, 1.6 crores, which in the next uh, census will make it in the excess of 2 crores. That's a lot of people. Okay. Now, the way we are looking at Delhi, most of Delhi is being rebuilt. I mean, out of that population, I mean, I think some uh, 30, 30 to 40 percent are unauthorized colonies which are being regularized. Uh, there is Jahan Juggi Mahi Makan, you know, uh, to make sure that the um, people who are the poorest, the economically weaker section, they are having their tenements rebuilt, informal settlements or slums as they are called, they are being redone. Now, in the midst of all that, in 2014, we had a new prime minister who undertook one of the most ambitious and far-reaching plans of urban rejuvenation attend attempted anywhere in the world. And we have programmatic interventions which have raised the expenditure on urban rejuvenation six times more than there was done in the last 10 years. In the midst of all that, a pandemic hit us. Why has India been able to deal with that pandemic? And I submit to you two or three reasons. One is that even though we had no knowledge, uh, because no past experience, I was ambassador in Geneva and New York uh, when we dealt with Ebola and SARS, um, uh, H1N1, many of these had a fatality rate, rate much higher. Uh, SARS had a uh, fatality rate of 17%. We in uh, um, uh, COVID now are doing less than 1%. Our recovery rate is 97, 98%. But it caused complete disruption. Why were we able to deal with it? The, the deadly uh, virus that struck the world first in China, then uh, stealthily spread as a full-blown pandemic across the world, provided a global inflection point. And I think that one of the things which saved us was that, and, and, and I'm not trying to draw comparisons, I think comparisons are odious, many countries which had much smaller populations, much better developed healthcare systems, uh, they had the uh, bandwidth for um, spending, and yet we came out of it looking much better. Uh, we were able to utilize the timing of the lockdown, which was very severe and comprehensive, starting in March of 2020. Uh, uh, we were able to do that to develop our healthcare system. Uh, we did not produce PPEs, ventilators, venti ventilators. Uh, we were first, we've always been the vaccine uh, uh, pharmacy of the world, supplying uh, basic uh, generic drugs to the rest of the world. We were quick in supplying hydroxychloroquine and other drugs to the rest of the world. But we did something much better. We were able to bring in essential medical supplies from outside in the midst of the lockdown, repatriate our citizens who were locked outside, um, uh, you know, had lost their jobs or were at a loose end. We brought, we transported something like 6.6 .6 million people uh, under Vande Bharat scheme. Uh, we have a Vaitri vaccine. We're one of the few countries in the world which is not only manufacturing the vaccine, an indigenous, an indigenous one uh, with Bharat Biotech, but one in collaboration uh, with AstraZeneca, but the other ones are also nearing the emergency authorization stage. And we are supplying vaccines now to under our bilateral um, goodwill arrangements or uh, Gavi, etc., to dozens of other countries. Why were we able to do this? And I think this is something on which I want to speak in terms of uh, urban uh, resilience. Let me, therefore, uh, put it through my you know, thoughts straight from the heart, as it were. And let me say, even at the cost of sounding immodest, and confess that both as an Indian and as a minister in the Council of Ministers of the Prime Minister, Shri Modi, I feel an immense sound, sense of pride in the way India has dealt with this crisis in the urban sphere. You know, 
I don't want to talk about the programmatic interventions and the uh, flagship programs, all of which have been a rearing, uh, roaring success. But when the pandemic broke out, there was something that we did, and I think that is essential to point on that, is that the Prime Minister made us, individuals, ministers and in the government, many of us, speak to literally hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, each day we would be given a specified task, a different state, where we would, let's say, reach out to some people who were associated with the manufacturing processes, whose supply lines had been disrupted, industrialists, artists, members of civil society, NGOs. I must have spoken, I think, at least to a thousand people on a one-to-one -one basis. And we asked them simple questions like, are you comfortable with the lockdown that has been organized? Do you think that time has come to make a decision in choosing between life, which is a lockdown, and issues of livelihood to open the economy? And believe me that results, the feedback we got was filtered through a group of ministers and fed up. That, I believe, is the essential core of decision-making for urban resilience in an economy like India's. I mean, I know there are not too many people with our kind of developmental challenges, countries with a population of 1.3 plus billion plus people. But we were able to get the timings right. Let me uh, give you two examples from my own two ministries civil aviation for which I have independent charge and housing and urban affairs. One of the lessons we learned was that normal civil aviation operations had to be closed because of the spread of the virus, but you wanted to use the same infrastructure for dealing with the problems of the pandemic, transporting medicine, transporting people when everything else was closed down. And the fact that we were able to resume domestic civil aviation by putting in place SOPs, other precautions through our airport. On a good day, pre-COVID, we used to have 350,000 plus passengers a day. When we closed operations on 23rd March and reopened on 25th May, we had only 30,000 passengers a day. When we opened up slowly by following SOPs, we reached a stage where we were at 313,000 already. I used to say with a degree of pride that when we start the summer schedule on 1st April, we will be able to get back to pre-COVID level. No, I see the signs of a possible second wave of the pandemic, and therefore we are going to go a little slower. Therefore, I've taken the position that we have now civil aviation open up to 80%. We will open it to 100% when on three days we get 350,000, not consecutively, but in a month, we will open the thing up. Now, the pandemic destroyed many myths and many reputations. Advanced healthcare systems, which were touted to be the best in the world, crumpled within time. Maybe, and I come back to the same issue, the decision making. You can have the best healthcare system in the world, but if you don't know when you need to effect a lockdown and when you can afford to open up, you can make mistakes. I have uh, uh, stories of uh, holiday resorts in Europe, very popular ones, I'm not going to name any, which thought everything was all right. You could you know, open it up to tourism. My God, there was an immediate flare-up, which resulted in countries and smaller places going into a second and more effective lockdown. Close to India, uh, we had the same story. But we have been very cautious. We have been conscious, and the Prime Minister in particular has been leading up front. He has spoken on a regular basis to all the chief ministers, including, I believe, yesterday. And he monitors the evolving situation. He monitors how much vaccine we are able to produce, and between those two who have the authorization, 
to ensure there is no vaccine wastage. Now, I believe it is this kind of a leadership from up front which has helped us to overcome the immediate challenges. But again, that even that exemplary leadership would not have succeeded, I believe, if in 2014 we hadn't embarked upon the Swachta scheme. For those of our friends who have joined us from other countries, let me say it's a sanitation program. You know, when the Prime Minister of India announced from the ramparts of the Red Fort, when he first interacted in that setting, he said it was his dream. This was 15th August 2014, that by the time we celebrate the 150th birth anniversary of the Mahatma, that is the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, India should be open defecation free. Now, to any outsiders who don't know us, they might think, oh my God, India has to do that. Yes, not only India, many other developing countries in the world have to deal with it. Partly as a cultural pro uh, issue, partly as an infrastructure issue. But you know, we built toilets, hundreds of thousands in the rural areas, in the urban areas, but we succeeded in doing something more. We succeeded in ensuring that there was behavioral change. People realized the value of what urban sanitation was, what rural sanitation was. And I think from one end of the sanitation campaign to the other end of the spectrum, when we built our smart cities, we have 100 of them. We have 50 integrated command and control uh, centers in place. They became war rooms during the pandemic. They were able, with the help of technology, with the use of the latest uh, uh, in terms of monitoring all urban amenities, ensure that we, had, we were up to date with the information, knew where to reach out, whom to supply. Our civil aviation system, our uploading of medical supplies took two to six minutes. Off, uh, offloading took between two and 18 minutes. So you, we had production centers. You could take them from there to transport them throughout the country. You had last mile connectivity. And yet we were able to do that in a seamless effort. Now to do that in a democracy is even more difficult. I submit to you why? Because we have a healthy opposition, which is quite happy to, first they said, why is the vaccine not being, uh, 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 you know, why, why is the lockdown? Then when we opened up, you opened up too soon. Uh, you know, millions of people are going to die. You know, they were picking up stuff from here and there. But, you know, if you look at the overall uh, recovery rate and the fatality ratio, uh, we are not out of it yet, but I can say with a degree of confidence that we can compare with any other country. All this because of a determined, resolute leadership, systems in place, and an urban system with the urban programmatic interventions, water supply, healthcare system. Today we have a system that uh, from not making ventilators, we are now exporting ventilators, PPEs, enough hospital beds. So God forbid, even if we have to face the challenges of a second uh, wave, uh, we, I hope we don't have to. And we can discourage our those of our countrymen who like to party big time and uh, throw procedures to the winds. We are ready to do that. But that's what a democracy is all about. And all I can tell you is that at the end of the day, I don't know how to categorize the pandemic. My initial education in uh, disaster management was there are, hum there are natural disasters, you know, floods, earthquakes, there are man-made disasters. I don't know what the um, uh, pandemic is. Uh, it could be characterized as um, falling in both categories. To some extent, there may be the errors in laboratories or whatever happened, wherever it came from, wet markets elsewhere. I don't want to go into that debate. But to be able to deal with that in the coming years, I'm glad you're having this discussion. And I think the lessons drawn from it, especially after the panels, I'm afraid I won't be able to join you for much longer. But I will draw on my friend Jagan to give me, after all, he when he, you have three very eminent panelists. But when Jagan draws that up, we would like to gain from that. 
what is it that you are discussing with such eminent expertise some of the lessons which we can plow back into our programmatic intervention and i am sure that the leadership in the country even at the level of the prime minister uh, will gain from this and uh, thank you very much for having me with you thank you sir that was really um, very thought provoking but also in a way echoes a number of things that you know i work for a city network around the world and some of the things that you've been saying actually has echoed back points that i've been hearing from the other cities strong leadership the discussion around lives and livelihoods from this pandemic i think when a disruption happens people's lives are affected and so are livelihoods and how do you deal with that um the whole notion of repurposing i think you mentioned the airline industry how you had to repurpose that's happened again and again and again across a variety of governments where they've had to repurpose because governments has has to they've they've literally repurposed how they function um what's interesting is if you look historically as well historically plagues have actually changed dramatically changed cities and so i think we are all sitting at the cusp of trying to understand how will this pandemic change our cities i don't think we have a clear answer yet but hopefully we get there um and and, and what are the systems that need to be in place sir i really appreciate all of these comments and hope i have can i can i uh, please, take please. advantage of your hospitality to make just two points please uh you know in another profession in which i spent 40 years whenever we spoke of reform in a system and i'm talking about the un whenever i try to as permanent representative in new york in particular we should talk about reform of the structure i was always reminded that the existing architecture for governance i mean the united nations the international monetary fund the world bank uh, the world trade organization and before that the general agreement on tariffs and trade these were born out of a crisis yes in fact the un was conceived in san francisco whilst the second world war was still going on so when i used to talk of reform some of my uh, very good friends but uh, not um, likely to be persuaded by my argumentation said you know but we did this when the wor world war was on you will need to have another war i used to tell them be careful be careful crisis can come not only in the form of you know wars and world wars but crisis can come you don't know where i think the pandemic has driven home to all of us the values of good urban governance translated down to urban local bodies but also strong leadership let me give you an example when i was newly appointed as a minister in 2017 i went to a place called i think bhopal in indore and indore year after year in a survey we do on urban sanitation comes out number 1 so i wanted to go into the reasons why this swachhta sarvekshan which is an annual survey why some cities do well invariably invariably the answer is a good chief minister a good local mayor look mayors have an importance in urban issues which we are not able to understand therefore i am very unhappy about the fact that our mayors are not there for long term we live in new york you know if you see who cleaned up crime in new york giuliani's name came to mind but if you have a mayor only for a year by the time the poor man or woman is settling down you know we have another so we are trying to refocus on that with the 73rd and 74th amendment but i think countries have a crisis you know if you make a mistake some of the countries which had the best healthcare systems in the world were casual about the response equally on climate change look when you are talking about urban resilience it's very closely tied down to climate i have some brilliant notes which i'm going to put out with my staff at prepare i mean the the nexus between climate uh, uh, resilience you know the response urban resilience people realize if you get buildings done we are now changing our technology totally we are trying to make buildings which are not toxic we are talking about innovative we had a global technology uh, construction challenge we whole year was declared so urban resilience is much more than its classical definition and i want to submit that and i apologize for taking more time but thank you very much for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you very much sir and actually it goes right into our next uh, speaker um, dr tina combs 
uh, who's the Delft Technology Fellow and Associate Professor at the Faculty Technology Policy and Management at TU Delft in the Netherlands. Um, she's an eminent planner, and I don't. I think I will save some time. And Dr. Tina, over to you. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction, and also for my part, I'm thrilled to be here and have the opportunity to speak to all of you. And I will try to uh, speed up a bit. And um, yeah, so. Uh, Thanks again for giving me the opportunity to speak. And indeed, so some of the issues mentioned will come up also in my presentation. I'm trying to refocus and bring us back again to the issues of urban resilience. And because I'm trying to be brief, you can also find like my contact details. If you have any questions, just let me know, because as we know, this is also a masterclass and you know, working at the university, we are also all trainers and teachers. Next slide. Yeah. So you already um, heard that I'm working at the TU Delft, which is the oldest and the largest technical university in the Netherlands. What we are trying to do in the lab is become a reference point for inter interdisciplinary research to promote resilient societies. And we do that by leveraging both the technology, but also the engineering knowledge and the data driven approaches that are developed on campus and then interact with practice and policymakers to really push the boundaries of academic research, but also to provide concrete tools to make a case for policy change and action. Next slide. Now, that was already mentioned in the very beginning. Um, we do know that you know, cities obviously need to, uh, need to be a driver of climate adaptation, because if we want to have a, to have a chance with um, mitigating climate change, then we need to start in our cities. That's where most of our population is based. And that is, of course, a lot of pressure on uh, urban planning. But at the same time, if we look at this map of where the fastest growing cities are located, we see that most of them are actually in coastal regions. So that means they are extremely um, opposed to challenges such as sea level rise. Next slide. And at the same time, you know, these cities are also growing because people go there um, with a prospect of economic growth, equality, better infrastructure than in rural areas. So if we talk about urban resilience, it is very clear that we have to deal with all these pressures and challenges at the same time. Improving our cities so that they can, you know, accommodate more people and help them lead better lives, um, be a catalyst of Climate, uh, climate mitigation and climate adaptation, and then also become resilience, resilient against the challenges that are coming towards us in the context of climate change. And that is both like trends such as sea level rise, as well as more and more extreme weather events. Next slide. Now, the way that uh, we define resilience, and that is also nicely uh, matching to what we just heard, is that it's not just sort of the classic conventional reliability engineering where you have an infrastructure that quickly recovers from a shock or stress, um, but that we are really talking about a socio-technical system that is the people that use the infrastructure and um, live in the city together with sort of the systems we build. And that we look at both the response to shocks as well as the um, adaptation and reorganization um, as we are, for instance, talking about climate change. Now, that was all quite abstract, so let me make it more concrete. Next slide. If we are talking about cities, then one of the key challenges is that even within the very same city, you can have very different uh, infrastructure systems and very different uh, patterns of how people live there. So this is an image of Mumbai. Now, we are proposing to use data-driven approaches to understand how the infrastructure we built, and we just had heard a lot about WASH infrastructure as well, so how that infrastructure helps to make our communities and our cities more resilient. And the starting point for that can be understanding how infrastructure development correlates with socioeconomic resilience. Next slide. Uh, click one more. should see images there. Thank you. So this is a project where we, um, where we look at urban resilience analytics. So what I said before, we use machine learning approaches, um, artificial intelligence, to understand how infrastructure systems and behavior um, relate, 
relate to each other and how we can understand the resulting inequalities. So this is a map on the left side, you see uh, the road network of Helsinki and how it's evolved between 1983 and 2016. And on the right, you see um, the mapping, a mapping and analysis of socioeconomic resilience in Helsinki. And you can see, if you look very closely, that actually where more new infrastructure is built, um, socioeconomic um, resilience is better. So just also as a plea, we can use these approaches to co-shape how the infrastructures also determine the social and economic aspects. Next one. So, of course, we already had a lot, <laughs> heard now a lot about COVID. Um, so I definitely don't have to introduce it. Next slide. But what was already also mentioned, so this is a mapping about different countries, how, uh, how, how they were hit by COVID. But we also do see that cities are hit hardest. That is probably not surprising because indeed we have a high population density and we know that COVID is transmitted through people interacting with each other. But there are still also a lot of things that we do not know about COVID-19. That is one, we don't, for instance, know how people interact and how they comply to the measures that are introduced. But also secondly, we are now talking about new variants and variants of concern of the virus or the effectiveness of vaccines. Next slide. And as you are all um, you know, in the cities starting to think about how to organize the city, um, to uh, protect the population from COVID-19, what we are doing is build simulation models to help policymaking with that step. And importantly, this is a way for you to simulate, um, create an artificial city environment where you can try and test out the impact of policies without like trying it out on your population and throwing it on that. Um, next slide. What we did, for instance, in the HEROES project, which is one of um, my ongoing EU funded project is we were looking at the, the impact of certain policies on The Hague. And one of the interesting findings that you see here, so we, we do model how people in the city move about um, and where they are infected and then how these infection clusters arise. We were expecting initially to see them mostly in the city center, which is sort of in the center of the map that you see there. Um, but surprisingly, because interaction and traveling through the center is limited because we are actually currently still in a lockdown. Um, we see that the clusters arise more in a ring in the periphery around the city where people then do get infected. So this is one way where we can trace where, where infections actually still happen and what the impact is of, for instance, lockdown or different reopening policies. Also the, the new variants, for instance. Now on the almost final slide, next. Um, a plea, the, the masterclass people have received that paper, so maybe some of you have already seen, seen this graph. Um, together with Supriya, who is also has been working on this session, um, we have also been looking at how can we improve um, urban resilience for, 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 the for a changing climate, and what are the differences between what is currently done within academia, so some of the things I talked about here today, and what is actually done, implemented, or looked for in practice. And we do see that there, there are still you know, different perceptions, there are different priorities, um, maybe not surprisingly, but what I'm really very much looking forward to in this session, and also if we can continue the dialogue, I would be very happy to, is sort of to bring together what we can do as researchers in academia with what you need and what your questions are in practice, because I do think that only together we can advance urban resilience. Thank you. You're on mute. Ah, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Gomez. That was really nice and sweet and short, but also very relevant. I think you highlighted the opportunity to leverage data. Um, you know, simulating policies, that's really important at this point when governments are trying to understand what direction to take, uh, but also using it to understand where, where one sees the infections being clustering, etc. Um, I want to just take a minute because I've been seeing Katie's been busy drawing and she was trying to capture what you were talking about. So rather than me trying to summarize, maybe Katie, can we look at what you've been drawing? Okay. There we go. Research and 
tools for policy change. So that gets into the simulation. Uh, sea level rise, I think you talked about how coastal cities, you know, there are more and more and more people living on the coast and the coastal areas are getting more and more vulnerable. So I think there is really something there one has to focus on. Um, bridging the gap between research and practice, I think that actually is perfect for our next segment. Um, so thank you, Katie. I would like to then maybe move on to our panelists because we really have three practitioners coming up now. Um, and let me introduce them. First is the mayor is Mayor Manuel Arojo from uh, Kelimane in the economic, political, and administrative capital of Mozambique's Zambezia province and the country's fifth largest city, which has close to 400,000 inhabitants. Um, the second panelist comes from Latin America. David, uh, who I know very well, um, is the currently the Metropolitan Director of Residence at the Municipality of Quito in Ecuador and the Chief Residence Officer as part of the Residence Cities Network, hence I know him well. Um, and the third speaker comes from Europe. Ms. Sacha Stolp is the Director of Innovation for Future Proof Assets for the City of Amsterdam. Uh, which basically is from, she's part of a crossover program between the Department of Engineering and the Department of Urban Management. I think one thing we are hearing today again and again is when we're talking about resilience, it's not just about the physical infrastructure, but also about people. Uh, and just this, you know, um, so I think we're going to hear some of explanation of that a little bit more in some of these conversations. Um, I'm going to start the panel discussion. And Mayor Arujo, I'm going to start with you. So can you provide us with a brief description of your city to essentially help the audience understand the various shocks and stresses that affect Kilimani and how these shocks and stresses have impacted the lives of people and the infrastructure of your city? Mayor, over to you. Mayor Arujo. I think you're on mute. You're right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, Amit and uh, Priya and the whole team for inviting me to be here today with you to share, to, to, to learn from the other panelists' experience, but also to give us, to give us the opportunity to share our own experience in Kilimane. As Amit said, Kilimane is a coastal city. It's also a port city. And it was built on a swamp on the banks of the Bon Sinai River, making it very vulnerable to climate change events. For example, in the last three years, we suffered five cyclones. In 2019, we had uh, Cyclone Idai, which destroyed almost 90% of uh, a neighboring city, which is the Debeira city, which is like 30 minutes by flight from Kelimane. But also in a space of two months, we had uh, another cyclone, Cyclone Kenneth, which uh, was on the north, which uh, uh, and also destroyed most of the, the city of, 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 of Pemba. This year alone, in 2021, we had uh, three cyclones already. Cyclone Eloise, Cyclone Chalan, and Cyclone Guande. So this raises the importance of urban re re resilience. And uh, the issue of urban re resilience has been a concern to most local governments in the light of the ac accentuated climate change related activity. I mean, this concern, of course, has led to more research and investment, not only in technologies, but also in infrastructure and uh, manpower. Of course, these challenges are not only affecting Kalimani or Mozambique. I think this is a worldwide phenomenon. This is a global concern the, of uh, local mayors and local government to look for solutions that uh, are really more durable and uh, more cost uh, if, if effective. Uh, as I mentioned, 
I don't know if uh, we could move to the next page. No? Okay. So what have we done given the challenges that we are facing? Uh, Kalimani City, we must say that uh, is one of the first, if not actually the first local authority or local city to have a local adaptation plan. This ad 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 adaptation plan was approved by the municipal assembly. And we were able of designing this local adaptation plan with support of some regional and international entities. Because this, I'm highlighting this to draw the attention for the need of building local capacity. Uh, at my municipality, we wouldn't alone, we wouldn't have been able of coming up with a local adaptation plan. So we had to identify regional, national, and also international partners that helped us in this process of um, coming up with, uh, or in, coming up in designing a local adaptation plan. We also managed to come up with a, a vulnerability map for the mun municipality, which show us uh, the dangers different areas of the, the, the city have. And if somebody or an entity wants to build an infrastructure, we are able today, based on this vulnerability map, to advise the entity or the person on which steps to take to minimize or to mitigate the, 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 the vulnerability. We also are uh, embarked into a permanent education campaign for communities on the effects of climate change and the ways to address uh, its challenges, but, but also to adapt to the ch challenges that uh, we are facing. We are also working with community-based org org organization in the process of implementing some of the measures that, that are outlined in our local adaptation plan. For example, the first line of defense from erosion, but also from flooding, are uh, the mangroves. But because people are poor, they do cut those mangroves, either for building their own houses or for cooking. So what we did actually was to engage and to create youth clubs, women environmental clubs, and also student climate or environmental clubs, where we go and we inform them about the importance of the mangroves, not only for the biodiversity, but also for the protection of the city. As I mentioned, our first line of protection from Erosion, given that we are, as I mentioned, we are a coastal city, therefore we suffer. And, 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 and actually, I also mentioned that Kenimano was built on a swamp and on the banks of a river. Therefore, we suffer the effects not only of sea rise level, but also the effects of uh, rain or flooding coming from the rain. And actually, sometimes it coincides at the same time, making it even more difficult to manage the consequences. So we teach these communities in these groups that we created the importance of, of the mangroves to not only to biodiversity, but as I mentioned, also to protect our city from er erosion. The question that arises from this community is that, look, we understand the importance of the mangroves, but what are the alternatives? And here is where we are looking for partners and other stakeholders to help us to come up with alternatives so that we can be able of protecting the mangroves. For example, we managed to come up or to make a partnership with the UN Habitat where we build the first 10 resilient houses. These houses are built using local techniques and local ma materials that will then allow our communities to build or rebuild their houses without uh, cutting the mangroves. But of course, we need more, we need to scale it up. We had this as a, a, a pilot example. We also came up with another pilot example where we used waste to, we, to produce biogas. 
So this also, is, it was a way to answer to those who are saying that we need alternatives for the use of mangroves for cooking. So we identified that we can transform the waste that we collect in the city, and then from that uh, uh, waste, we can create biogas. Of course, as I mentioned, this also is a, a pilot project that we are looking for partners and other uh, 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 to scale it up so that we, we, we are able to respond to the challenges that uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are facing. So we have been also working to spread more information about climate change and the adaptation methods and techniques among those communities, among the students, the women, and uh, the, the youth. Uh, we have been also working with within the municipality to raise up the level of awareness for the need to have, w w when approving projects, to be aware of the recommendations that our vulnerability map drawn. We also defined measures to save water introduce collection and use of rainwater in the municipality, as well the sewage water treatment and reuse. As I mentioned before, we are promoting waste recycling and reuse, not only for biogas, but also transforming part of, of the waste into compost. So by doing that, we manage to improve not only the yields, the productivity, but also the production level of uh, uh, our farmers within the urban rural area. We are also defining a clear guideline of resilience and we are reinforcing the local laws that, that are leading actually to a major performance on the resilience way. We have been working to enhance the partnership between the public, the private sector, in securing and enhancing the security and the resilience of critical infrastructure. Like uh, when public buildings are being built like schools, streets, or clinics, we make sure that uh, our environment and climate change specialists are there so that uh, resilience guidelines are followed strictly. Uh, we are also developing and working to encourage private businessmen to perform periodic risk assessment and implement risk reduction programs. Actually, I did not mention before that I equally, I'm also the co-chair of the uh, risk management and uh, resilience at the Global Ex Ex Executive Committee. So we bring that experience that from the international level but to the local, but also we take what we are doing, sharing with other, not, not only with other mayors, but also with the other international organizations that they bring together mayors and uh, other local government of officials. And given that, just to finalize, given that 80% of the municipality population lives actually on agricultural activity, and uh, because of the phenomena of salt intrusion and uh, increasingly soil salinity, we are working with farmers to teach them ways of improving the quality of the soil, thus avoiding the salt water intrusion either from the sea or from the river. By doing so, of course, we are protecting also the land available for agriculture, not only for ag agriculture, but also for building infrastructure. And uh, we, just to finalize, as I was saying, we feel that an effective resilience is built up with an entire collaboration of all sectors in the municipality, starting with the community, the private sector, the public sector, churches, civil society, and others. And the aim is to reach and efficiency on the resilience, taking actions to bring more knowledge to the community, thus improving their income or the income 
of those who are less privileged. Thus, ca coming up with an inclusion in a, a with a strategy that includes not only the most productive of our society, but also including the most vulnerable. Thank you. Very, very thank, very thank you. Thank you, Mayor Arusha. That was really helpful, and you really helped to provide a very, uh, you know, good understanding of the stresses and shocks that your city faces. The fact it's on the river, the fact it faces um, flooding, the fact, you know, I really appreciated hearing you talk about a vulnerability map because that's often not something a lot of cities have done. And then using that to actually guide your infrastructure decisions, I think that is really commendable and that more and more cities need to do that. And the other thing I really, really, really liked was your working with community for them to understand risks from climate change. Uh, and then, you know, the whole notion of preserving mangroves is not an easy decision because people are relying on their livelihoods and lives. And the pressure on you to then get the community to understand, the, you know, you need to preserve mangroves because they're protecting the whole community, and yet they need livelihood as well. Which actually gets me very well to the next panelist, uh, David. I'm going to come to you, um, David. In Quito, I mean, the city of Quito has been focused on urban resilience for the past few years. Uh, David, can you briefly discuss how Quito has approached urban resilience? and how the efforts that you have been undertaken have helped to support vulnerable populations, particularly during the pandemic. Thank you, David, over to you. Um, thank you, Amit, and I will be happy to share our experience. Um, Quito launched a comprehensive uh, resilience strategy in, in 2017, and the main aim um, of the strategy is to strengthen different critical systems to build resilience. As a result, our job is supported primarily by a robust participation system where neighborhood leaders, for example, are prepared to plan for, uh, for their community's development under our resilience lens. This gives ground to other actions in other realms, such as, for example, conserving nature in and around the city or urban development around our mass, uh, mass uh, transit, transit system, especially when we are uh, finishing the first metro line of the city in order to give an inclusive voice to support these efforts. Um, at the same time, uh, as part of the resilience strategy, the food economy is one of the objectives supported uh, in the fourth pillar uh, in, in, in the same strategy, aiming at having a solid and resourceful economy. This is actually about long-term planning for, for resilience. When analyzing uh, the SDGs, for example, uh, where we could have multiple, uh, multiple different entries. And uh, by aiming to one of them, we can cause uh, systemic change. And this is what we are aiming um, while uh, working uh, in this way, if it is planned properly. So for example, if uh, by achieving zero hunger, um, it is understandable that it is possible to also contribute to provide better access to education, for example. Uh, kids are uh, better uh, prepared to, to attend classes and so on. And later on uh, to uh, um, uh, get uh, better livelihoods uh, while also working on the, on the uh, job um, offer uh, system of the city, of course. And this is important uh, because uh, if informal settlements are the result of the efforts made by people to provide a home for their own by using scarce resources, then reducing economic inequality becomes important to steer this type of developments and contribute to a better uh, way uh, in a better way to the SDG 11. So, uh, as you can see, we are aiming to work in a, in a, in a, uh, under a systems, a systems lens uh, fashion. Um, so, uh, as a result, understanding what the drivers that what the drivers are that cause food insecurity um, and how it is distributed in the territory, this allows this allows the city to work ac accordingly. The premise is that if there is one single person with food insecurity, then this is an indicator of a malfunctioning system, food system. And this is what we are trying to prevent and what we are trying to fix. Um, in, two, in 2020, the coronavirus pandemic hit the world and Quito and, and pretty hard. Um, um, 
I would say, the city. That changed all of our maps and understanding of how food insecurity was happening in the city. A lot more people had no access to food and the reasons were also uh, a little bit different than the ones that we had before, since in this case, no one was able to leave home that provided additional challenges. So if resilience is basically having a system to reorganize, to keep having essentially the same function, in this case, uh, to keep providing nutritious and healthy food for everyone, then that was the main task. And I would like to highlight uh, two actions here as part of our response. Uh, first of all, the urban farming program that has been going on in the city of Quito for a couple of decades. But um, as part of the resilience strategy, um, the program was, has been strengthened and amplified. This program supports around 1,500 families to produce local and organic food for their own consumption. 80% of them are uh, family, uh, uh, woman-led families, either single mothers or head of households. And the 50% of those families produce, uh, make that produce for their own subsistence. Um, and the, these families uh, in the context of the coronavirus were better prepared than others uh, to face uh, food, the, the, the difficulties to access food. Um, and furthermore, actually, they were able to help others that were in a more desperate situation uh, with their surplus, surplus production. So in a sense, uh, the system was able to, uh, indeed, in in that part of the system was able to support others that were somehow ex excluded from the system. The second action was the support provided by neighborhood leaders, uh, which is basically the result of the highly, of a highly participatory processes, process that we were, that we have been uh, carrying on in the city uh, for quite a while now. So in a context where informality prevents having enough and accurate data and information uh, to have a better response to help, especially the most needed, neighbor, neighborhood leaders were able to jump in and support um, the help provided by the, by the municipality of Quito and other actors uh, coming from the private sector, uh, for example, to help us identify where, where these um, very needed people are located and to provide assistance so that we, we were able to distribute food and, and allevi alleviate their needs. I think these two actions account on how to manage ur urban complex systems to build, to build resilience, especially when there are high levels of informality and lack of information and data. And uh, also as, as a result, provide these systems with adaptive capacities by creating redundancies uh, and allowing subsystems to reorganize in different ways to keep the system uh, running. Um, I hope this, this experience contributes uh, to these very important and interesting conversations and I'm very much looking forward to hear uh, what comes uh, in the next points. Thank you, David. Thank you really for highlighting the importance of focusing on people. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I've always appreciated of, about Quito is the focus on individuals and community building social resilience amongst community members, right? The focus on food security, for example, had started before the pandemic. It was already something that you as a city were focused on. You know, the, the intention of achieving zero hunger in your community was happening before the pandemic. And I think when the pandemic hit, you were much, much better prepared than a lot of other cities to, to you know, mobilize that system and feed the community. So I think that's an important point to remember. It's not just about physical infrastructure. It's actually a lot about people uh, and social, uh, social resilience as well. Uh, thank you, David. So my third uh, panelist is Ms. Sacha Stolp. Uh, and Ms. Stolp, I think my question comes to you, which is, um, uh, it's literally saying, you know, thinking about the, the context of Amsterdam and starting to understand for all of us, how is Amsterdam preparing and taking decisions, particularly to address increasing risks related to climate change? And then in your role as director of innovation, how have you been working within the city government to prepare the city for disruptions given the uncertainty related to climate change? And then how are you balancing the need for long-term planning that is needed for climate change with current 
focus on recovering from COVID. So really, how are you balancing the immediate response with the long-term needs of, uh, of your city? So over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I appreciate it that I'm uh, welcome here to uh, share uh, our experience. Um, well, uh, Amsterdam is the capital of the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a small uh, country in Europe. Uh, and well, we're probably most famous for Johan Cruijff, who is a very famous soccer player, but uh, and we're also famous for our old city. It, uh, but not many people know that we are actually the end of the Alp system, which is the central mountain district within Europe. And its water is flowing through our, uh, to our country, to the sea. And so we are more or less the same than Quelimane, and I have to say it right. And, and we are an, a delta city uh, built in the swamps of what used to be the western part of the Netherlands, or what is the western part of the Netherlands, but we used to be the swamps. And we are a historical delta city. We exist for around uh, 750 years. And we're not only physically an old city, but we also have, well, let's say institu uh, institutions who are there for a long time. So we don't only have the government, the local government, but we actually have a water board because the Netherlands is famous for its water management and, 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 and building, especially within the lower deltas. And it's protecting us. And it's, well, it protects us so well that usually the people who are living in the Netherlands, they are not aware that they're living under sea level. And so we are vulnerable for climate change but the awareness in our society of this problem is quite low because it's arranged so well. So I think, and now I'm doing sure to everybody who has well suffered from COVID-19 and, and has lost in his families, I think COVID-19 is also a wake-up call for our generation and especially our generation because we hadn't faced shocks for such a long time, actually. And my grandparents, they lived in the Second world war, world war, and they told me, of course, stories when I was a small child, but it was so far away and they were so old. And, ah, well, it was an other era. But actually, our city was built in an era before our time. Um, well, let's say, for instance, we are now uh, replacing bridges and canal wall systems and, and roads, which were built for horses and carriage. Those people, the engineers from the past, they, they didn't have a clue that we're going to have trucks and, uh, and that we're going to have Teslas with large, better, large and heavy batteries. So our city is vulnerable due to the fact that we are there for such a long time and our systems are there for such a long time. So what are we doing to make ourselves more ready and more resilient? Now, one of the things, I'm going to push my cat a little bit away, so, um, is uh, that we are facing this national program and we incorporate this and it's on the, uh, the national climate adaptive strategy. So we mapped our stress for extreme heat, for extreme rainfall, drought, and sea level rise to our city. And that's where the, the stress test is on climate adaptation. And I think that that made it very clear on where are our vulnerabilities and how can we um, uh, take measurements within our regular assignment uh, 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 program. On the other hand, we widened our regular stress test. We used to have a stress test only based on financial components, but we're now having a stress test for the first time, not only on economic and financially, but also on other stress actors, like for instance, climate change, but also on megatrends, because they're also very uh, important. Let's say cyber uh, crime or a uh, cyber attack and, uh, a demographic shock or, or climate change. And actually, we, we have now uh, marked the, 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 the former uh, stress actors like financial and economic as traditional. And we have added the other megatrends. And, 
and that of course gives us an idea of what shocks and stresses are doing for our physical, social and financial sector. But that's still very high level. And the thing is, we want to know how do we have to act? And that's why we also have a bottom-up approach. I think I like the third part the most, because that's where we uh, cooperate together with Knowledge Institute, but also with our local partners and not only our contractors, but also with the people in the streets and people living actually. So it's this triple helix approach and it's, it's this quadruple helix approach. And we are even making right now a podcast talking with front runners locally who are doing things together with people from the Knowledge Institute and bringing them together using our maintenance assignment as a field lab uh, um, for, for new ideas, new materials, but also these new approaches, bringing together all these stakeholders. And we also have a living lab program together with students. And well, if I can shift my work week in three parts, this is actually the most fun part. Um, yeah, well, this is the way we approach it. And, and as I mentioned, uh, 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 COVID was a wake up call. And um, well, there are other things I can tell. Uh, thank, thank you so much. I think um, it's interesting. I picked up some new, new vocabulary, which is not new to me, but I think it's worth highlighting is the whole legacy issue, right? The, when you're building infrastructure, it's going to last you for 50, 70, 100, 200 years. Yep. And we can't predict everything that's going to come our way, but we have to be, you know, we, we already understand certain risks that are emerging related to climate change, particularly for coastal areas for other cities. Yep. And as we are starting to put in new infrastructure in place, we are creating legacies for the future. And I think it's important to start understanding how is the current infrastructure planning going to be affected by the future changes that are coming. And I, you know, I, I heard you talk about that, you know, testing your stress test, for example, is now broader beyond financial uh, and economic to actually include climate change. And also the whole notion of the bottom up and getting more and more people aware and engaged, which is also something we heard from both David and the mayor, right? I think it's yeah. the whole, people have to understand why you're so making these decisions. Yeah, it's, it's not uh, only the people, but it's the complete approach of our economy, actually, because yeah. we have to learn to adapt yeah. within an assignment and within the lifespan of things which we try to build for 100 years or 50 years. I yeah. think that's what is completely new. And to give you an example of a complete useless in investment, because that's... Uh, uh, the Netherlands tried to build a wall system around Amsterdam. Well, it was uh, in the 19th century, actually, they started. And it was ready before World War II. But they forgot that it was a world war with airplanes. So they built a construction based on all thinkings about a uh, war and how it would go previously. So it was completely useless when we needed it. And, and I think this is what we have to take in consideration. How are we going to evaluate the things we are doing while we are doing them and then become, well, and, and adapt these new circumstances? For instance, we know that, that, that like the IPCC will have new reports about how the climate is changing every five to 10 years. Yeah. How are we going to incorporate this new way of thinking? Well, sometimes uh, city development is, is, is during 25 years. Yeah, I, I, and I think, you know, this, this, uh, this notion of knowing, we know that a lot of the uh, urban, a lot, lot, lot of the part of the world is, is actually urbanizing rapidly, right? You, you look at the numbers and there's, uh, you know, the minister talked about one Chicago a year of yep. growth in India. And it's not, you know, if you look at Africa and other places. So there's incredible amount of infrastructure that's getting built as we speak. And we are still trying to figure out how do we incorporate all of the understanding of risks into that system. 
and actually this does take me to the poll question. So we actually have a poll question for the audience. Um, I would encourage all of you to look um, the, for the audience, look at there is a poll button uh, that you'll see. And the question really is, we want you to pick one gap from the following, um, you know, pick a, from basically pick one of the following gaps that prevent cities from building resilient infrastructure. Is it lack of understanding about resilient infrastructure? Is it limited data on hazard information and risks? Is it decision making at state or national level with limited influence at the city level? Or is it outdated policies and standards? And I'll say it can be all of it, but I think we want you to actually choose the one that is the most important from your perspective. So I'll give you 30 seconds to make a determination and I'll give a breather to the panelists for you know, th that 30 seconds and we'll come back. Um, so please, please do fill out that poll. And Sasha, we can see your cat again. I think we all, everybody enjoyed seeing that your cat. <laughs> Um, okay, hopefully we've got, you know, people have filled out the poll. Um, I will move now to the second round of questions, which will have to be a little bit faster. Uh, but Mayor, back to you. Uh, in your city and country's context, how do you see a focus on urban resilience contributing to the achievement of larger global commitments such as the SDGs or Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. So linking your um, focus on urban resilience with the larger global focus. So over to you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, it's my understanding that uh, if you look at each of the SDGs, we can easily realize that all of them need a place to happen. They don't happen on a vacuum. And that place, most of the times, or for most of SDGs, is the urban area or any other place where a local government is managing. So therefore, to me, if we want to really to achieve SDGs, there is no other way than to work coordinate with mayors because actually mayors are on the forefront at the place where all these SDGs or, or at least most of them do happen and if we incorporate and if we mobilize mayors and local government I think we can achieve them, achieve them at a, a faster speed but also at a more in a more sustainable way that that will be my un understanding of the relationship between local government and uh, SDGs. Thank you, Mayor. Loved your short response, but I think highlighting that it is SDGs are actually happening in a place, and often it is at the local level. And we the importance of local government cannot be, um, you know. It, it, we, we can't highlight that any less. And I think that goes back to the need to focus on urban resilience. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, David, second question to you. Um, you've been working on a resilience for a while, Kizidi of Quito. From your point of view, what system, systemic, systematic changes or procedural changes do you believe are essential for planning for long-term resilience? And how can the CDRI, which is a coalition of national government, uh, entities, how can they support the knowledge development process to build urban resilience? Thank you. Uh, I think um, this is a very important question. Um, I think uh, in, in, in a very um, concise way, uh, there are two parts. The first part is identifying specifically, specifically what are the challenges of the city that, make, that makes it more vulnerable. Um, not only physically, but also socially. It has already been said um, a lot uh, in, in, in this panel. And I, and I think that is very important. Then the next question is uh, how, to, um, how to provide 
proper answers and solutions to uh, those vulnerabilities. And um, I would like to uh, just um, um, highlight two points. And uh, that is that the way forward is uh, doing two things at the same time. Um, contributing to the SDGs, for example, or sustainable development, making sure that no one is left, no one is left behind but also planning for that process is to be resilient. And um, I think there is a wealth of knowledge uh, out in the world and um, sharing and, and, and supporting cities in this effort is probably the best contribution that the CDRI and of course uh, cities networks like the Resilient Cities Network um, or the ICLEI um, does is possibly the best, the best contribution uh, in our way forward. Thank you, David. Uh, again, thank you for being short and sweet. Um, I, you know, your two points are appreciated, specifically understanding how each city is vulnerable and then sharing lessons because people are exploring and experimenting and lessons are starting to emerge. And sharing those lessons and building capacity is really important. Miss um, Stolp, from your perspective, I think it's the same question, frankly, because you're in a different context and you know, I want to see if there's any difference in your response. Uh, what systematic changes or procedural changes do you believe are essential for planning for long-term resilience? And then how can CDRI support the knowledge development process? Well, I would try to take a little bit another angle on this very, very important question. Well, I, I, I really do think that in well-organized countries, uh, we need to have an other type of organization which goes right through all these offices within a city to address uh, an, a kind of shock organization or how are you going to organize it when because the shock stops everything you need to have this this go through all the offices and make everybody aware of how to deal with stress so 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 can we make some kind of systematic change within organizations help those local uh, organizations to become more adaptive actually and and then i think we don't have to forget that we need to have excellent relationships with urban stakeholders knowledge institutes but also with cooperation because we do need to change the the economy and the way we think to a more circular way of thinking and more circular economy i was very inspired uh, of the story of uh, of Major uh, Manuel Diajudo um, uh, about how do we get citizens uh, uh, involved within protecting the mangrove forest, but also to rethink the way we build. And, and I think this is, is extremely important that we are looking for this new kind of coalitions based on a trustworthy long-term relationship because it is essential for companies too that they contribute to society they are part of society they're not standing alone it's not us defending society and they are well defending economy i think if we want to have a welfare future together and a prosperous future and a thriving future we need to cooperate in triple helix and then of course we have to create this new normal and 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 create new standards so it's that it's because wherever you're living on earth you're living in a city you do want to do the same you want to you you want to live you want to work you want to take care of each other you you want to be educated and you want to have some spare time and and fill it and and and, and have a meaningful life and, and how are we going to, to, to make a new normal that the things that we're figuring out in Amsterdam can be easily put in procurement procedures and in policies and in standardized uh, regulation all over the world so that we can give a kind of leadership also to, the, to corporations that this is the kind of products and this is the kind of solution that we need. And we need it because we are humans and we need... And, and we live on Earth, and, and, and we also have to take into account that we live here with other creatures. Great. Thank you so much. I think it's interesting. It was the same question to David and you. That, you know, 
interesting responses from both of you. And I think I'll, I do appreciate when you talk about how the organizational structure of some of the more ad, you know advanced cities is actually more stuck because you've already got a very strong institution in place. And sometimes yes. to break barriers within that institution is not easy, which makes it difficult to do more integrated level or you know, cross uh, boundary collaboration, which is needed for some of these new problems. Yeah. Uh, and also the partnerships with other institutions. I think that that's really important as well. Um, thank you so much, all three of you. I am going to, you know, we did do a poll, so I want to, you know, I do want to come back and um, so the the amongst the top gaps that prevent cities from building uh, resilient infrastructure, thirty percent voted towards limited data. So that that was sort of the one of the most uh, got the highest ranking. The second one was decision making at the state and national level with little influence at the city level. I think that's important, especially because we're sitting in CDRI's context where, you know. National agencies can do certain things and local agencies can do other things. And, and there is a gap there sometimes. A lack of understanding of resilience infrastructure was about a quarter and then outdated, outdated policies and standards. So I think that was the priority that came out. Um, we do have a second poll, which also I'll conduct now. So go back to your polling button. Um, and, and this really focuses more on what CDRI should do. So. The question really is, the question is what support should CDRI prioritize and provide to cities to mainstream urban resilience? And again, we'd like you to pick one, even though all of these are relevant, pick one. Uh, capacity development through training programs, technical support for risk assessments of cities, advocacy projects through workshops with national government agencies, and creating frameworks, tools, and techniques to support building urban resilience. So again, take 30 seconds, go to the poll, and do, um, you know, make make your selection. Again, I'll come back in 10, I'll give you 10 seconds at this time, and I'll come back. Um, all right. We are coming towards the end of this, so I, I do want to uh, bring back Dr. T, uh, Dr. Tina Gomez. Um, I think Dr. Gomez, we've, you've heard from all three panelists. We've had some really rich discussion. Um, I'd like to offer you a few moments to actually give your final reflections, and then I'll also come back to the three panelists for your final reflections. Uh, so Dr. Gomez, over to you. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for the um, opportunity to like also extending this this session and giving us still this room for the final uh, reflection. I hope all the viewers are still, you know, also on board with us. But I definitely found it a super exciting discussion because in the run up for this session, we also had a discussion on how we could bring together these different perspectives because we have three very different cities represented here, um, but which. And very often in resilience, we will say, you know, the context is super important, which it is. But at the same time, we also see that structurally, some of the issues that are facing, like the complexity of dealing with urban issues, the pressure and sort of the development pressure that you have to adapt your city and accommodate for the people that live there, while then thinking about resilience, that is sort of the same for, for everybody. And then also very sort of strong and, and also very close to, to my heart, the need to work with, um, with the people that live there. So this uh, ideas of engaging the local population and empowering them also to help shape the, the city they are living in um, is very, very important. Um, a final point that came up a little bit in the discussion is uh, that we should not, of course, forget in all these urgent issues right now, the future and the future generations, because what was said somewhere in the, yeah, also by Sasha and, and by you, Amit, was that, of course, the infrastructures that we are planning now are incredibly persistent. Um, to the degree, like we are talking often about 50 or 100 years, but if you look at the road, road network of Europe, you see a lot still of the old Roman trade rates. So that's how persistent it is. 
So if we are planning a city now and planning the infrastructures we want to build in there, one key message is we are not just doing that to help the people that are living there now and that definitely need the space and need the infrastructure, need to be resilient, but we are also doing that for generations to come. But the difficulty is that, of course, we don't know what these people will need, how they will want to live, and they will, you know, if, you, if we just think like 40 years back, they, we are, we are living already now in a completely different world, um, let alone 100 years uh, back or, or even more. Um, so, and there, I do think that, you know, that the work that um, we are doing also with more model-based planning approaches, for instance, can definitely also help, as well as other approaches and tools. And I'm, yeah, super excited to sort of be part of this conversation. Thanks a lot for this opportunity again. Thank you so much. Oh, Tina. one one point, I, because sure, otherwise, sure, sure. we yeah. we also have for the urban masterclass a quick um, survey that we would like to send out to you, where we ex explicitly ask questions about, you know, how do you deal with these problems in your city, and what do you think are the priorities um, for urban resilience in your in your context, especially also with a long term uh, vision in mind. So that's for the urban masterclass people that are still watching this. Great. So I think you're going to post that or somebody's going to post that in the chat box, right? So they should actually copy that. And also, I just want to highlight that if you had questions, I know we're running out of time, so we may or may not be get, able to get to it, but do post them to the Q&A box. So at least we have your questions and then we'll find some ways to get back some answers to you. Um, panelists, maybe 30 seconds of final comments and then I will hand it over to Jagan. So maybe Mayor uh, Arujo, 30 seconds, final thoughts. You're on mute, sir. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No, I just want to add what uh, Tina and uh, Sasha ma mentioned. You know, this, I think that there is a huge need to bring together and create a platform where knowledge institutes, uh, local governments, and uh, institutions like ICDR, I can bring all this together so that we can exchange experiences, but, 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 but also feed into each other's normal work. I think this will give us a kind of a leapfrog to, 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 to the future challenges, because I think that there is a lot of knowledge uh, uh, at universities, at the research in institutes, that unfortunately, probably it's, it's not being used by us, the practitioners, probably because we don't have access or we don't have the, the, the necessary tools or the necessary links. So I think that in, in institutions like uh, ICD RI could play a pivotal role. And uh, like what uh, Sasha was mentioning here, their experiences like about uh, 100 or 200 e e years ago may be probably very useful for the challenge that we are facing today. Because Kalimane also is like, uh, is on a delta you know, it's a, on, on a swamp. So p probably there are some uh, uh, lessons that uh, we could either from past or from the day to day that we could learn from cities like uh, those in Netherlands or Quito or others that we could use uh, to avoid most of these uh, issues that we face today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Um, David, final thoughts, 30 seconds. Yes. Um, well, it, I was just thinking um, that the global challenges that we uh, have right now require also uh, articulated and coordinated uh, actions. Uh, the pandemic is uh, the coronavirus virus pandemic is only one example. Then we have climate change, and then we have biodiversity laws, and so on. And um, these are all uh, fueled and and. and propelled by the way we do things. And so we really need to rethink how we plan and how we work, first of all, inside our communities and inside our cities and so on, and so that we can amplify uh, these, these efforts. In, in, in that sense, um, I, I think we have to be uh, willing to really change our perspectives and, 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 and somehow look in different ways, be creative, and also get connected and see what others are doing and how they are solving these really complex uh, problems so that 
whenever it's uh, possible and, 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 and um, uh, feasible, then um, try to replicate those uh, same solutions. Thank you, David. Uh, appreciate that. Sasha, 30 seconds. Yeah, final and final thoughts. And, and then I'm, again, an advocate for, for the corporate world because we need to have these new business cases. Then we can upscale the new normal. So, so in, in all our discussions, we, we need to incorporate them. And, and there are front runners who are willing to join us in, in the mission. And, um, well, and, and then I hope we have a prosperous future together. And thank you again for the opportunity for joining. And yeah, I, I, I really hope that we can make some sort of community uh, uh, from this event and, and that we can learn from each other with it because there's so much to learn from each other and to upscale to this new future-proof normal. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I am going to give Jagan Shah the final thoughts. Uh, Jagan is the Senior Infrastructure Advisor in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the UK government. And it's important that he give his final thoughts because we're also heading towards COP later this year. So I, you know, I would like to hear from him certain what he picked up today and what might be some messages that he may convey back to the UK government. So Jagan, over to you. And then I will come back to share Katie's image because she's been really, really working hard behind, behind the scenes. So Jagan, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Amir. Um... I've been I've been listening listening intently to the conversation. And in fact, I think what is very interesting is uh, to recall what Dr. John Merton, who is the UK's COP26 envoy, said in yesterday's policy forum. He said that the three priorities for COP26 are planning, action, and finance. And on action, he said that you know we tend to be very theory rich, but action light. Um, and what this session has uh, brought to the fore is that the actions happening at local levels. And we need to recognize that cities and city mayors and people who work on innovation in cities are the front line in terms of response to the impacts of climate change. So mitigation, adaptation and resilience are embedded in action. And it's the cities, at least uh, in terms of urban infrastructure and urban uh, life, which are the front line. So that comes out in a very resounding way from this. Interestingly, as uh, uh, Mayor Arujo said, uh, almost in the passing, he said, uh, you know, they need to scale up from building a few resilient homes. They need to scale up. I think the idea of scaling up is crucial. And this is uh, something that will need to go to COP, which is that while it will be the meeting of national governments, it's going to have to find a way that national governments are able to talk about how local initiatives can scale up to national levels. Um, and, and that's going to be an important thing for us to take as a message. Um, I want to very quickly kind of scan my notes here for what I think came across across uh, the presentations by uh, four speakers as a very rich number of issues that have come up. Um, I think a resounding issue has been local action, and that's uh, participative. It is uh, the way that Sasha called it, the quadruple helix. Um, all stakeholders working together, including the private sector. And the private sector is crucial here because, um, as John Merton said yesterday, governments should create the policy environments, but it's the private sector that brings the innovation. So uh, whether it is uh, Mayor Arujo's uh, you know, resilient houses, which take us away from using mangrove material, um, or it is uh, shifting from using mangroves as biomass for cooking to biogas, this is the kind of initiative which will well up or bubble up to a national level. And I think we need to keep that uh, idea of the innovation ecosystem and the quadruple helix very much at the center of our thinking. Um, the other very important point which David brought up was food security. Food is one of the uh, causes for um, uh, a lot of the instability that comes in the macro system, uh, you know, and affects climate. Um, and to take food to the local level, agriculture happening at urban level also means that the footprint of food production reduces. 
And that is a very important aspect of the future as we go forward, uh, along with the mega trends that Sasha talked about, cyber, demographic, climate. And Tina reminded us that we need to keep our focus on future generations. Food production is going to be one of the key issues. And we must keep that at the center of our conversations on adaptation and resilience. Um, I think Tina brought up uh, the important point, which I think even in the survey you brought out, um, is the importance of data. Uh, one of the themes at COP is going to be about the need for national governments to enable more granular, more accurate data to be available, both at community levels, but also at a sectoral level. So the private sector or large infrastructure companies that operate uh, power or transportation infrastructure can use that to inform their thinking. So this is built into one of the uh, very big campaigns called the Risk Informed Early Action um, Partnership, which will look at early warning systems and how they can get embedded into adaptation planning uh, at all levels from national to the local. Um, I think we did get a very strong sense here of the planning imperatives. And again, I want to refer to Mayor Arujo's uh, several times he mentioned that let's not forget that Kilimane is, is planned on a swamp on the banks of a river and is uh, has multi-hazard vulnerabilities. Now, clearly, whoever chose to locate the city did not have climate change uh, on, on the horizon as, as, as an issue. But now we are well informed that the location of our installations of infrastructure, the locations of cities or new developments is key. And planning that in the most appropriate way, connecting it in a way that local communities do not have to bear the brunt of climate impact would be key over here. And I think I'd like to just end on the importance again that Mayor Arujo brought out, what he called the permanent education plan for communities. Communities need to be informed. And uh, the more aware a community is, whether it is in Quito, uh, you know, about urban agriculture, or it is about mitigation of the impacts of climate change uh, in, in cities across the world, the more likely we are going to be to, uh, to build the resilience to handle climate change. So um, I think there are a lot of very interesting messages, very granular detail that has come out of these conversations. And to me, what is fascinating is that the big words, mitigation, adaptation and resilience, you know, the big stuff actually finds a, a life and manifests itself. Uh, in the stories that we've heard from uh, from our colleagues from the cities. Um, and I think that's a very, very important message. Thanks. Thank you, Jagan. That was an excellent closing. Um, so no more comments from me, except I do want to share on the poll, the second poll. Um, all of you said that, you know, or nearly 40% or more than 40% said creating frameworks, tools and techniques to support building urban resilience. That's, that was what you would like CDRI to do. Um, the second one was capacity building through training programs, technical support for risk assessments, and the last one was ad advocacy projects through workshops with national government agencies. Um, so thank you very much for the poll. And Katie, we would love to see your drawing, your graphic. I see the COVID reference. I see the the Chicago reference. Amit, while we're watching this, if I, if I may just say that uh, I think one very important thing that also came up was the man-nature balance, and that's central to resilience, and thanks to Sasha's cat. So I think we should recognize <laughs> <That's true. laughs> the importance of that balance. That's right. Ur urban ecology. <laughs> um, Sandeep ji, I'm going to hand it back to you as this graphic is unfolding. So it's over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Amit. This was really a fascinating session. From Amsterdam to Mozambique to Quito, we had city leaders from different geographies and academic experts as well as practitioners uh, like Professor Tina Combs. Uh, Amit Prothi and Jagan. So thank you everyone for this fascinating discussion on urban resilience. I heard many uh, quotes from GAP.
between the theory and action. Infrastructure is about people. It's not only about physical infrastructure and the social and economic infrastructure. So, and Sasha repeatedly mentioned the importance of institutions and how it is difficult to modify or change them in view of the changing environments. And one more thing, I, I really like the example of uh, the city of Amsterdam with walls trying to fight a war uh, with aeroplanes. So I think that really exemplifies the, the rationale for changing our thinking about what the future may hold. So thank you everyone. Thank you uh, Amit. Thank you Professor Combs. Thank you all the three city leaders from different geographies and thank you Jagan who has been working with CDRI for a long time. So thank you everyone for a fascinating discussion. Uh, this was the second last session of today and we will be meeting again at uh, 8 p.m. India time for our regional session on the small island developing states in the Caribbean. So see you back then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. That was really great.
good morning good afternoon and good evening to all the participants of international conference on disaster resilient infrastructure 2021 in the last session of the second day of the conference <clears throat> my name is sandeep pondrick and i am the director general of cdri we are ending the session at uh, the day with this session we started the day with a similar session on small island developing states of pacific region after that we have had sessions on digital resilience urban resilience and innovations and emerging technologies in the session on small island developing states of pacific region we discussed critical challenges and opportunities before the small island developing states and how to address them we got lot of quotes from the discussion and some of my favorites are that states are in a constant state of recovery that pacific has proven its resilience despite its vulnerabilities and the last but not the least beautifully said that the countries in pacific should not be called states but boss as big ocean states because they are the custodian of one of the largest oceans or the largest ocean of the world we also discussed issues like capacity building the requirement of flexibility in funding and also that the self reliance of the countries rather than depending on external aid as eight of the 10 uh, 10 countries with the highest multi disaster risk relative to their economic shock are from the caribbean we can say that caribbean small island developing states are one of the most vulnerable countries or states in the world the session will discuss the issues related to disaster and climate resilience resilience related to states and now let me hand over the session to the session moderator mr ronald jackson <laughs> mr jackson heads the disaster risk reduction and recovery team for building resilience in the UNDP his 7 years as executive director of caribbean disaster emergency management agency or cdma he has shown exemplary service mr J jackson also served as the director general of office of disaster preparedness and emergency management in jamaica so he is an expert on matters related to caribbean over to you mr jackson Thank you, Sir Poundrick. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Regional Forum for Small Island Developing States, the Caribbean SIDS, and certainly in, in listening to the summary of this morning's session, um, the, the, the idea that should, SIDS should be called BOSS certainly is something that will resonate with our Caribbean colleagues. The, as you would have heard from from Sandri, the ICDRI was launched in 2019 by the Honorable Prime Minister of India uh, at the UN Climate Action Summit in New York. The Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure is a global multi-stakeholder platform led and managed by national governments, UN agencies, multilateral banks, financing mechanisms, private sector, and knowledge institutions. It seeks to promote resilience of infrastructure systems to climate and disaster risk, thereby ensuring sustainable development. This Caribbean Regional Forum is being convened against the backdrop of the devastating events which have impacted the country within the last decade. We note also that the COVID has presented COVID-19 has presented new challenges for critical infrastructure, especially those in the health and telecommunications sector. And the signal that we are likely to face a warmer world will present future challenges under the current context considering that sids has a propensity for disaster and climate risk investing in resilient infrastructure can reap long term benefits and provide the needed impetus for resilient development in this regard the session will lay out the critical challenges and opportunities for adopting resilient pathways for infrastructure development in sids for participants We're going to encourage you that as we go through the panel discussions this afternoon, 
that you post your questions in the Zoom chat box, and we will pick them from there and share them with our panelists. We've assembled today uh, a, a very distinguished panel of representatives who will give perspectives on the issue of carbon infrastructure resilience from a variety of angles, ranging from financing to disaster risk to infrastructure standards. But before we hear from those distinguished speakers, we have the pleasure of being joined by Ambassador Douglas Slater, who is the Assistant Secretary General of CARICOM. Dr. Slater is a national of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and a medical doctor by profession. He was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Trade, and Consumer Affairs of St. Vincent from 2010 to 2013. In that capacity, he also served as representative of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines to the ACT EU parliamentarian group and as an alternate for the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance on the Caribbean Development Bank and Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Authority. Dr. Slater has served as a Minister of Health and Environment for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and he was the CARICOM Minister of Health designated to negotiate the regional approach to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Dr. Slater also was honored by the Caribbean Community Secretary as one of the CARICOM's first champions for change. As Minister of Environment, Dr. Slater was actively involved in the UN climate change and sustainable development negotiation at the political and technical level, leading discussions on renewable energy as one of the critical factors for sustainable economic development. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Slater has served in many capacities within the health sector and also in, in several countries across the Caribbean, most notable his time in Jamaica, and so it makes him certainly a true ambassador of CARICOM, and quite apt to speak on this issue of critical infrastructure resilience. Dr. Slater, welcome, and I yield the floor to you. Thank you very much, Donald. Mr. Ronald Jackson, Head, Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery Team, United Nations Development Program, based in Geneva, Switzerland, and moderator. Mr. Derek Omar, Chief Executive Officer, CARICOM Regional Organization for Standards and Quality, CrossQ. Mr. Isaac Anthony, Chief Executive Officer, CCRIF SPC, which is formerly the Caribbean Catastrophic Risk Insurance Facility. Ms. Andrea Govner, Deputy Executive Director, Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, SEDEMA. Participants. Let me start by conveying my gratitude on behalf of Ambassador Owen Larock, the Secretary General of Caribbean Community, CARICOM, to the Government of India for their vision in establishing and advancing the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI. Let me also take a moment to commend all the partners who have contributed to and hosted the previous webinars in the build-up to this conference. It may be a bit of an understatement in saying that 2020 has been an extremely challenging year globally, affecting every region and every nation. Our infrastructure and systems have been stress tested, unlike any other time in recent history, with a potent combination of the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, worsening climate impacts, and turbulent geopolitical events of various forms. In Latin America and the Caribbean, and especially for us in CARICOM, dealing with extreme climatic disasters are becoming an annual expectation. Since 2014, we have seen on an increases, increasing basis natural disasters and regional emergencies that have forced us to readjust the parameters of extremes against which we plan for our development. 2017 was particularly devastating when we saw 100% of the populations of the Commonwealth of Dominica and the island of Barbuda impacted by major hurricanes Maria and Irma, with up to 95% of the building stock damaged on those two islands. 
The initial post-Maria needs assessment conducted by Dominica estimated US $1.3 billion damage, equivalent to 226% of the GDP. Recovery costs were estimated at 1.37 billion US dollars. According to the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, UN ECLAP, infrastructure damage, loss and additional costs in the British Virgin Islands alone in the aftermath of hurricane were $455 million. million approximately 20% of total costs. Damages in the region were dominated by severe washouts of critical river crossings, and losses comprised the cost of restoring road access, clearing debris, and restoring river capacity, as well as traffic delays and income losses to transport service providers. The recovery strategy focused on restoring safe operations to damaged assets and to replacing major bridges and critical crossings with high resilience. The total recovery costs were assessed to be 300 million US dollars. Experiences and lessons are plentiful and much has been done to improve. However, the experience in 2019 with Hurricane Dorian humbled us once more and re-energized the urgency for substantial investments in resilience at all levels. While the region is still recovering from these historic events, we have had to weather the worst pandemic in 100 years. This time, the entire international community is affected, and as usual, SIDS and least developed countries are hit the, lot, the hardest. Nevertheless, the region was proactive and was lauded for the quick and decisive leadership in responding, but had to quickly readjust to prepare for an Atlantic storm season that saw record-breaking numbers of named storms. This served as a grim preview of what a two-degree-plus future will look like while slow-onset climate impacts like drought and sea level rise quietly continues to tighten their grip on our islands. It gets worse because through these struggles and clear evidence, we still find ourselves having to increase our advocacy for fairness in criteria and eligibility for access to concessional finance and development assistance that would allow us to weather the service, weather and service these multiple shocks. Dear participants, this is a sample of the grim context of CARICOM's reality in climate and disaster resilience challenges that are no doubt shared in many regions of the world, making partnerships like this one supremely vital to our collective development process. The CARICOM region has been continuously adapting and progressively weaving resilience into our central development agenda. There has been no way around it. A sustainable development agenda for Caribbean states is a resilience development agenda. 226% GDP loss for a major hurricane in a few hours for a single country is unsustainable and deleterious by any metric. CARICOM member states in partnership with the CARICOM regional institutions articulated and have been implementing the Comprehensive Disaster Management Strategy 2014 to 2024. It is a wide suite of strategic initiatives to improve upon all aspects of the disaster management cycle and in response to a multitude of hazards that affect the region. Following the passage of hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017, CARICOM articulated a Caribbean pathway for resilience, seeking to provide a clear vision for resilience-centric development. Heads of Government of CARICOM in 2018 approved the approach with its five pillars. One, social protection for the marginal and most vulnerable. Two, enhancing economic opportunities. Three, safeguarding infrastructure. Four, environmental protection. And five, operational readiness and recovery. The thematic areas of the CDRI align neatly with the pillars 
and enabling elements of the Caribbean pathway for resilience, especially our commitment to safeguard infrastructure and enhance operational readiness and recovery. As I reflect on the multitude of recent hazards, we should note that our region has a unique opportunity now to integrate a green post-COVID recovery with our increased ambition to adapt to climate impacts and limit emissions to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels as per the Paris Agreement. As we move forward in improving our social and financial systems and our physical infrastructure, elements such as continuity, robust multi-hazard risk modeling, trust in the science, and harmony with nature must all become more central in our planning and execution of rebuilding efforts. Considering this recognition, ladies and gentlemen, by means of sharing experiences, permit me to mention a few initiatives in the disaster resilient infrastructure in the Caribbean community that are noteworthy. One, the region has advanced work to enhance and adapt the Caribbean Uniform Building Code, um, acronym CUBIC, along with increased advocacy and enforcement around adherence to codes and their interpretation. Also, in 2018, the Council for Trade and Economic Development, COTED, approved the CARICOM Regional Energy Efficiency Building Code, which is a cross queue approved standard with the support from the Caribbean Development Bank. Two, the Caribbean Community Climate Change Site Center, or 5Cs, with the EU Global Climate Change Alliance support is assisting the CARIFORUM countries in developing standard operating procedures for climate change adaptation in water utilities. Three, the five Cs is also preparing a green procurement manual and toolkit for good practice in retrofitting public buildings. Four, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, CIDEMA, has been overseeing the development of a model national recovery framework to assist member states in creating or updating their legal and policy framework regarding disaster recovery. We will no doubt hear more about these given the composition and expertise of the panel. But despite these and other excellent examples of resilience enabling initiatives, we are faced and will continue to face specific constraints. Most importantly, major investments in critical infrastructure are needed to substantially build on this resilience pathway. CARICOM members, like many other SIDS, find themselves in peculiar positions of being the most in need of concessional financing and seemingly with the most hurdles to qualify for development financing on fair terms. The issues of capacity development, access to emerging technologies, and the need to scale up community-based approaches continue to require our urgent attention. I cannot stress enough that there must be frank discussions in the appropriate fora to examine the pledges and commitments made, the barriers to concessional financing, and the capacity gaps of SIDS in submitting proposals to advance their resilience. <laughs> These discussions are critical to a company and complement the excellent technical work in adaptation and resilience already ongoing in the region. In closing, I take the opportunity to urge all partners to candidly share their experiences, knowing that our challenges are the same and our vision is one. We will continue to advocate for financial, technical and capacity building support for our member states in building their resilience. Accelerated flow of climate finance will go a long way in this regard. The Caribbean community has been and will continue to advocate for global collaboration for recovery, resilience, risk finance, and insurance for poor and vulnerable populations in the face of climate and disaster risk. I therefore look forward to the dialogue, partnerships, and actions that will no doubt be catalyzed from this forum and other initiatives of the coalition 
since it will allow us to improve our overall resilience and advocacy. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Slater. Um, I want to highlight a few very important points that I think came out of your keynote address. In particular, you highlighted the multidimensional nature of the challenges facing Caribbean cities, and in particular, the stress that is placing on achieving infrastructure sustainability. Particularly, it was drawn to the, the, the thought you presented around the need to rethink the parameters of extremes against which we are planning and designing but also the central role that infrastructure plays in fast-tracking post-crisis recovery within the Caribbean context. You made a call on, 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 on the need to address this issue of concessional financing, which I think is certainly impacting the Caribbean's efforts to compete against the impact that nature and or current development trajectory presents. And of course, the cyclical nature of the main threats that the region faces, namely climate extremes, hurricanes, and extreme rainfall events. But more importantly, I think you signal the Caribbean rising to the challenge by placing resilience at the center of its development agenda, and inclusive of the resilience pathway which you outlined and certainly outline some of the critical principles for building back better or building forward better, as they are saying, post-COVID. Thank you, Dr. Slater. Our next set of panelists, um, I, we, we, we want to save enough time to hear from them because I think they're going to unpack many of the things that, that Dr. Slater spoke to. And we're going to go through a series of three rounds um, on the three specific themes. One, looking at challenges, two, looking at solutions, and three, looking at methodologies or approaches against these particular challenges and identified solutions. We're going to hear from three key sectoral speakers, um, one looking at building standards, one looking at the financial sector, the, sort of the regional financing sector, and how they are mobilizing their resources around supporting infrastructure development, and one looking at uh, what I would call a very innovative approach to risk financing. And then we will hear from Andrea Grovner, um, who will you know, serve as our discussant, who will try to sum up all of what you would have heard from the different speakers and to bring uh, the, the context, I think, within the frame of the, the strategy and resilience party that you'd have heard Dr. Slater speak to. So, um, Dear panelists, please forgive me if I don't go into details in introducing you, but I want to really save time for our, our part participants to hear from you. Our first panelist is Mr. Derek Omar. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Regional Organization for Standards Quality. We refer to it as CrossQ, and it's headquartered in Barbados. Um, he has a focus on accelerating modernizing and accelerating the preparation of adoption and applications of regional standards, metrology, accreditation, and conformity assessment systems to increase trade, boost industrial efficiency and effectiveness, and advance quality conscious culture among the citizens and to advance the CARICOM single market economy in that regard. Our second panelist is Daniel Best. He's the director of projects in the department Product Department, sorry, at the Caribbean Development Bank, also headquartered in Barbados. In this role, he is accountable for the management, pipeline development, appraisal, and implementation of the bank's lending and technical assistance program across multiple sectors. I do believe Daniel is also an engineer. So he'll be able to not only speak to the, the sort of development projects from the banking sector, but maybe touch on some of the engineering issues as well. Our third speaker, Mr. Isaac Anthony, is the CEO of CRIP SPC, formerly the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, which holds the distinction of being the world's first multi country risk pool providing parametric insurance to the Caribbean and Central America. He has over 25 years of senior management experience in the public finance and financial sector and economic planning. He also served as the permanent secretary for finance and economic affairs for the government of St. Lucia. And then we will hear from Andrew Grovner 
who is the Deputy Executive Director for the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. A humanitarian with a passion for helping people and managing disaster risk, which she's devoted her career to for more than 20 years. We're going to start with our first round of questions, and I'll pose the first one to Mr. Omar. And I'm giving you four minutes, sir. With your experience of working in the Caribbean region, what are the climate and disaster risk critical infrastructure systems? What are the climate, what climate and disaster risk are critical infrastructure systems exposed to? And according to you, what are the drivers of vulnerability that perpetuate these risks within the Caribbean region? Thanks, Ron. Um, good morning or good night or good afternoon to everybody. Um, for us at Crossview, the critical infrastructure systems that we see in the Caribbean are the utility sector, the building sector, not only commercial buildings, but homes. And then finally, the transportation and communication sector, which would be ICT, roads, bridges, and other such um, accessibility infrastructure. That critical infrastructure systems or those critical infrastructure systems we see are mostly affected right now by earthquakes and hurricanes. On our doorstep, however, we recognize there are rising sea level issues and drought issues. And now we even have a little semi-active volcano kicking up. So CrossQ has gone through an analysis of, of looking at these disaster risk areas with CDEMA and, and also with CDB. And one of the things we have come up with is that the, the critical driver of vulnerable, vulnerability that perpetuates these natural disaster and climate risk for us appears to be ineffective implementation of national infrastructure standards and codes, and particularly ineffective implementation of national building codes that a lot of member states have. And it doesn't matter whether member states are trying to implement it compulsory or on a voluntary compliance basis. We think that there is insufficient um, implementation capacities and will to get it done. Now, in terms of the ineffective implementation of national infrastructure codes and standards, we honestly believe that this implementation deficit is driven by two things. One is the lack of a sustained government will to just get it done. And the other one is a lack of a national coordinating committee for the agencies involved in ownership and implementation of these infrastructure codes. In regards of the implementation deficit being driven by a lack of sustained government will, what we mean there is that governments tend to fear the rising cost of construction with the implementation of building codes, and that is not necessarily true. However, the fears perpetuate. There's also a fear of continuous time and effort involved to educate the society in uptaking these codes. Um, because that has to be a sustained effort. We also believe that a lack of government will is driven by uh, a fear of insufficient quality infrastructure services in the member states, such as product testing and product certification. And that is not necessarily true. And then finally, we think that a lack of the sustained government will comes because governments feel or they don't want to address the under-resourcing of their regulatory agencies. On the aspect of the lack of national coordination committees for, for agencies involved in the ownership and implementation of infrastructure codes, the weakness there is that in each member state, different agencies are involved in owning these national building codes and in implementing them. So the only sustainable solution for that is to form a national committee where you bring these organizations together on a very periodic basis. In some member states, you have the Ministry of Public Works that owns it and implements it. In other member states, it's the Ministry of Planning or the Ministry of Land Use 
or the Bureau of Standards or even the Ministry of Local Government. So that's why we think that um, having a good national coordinating committee that brings together these agencies um, on a regular basis is an important step. So in summary, Ron, we honestly believe that the perpetuation of the vulnerability risk um, is because there's an implementation deficit in implementing national building and infrastructure codes. And that's really driven by a lack of sustained government will to get it done, um, which we feel is solvable. And a lack of a national coordination committee for agencies involved in the ownership and implementation of these codes. Again, that is solvable. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Derek. We, we, we want to know, turn our attention to hear from, from, from Daniel. We're focusing on, on challenges, and you work certainly in, the, in one of the regional IFIs. Um, from your lens, what are the, the, the challenges and, and the opportunities that, that, that you face in, in trying to address the, the, the exposure uh, to critical infrastructure and to advance programs and, and, and projects that are seeking to, to, to alleviate these problems. Thanks so much, um, Chair Ron, um, and also a good day to our uh, my fellow panelists and all those joining us online, and thanks to the ICDR and the Government of India for this opportunity. You know, in the beginning, Ron, I'd like to align myself with some of the comments, comments made by our keynote speaker this morning, well, well today. Um, in terms of the, the first big challenge for our, our region, of course, is the physical infrastructure and services in our region are subject to multiple natural hazards uh, and more frequent and intense extreme weather events um, we're seeing occurring in our region. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into detail. I think ASG said did a, a great job in, in just laying out what we experienced over 2017 and, and, in, and in 2019. Um, what I would say, however, is that climate projections point to to increase intensity of extreme hydrometeorological events, such as hurricanes and intense rainfall in our region. We live essentially climate-wise in, in a tough neighborhood. Um, category four and five hurricanes will, will likely increase. Uh, and some projections show that sea level rise can reach by as much as one meter by, by 2100, uh, the year 2100. So, these projections suggest that disaster risks and impacts will have catastrophic effects on the Caribbean over the 21st century. That, that would be the first challenge that we face um, in, in the Caribbean. The other one would be, would be poor infrastructure quality. Um, while there is significant investment in the infrastructure, uh, because of the significant debt burden and lack of fiscal space in many of our sovereigns in, in the region, uh, the level of infrastructure investment is, is not where it needs to be. And certainly the level of investment in, in maintenance. Our governments uh, are, are uh, faced with, with, with very difficult and tough competing priorities. And as a result of that, the, the requisite level of routine maintenance on some key areas of infrastructure, um, we, we don't see that happening. In addition, given the small size of most of our islands, critical infrastructure is unavoidably often built in disaster risk prone areas, uh, such as near coastlines or in floodplains or near uh, river banks, as the case might be, uh, as there are a, uh, unfortunately limited alternatives in many cases for, for safer areas. Uh, there's also, and, and, and this is one that, that we see quite a bit um, from the, the MDB uh, perspective, the Multilateral Development Banking perspective within, within SIDS and certainly within the Caribbean, weak capacity for improving infrastructure resilience. Uh, there's limited human resources with the adequate skills to facilitate mainstreaming disaster risk management and climate resilience into infrastructure development and, and investment. Um, there's also uh, a dearth of reliable data and information to risk inform adequate infrastructure design uh, and retrofitting. Uh, and and um, 
my good friend Derek in, in his opening remarks, I think brilliantly outlined the fact that we, we also face with some challenges as it relates to legislation and regulatory framework that, that are somewhat outdated um, without adequate consideration for climate and disaster risk. Most of our infrastructure in the region um, was built for climatic conditions that no longer exist. We live in a new climatic norm. Uh, and so there is, we see insufficient investment in resilient infrastructure um, due to the limited resources and, and, and several urgent priorities our government face. Uh, which brings me to the opportunities because, it, you know, I, I don't see it as all doom and gloom. I, I think we are in a crisis situation, but there are opportunities. The first would be uh, to develop and maintain strong partnerships. I am, I am quite pleased to be on um, this panel with these distinguished uh, individuals because the Caribbean Development Bank has strong partnerships with everyone here, with CrossQ, with um, CRIF, and certainly with Sedima, and of course with, with, with the CARICOM Secretariat. So the, the importance of sharing of information across the region through strong partnerships is key. The other one is the importance of mobilizing adequate financing for climate and disaster resilience of critical infrastructure. Uh, I'm pleased to say that through the, the United Kingdom Caribbean Infrastructure Partnership Fund, um, which uh, has seen the, the United Kingdom uh, place 300, and 300 million pounds um, under the management of the Caribbean Development Bank for, for transformational projects within the Caribbean region. Is this level of concessional resourcing that is needed uh, to drive infrastructure resilience within the region. There's also uh, the opportunity to provide expertise to design climate and disaster resilient infrastructure. And again, this, this, this will be catalyzed by concessional resource. And, and I, I'll speak a little bit more about that uh, if given the opportunity later, but, but the expertise, whether housed with the res res residing within the region or, or extra, extra regionally uh, is important. If we are to come out of this pandemic more resilient. Now is the time uh, to consider how we build forward, as, as you said, better. Uh, and then, of course, there's the opportunity to build local and national and regional institutional capacity, not, not just uh, in terms of the, the human capital that, that, that is in some of our institutions, but the structure of our uh, institutions and, and the ability for them to access climate and disaster financing on the global scale. Uh, I think there's also a significant opportunity to embrace innovative technology in infrastructure design uh, and operation. And, and you mentioned one of the sections we're going to be dealing with is solutions. So, so perhaps we can unpack that then. But um, I think that, that could be an effective, a cost effective way in which we integrate climate change, mitigation and adaptation interventions through the use of, of leading edge technology uh, into critical infrastructure in the region and hence provide us with an opportunity to leapfrog uh, in, into, the, into the future. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there for now, but um, as I said, I, I don't see all doom and gloom. I, I, see, I see opportunities for, for our region to move forward stronger and better. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank you very much, very much, Daniel. Quite a bit there. I mean, I think we're going to get a chance to unpack some of those um, in the next round for sure. Um, for, for, for Isaac, you, you are at the forefront of some of the innovative approaches, certainly in terms of financing. From your lens, what, what are some of the challenges you, you've experienced um, in, in, in advancing the financing arrangement? You, you use the term risk financing, certainly you are in the risk transfer realm, but talk to us about the challenges you've come across in this unique region based on some of the things you've heard from your colleagues and panelists. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Uh, moderator. Um, there are really many uh, risk transfer and financing challenges that I would say uh, that are unique um, to developing states. Um, in fact, you would have heard from our distinguished keynote speaker um, who highlighted one of the key challenges of SIDS, um, and that is uh, in SIDS not being able to qualify for concessional financing on fair terms. Now, while many of, of those countries are classified as middle income by virtue of their 
per capita income, they are just as vulnerable um, as those countries that are classified as a low income. In other words, they face the same disasters. And again, one do recall, just to use an example, um, Bahamas, which, I mean, was pulverized by Hurricane um, Dorian um, quite recently, uh, I mean, which was a, a major superstorm, and that yet still that particular country would be classified as middle income and therefore would be deprived of much needed concessional financing. So clearly that's one of the challenges, as I said, that was highlighted by the keynote speaker. But let me share some others um, that many of the small and, and coastal states in the Caribbean and, and also Central America, um, which is also served by CRIF, um, face. First and foremost, um, those countries are faced with many fiscal challenges. For example, we have the, the low growth prospect, uh, which have been made even worse by, by the advent of COVID-19. We also have the high debt to the GDP ratios, which really represents in a way a stranglehold on the development of those countries. Uh, because what we actually see happening is that, uh, you know, those countries are obviously impacted by those uh, very frequent uh, disasters, hurricanes and so on. So they have to be constantly borrowing just to keep up, um, thus depriving them the, the ability to be able to borrow for other critical elements of development. Um, so making achieving debt to GDP uh, sustainable is, is obviously a big challenge. Um, we also need to, to understand that um, in, the, in the Caribbean, the number of disasters, as I said, uh, while they're increasing, the cost of recovery is also, of those disasters are also increasing. Um, I mean, look at what happened again with Dominica, which was impacted by, by Hurricane um, Maria in 2017. The cost of, of that single event was put at 1.3 billion US dollars. Um, and at the same time, the growth in the development assistance um, in disaster risk reduction has been moderate. And I think Daniel has already highlighted some of the, the issues there. Um, what we are actually seeing uh, with respect to development assistance for disaster risk reduction for example, is a, is a small fraction of the overall development assistance and spending on disaster uh, remains largely exposed. Um, the other point that I want to highlight is that the international studies have shown that for every dollar spent on disaster mitigation, it saves from four to $11. Um, However, in the region, there is really no robust conclusion on how much a dollar spent on disaster risk reduction can save, exactly by conducting cost-benefit analysis for early warning systems or disaster risk reduction initiatives. Um, there is still exists a, 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 a large, or a lack, I would say, of comprehensive understanding between disaster risk reduction and, and disaster risk financing or risk transfer with many officials not adequately recognizing that regardless of the investment in disaster risk reduction, there will always be a residual risk. So you, what, you, what you hear coming up all the time is why should, for example, you buy insurance when you can use that money you know, to, to improve the infrastructure and so on, not recognizing that regardless of the amount of resources that you actually put in disaster risk reduction, there will always be a residual risk that you need to mitigate. And that's where those sort of instruments comes in. Um, it is therefore fiscally prudent for governments to, to transfer a portion of risk to an entity such as CRIF. I must admit that through our efforts, as well as those of our development partners, um, like the Caribbean Development Bank, like Sidima and so on, um, there has been much improvement in the understanding of, of disaster risk financing. Um, unfortunately, there is still a, a widespread misconception of insurance. And I must admit that has, uh, has been helped by a number of unfortunate events um, and other risk transfer mechanism and how these instruments actually work. In fact, 
up to now, some countries still prefer to self-insure, uh, which has uh, clearly has, while it is important for countries and for organizations to do some element of, of, of self-insurance, it is important that they understand the merit in actually transferring some of that risk. Um, the whole question about adequacy of financing for post-disaster recovery continues to be a big problem. Um, I mean, we again, just to use the example of, of Dominica, um, with a 1.3 billion US dollar price tag on Hurricane Irma. Um, where is this money coming from? You know, and clearly, um, in fact, I, I do recall an official in the Ministry of Finance saying to me that, you know, uh, almost a year after that particular event, the only resources that they received from any external agency was from CRIF. CRIF was able to make a payout to the government of Dominica amounting to about 20 million US dollars in, in within 14 days. Now, while um, that was very much welcome in terms of helping the country, in terms of its, its immediate recovery and so on, the reality is that 20 million US dollars will never be enough to deal with the overwhelming cost of, of rebuilding. So clearly, it is important for us to identify other instruments that would certainly help address the financing needs of the countries. The other point that I want to touch on very quickly is, um, is just the whole notion of the protection gap and, and, and closing that protection gap, which continues to be a big problem. Interestingly, not only in SIDS, but it's a global problem. In fact, I mean, worldwide, as much as 70% of economic losses arising from natural disasters, you know, are uninsured, with the protection gap being as uh, much wider in SIDS. Now, unfortunately, what, what, what we have also seen is that increasing uh, growth levels, as in pre-COVID times, did not necessarily translate to, to a reduction or closing in that gap in certainly in the Caribbean and Central America. Um, so, the, the, I mean, there are so many um, challenges, but again, I, I would certainly like to take my cue from, from Daniel Best in saying that while those challenges exist, they're not necessarily insurmountable. And I think that is where I would get the opportunity to just to explain to you a little bit, uh, eventually about, for example, the role of CRIF and other types of disaster uh, risk, um, transfer mechanism. But let me close by saying that, they, that it must be understood that a critical element in the resilience education, uh, equation rather, is the availability of financing. And it is therefore important that we find, I mean, ways and means of, of overcoming the financing challenge. And I should also say as a region, and it really calls for the, a collective working together to be able to find those uh, solutions to those common problems. I would stop here for now. Um, Thank you. Mr. Thank Margarita. you. Thank you very much, um, Isaac. Um, very interesting. The protection gap issue is certainly one that we want to look at. Panelists, permit me, I'm, I'm going to try and, and sort of get us back on time. Uh, you know, we, we, we initially planned to have three rounds. I'm going to be creative. I'm going to ask that we meld the last two rounds into one, um, where I'm, we're going to look now at, at some of these solutions. What, what is your top line solution from your angle? So, so I'm, I'm abandoning a little bit, you know, um, my, my suite of questions that I'm going to pose to you, but still, you know, being true. So first, for Derek, what's your, what's your top line message in terms of a solution and, 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 you know, what in the way of, of an approach you see we can take to cause that solution to be applied? Well, we think the, the primary solution is, is lodged in, in government policy if, if collective will and also regional coordination or national coordination of the agencies involved is important. So we believe that a national policy recommendation that sees more efficient and effective implementation of building regulations would be important as our primary solution. 
we would like to see more efficient and effective building regulations, like Daniel was saying, that supports climate change adaptations by adjusting building sightings, designs, and construction requirements to more frequent and extreme hazards. We would like to see more efficient and effective building regulations in that it would require those regulations to more support climate change mitigation by curbing carbon dioxide emissions through improved energy efficiency mechanisms. Thirdly, we'd like to see more appropriate building regulations, like Isaac was saying, that promotes investment by contributing to reducing risk in private sector participation in buildings and resilience infrastructure. And finally, we'd like to see building regulations that have inherently built into them an embedded put perpetual campaign of raising stakeholder awareness of the value of using codes and the cheaper aspect of taking the cost up front rather than at the end. Um, so in terms of a solution, we would see the policy recommendations that address those four areas. And also, too, that should be accompanied by an enabling environment that has more robust legal and institutional architectures, that has more effective regulatory institutions, and that has more internationally recognized quality infrastructure services available to the regulatory institutions that implement this legal and institutional architecture. Now, in the first instance of an enabling environment with uh, a better legal and institutional architecture, we'd love to see governments, when they implement these building regulations, that they follow good regulatory practice as outlined by the WTO agreements, and that they clearly identify who are the sectorial regulators and an efficient regulatory cooperation framework and network. In the area of the regulators themselves, we think it's not hard for governments to better resource their regulators in the area of manpower, equipment, and work methods. All those things can be done with just better will and coordination. And then that will enable the regulators to better do their jobs of inspection, supervision, and encouraging compliance, or even going to the ultimate end of enforcement. And finally, we would love to see the building regulatory environment really embrace quality infrastructure services and supporting their bureaus of standards to have more relevant and up-to-date codes and practices in the building regulatory environment and also to having and encouraging more accredited testing laboratories in the area of construction works and the certification of not only products to quality standards, but the certification of personnel who are able to implement those quality standards. So for us, um, in terms of solutions, we see in a more effective and efficient building regulatory environment that embraces climate change in a very real way and encourages the private sector involvement by reducing risk. And uh, we think that an enabling environment for implementing that policy would be around more coordinated and better resourced regulators and a legal framework. And finally, a better and more focused quality infrastructure development with testing labs and certification systems for quality as driven by the bureaus of standards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, certainly a message around, again, picking up on that issue around partnership, but central, central to that um, are critical stakeholders like the private sector working with government um, to, to drive this legislative and, and um, capacity building environment. Daniel, from, from, from your lens, um, you, you outlined quite a number of things and you, you really pivoted to a positive future. 
um, within that, you, you know, you, you may have some solutions that are right on the tip of your finger that you would like to unpack for us a little bit and probably speak to how do you see that within the realm of the resources you currently command? Um, you spoke to the UK fund. You know, how, how do you see that as an opportunity, as a catalyst for, for some of those solutions that you, you, you referenced? Thanks so much. Uh, you know, Ron, since we're being kindly hosted by, by the government of India and ICDR, you would permit me uh, a, a cricketing analogy. I think most um, of our guests would know we, as a, as a West Indies team, were more successful when we had a four-pronged pace attack. Uh, and the solution has to be multi-pronged. I think Derek began that. And I'm not going to re rehash what he spoke to with respect to, with respect to the regulatory framework. Um, I want to move, uh, if I could add a right onto that and move forward. Let, let's talk, for instance, then about financing. Uh, climate and disaster risk need to be systematically incorporated in, in project design. Uh, and what does that mean? This entails undertaking climate and disaster risk screening and in-depth risk assessment um, based on the findings of risk screenings at the design stage. And that is one of the things that we have done, uh, taking a decision at the Caribbean Development Bank. All pro projects funded by CDB go through um, extensive climate risk uh, screening. Uh, so resources such as that received from the UK, so the UK Caribbean Infrastructure F Partnership Fund, facilitates the, 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 the early stage climate risk screening and building it into, into the design. The other point here, which, which you, you, you'd hear coming up, is, is that of implementation and the challenges we face. Uh, it is important to consider the institutional capacity for project management and implementation even prior to design and, and seek to catalyze climate resources wherever possible to bolster the institutional capacity in, in our implementing agencies by providing them with the requisite training um, and sufficiently uh, assessing their skill sets and engaging uh, individuals who can support them um, in the implementation process. I also want to speak to the scale at which individual climate finance contributions are made. And I know this is a thorny issue, but it is one that we, we, we need to bring to the forefront. It is a key determinant of whether they can be allocated for large transformational initiatives. For, for the Caribbean region, it is important for us to start to move beyond a project-based approach. And I know that may sound strange coming from me as the director of projects, but, but, but the fact of the matter is that given the, for want of a better term, ad hoc uh, nature in which climate financing sometimes come based on either the, the, the reliability, the gestation period for approval with some of the, 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 the larger uh, donors, larger global donors in the climate um, finance space, governments struggle to program resources over a consistent five to 10 year period for building uh, resilience. And, and we've spoken about bringing the private sector on board, and I'm happy that Derek brought that on, because when governments program over a five-year period with, with, the, with the vision that climate finance resources, again from the international community, could leverage private sector involvement, if those resources aren't timely in coming, it, it then results in that budget allocation going elsewhere. Uh, and the crisis in the Caribbean that we face is is sufficient, it's so urgent that we can't afford delays in the scale of resources reaching uh, our shores. So we, we need to develop a more um, programmed approach for channeling resources. And, and Ron, you know, the, the last thing I want to touch on here in terms of the importance of, of, of concessional resourcing. Uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, worked with Cross Hughes, Sedema, and the OECS. Uh, in the past, and we are currently working now with them um, in terms of de developing a regional application document for the international um, building codes. We're also working with artisan training because, as I said, it's a multi-pronged approach. There's a financing approach. There's a regulatory approach. But the, the average homeowner cannot afford to go to a bona fide contractor. And so they'll go to maybe the, the father-in-law or the uncle or a friend 
it's important that these artisans are appropriately appropriately trained. And, and any last point I want to touch on is that of is that of testing. Uh, Derek mentioned it, but we're currently using grant resources uh, under the the European Partnership Agreement, Caribbean Single Market and Economy Standby Facility to enhance the capacity of countries within our region to offer calibration and testing services that will support key sectors such as construction and, ma and manufacturing. Why is that important? Well, some of the notable benefits of that is that we will be developing metrology labs in these countries, thereby ensuring accurate and comparable results by making tests and measurement results traceable. It also assists domestic suppliers to build trust with other participants in the global value chain. So you see, it is interconnected. And, and, and finally, uh, in terms of solutions and approaches around the use of technology, I know I touched on it earlier, but we can't say it enough, alternate building systems. I mean, such as structural insulated panels and insulated concrete forms, which have, all, has already been started to be used in some of our countries, such as Trinidad uh, and Belize, which combine energy efficiency, comfort and resilience. And there's a gender aspect to this. These forms uh, tend to be lightweight, um, which, which you know, um, can also be handled by, by women and, and younger persons. So, um, and I'm not saying, of course, in any way that, that women can't handle heavier forms, but I'm saying that that has too often been used as um, a, 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 a flag post as the way, you know, we can't hire women on this side or that side. And that's nonsense. And we're saying the technology out there allows fully uh, gender equality even within the construction sector in building resilience. Um, yeah. And then, of course, your homeland of Jamaica, in incorporating intelligent transport systems. Uh, you know, the Jamaica intelligent transport system is a revolutionary way to monitor and manage all road networks in, in Jamaica. This is something that can be rolled out across multiple sectors and across many of our, of our member states, of our, of our countries, such that um, response time uh, to, 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 to disasters, to natural hazards can be significantly significantly shortened so you know i think as i said um you, you may hear the passion in my voice because i'm excited uh about what happens next but we need the concessional resourcing to make it happen thanks a lot chair brilliant brilliant daniel i mean uh, uh, quite a lot there again i mean you know i, I don't know to, we're very grateful for the space to the, from the indian government but this is really rich in content and you know deserves another half an hour even though we don't have it um Isaac, so, so we've heard, you know, about the, all of the innovation that's going on in different spaces, the opportunities that are there, the positive outlook that you and Daniel shared. From your lens, I mean, where do you see solutions in, in closing this protection gap? I mean, you, you, you talked quite extensively around, you know, um, risk transfer and knowing a little bit more about it and bridging that challenge. But what are the solutions you see ahead building on where you are now, um, as, as Chris, but in particular, you, you singled out this issue with the protection gap. Talk to us a little bit about that and, and how do you see us getting around that? Absolutely, <clears throat> um, Ron, Ronald. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that we must never underestimate the ability of our people, of our regions, to be able to get um, common solutions to common problems. and. I mean, when I really look back, I think how CRIF came into being is, for me, a, an excellent example of this. Uh, this was, a, a, in a sense, a sort of homegrown solution. It was started off by the governments following Hurricane Ivan in the year 2004, which devastated a number of countries, particularly Grenada, uh, Cayman Islands, causing losses of almost 8 billion US dollars. It was really a wake-up call for these governments of the Caribbean who decided to approach the World Bank and with the support of the donor community and as well as the reinsurance market came to establish this, this risk facility, which uh, emerged as the world's first multi-country risk pool based on parametric insurance. And the whole idea <clears throat> is to be able to provide quick liquidity to the countries in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. Um, when we started off operations, we started off with earthquake provisions for earthquake 
um, tropical cyclone, we added excess rainfall. And interestingly, last year, we were able to launch a product design for the transmission and distribution uh, infrastructure of utility companies, uh, which we launched successfully last year. And the year before, we were also able to launch a product for coast designed specifically for the fishery sector. Um, and again, the whole idea is to provide that level of, of protection, not only to livelihoods, but also to the infrastructure. So we, what we have now seen is that with the establishment of CRIF, uh, we are seeing the opportunity to add even more innovation. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that we are currently working on, we have started a collaboration with the Caribbean Development Bank on the, um, on the creation or development of a index-based parametric insurance product for the agricultural sector, you would know, um, Ron, that one of the problems that has plagued the region is, is the risk in agriculture, all right? And while there have been various experiments with respect to uh, protection and so on, those have failed. And that is because they were not really properly structured and so on. So we are now seeing with the advent of, the, of insurance, parametric insurance, we've seen an opportunity to be able to provide a solution there. So the first thing that I would really like to say is that let us build on that success. Let us see how we could optimize the value of what we do. And, and the other thing is that we, we also need to, to explore other disaster risk financing instruments. Uh, I mean, I'm pleased to see some of the work that the governments are doing, particularly Jamaica, uh, St. Lucia, in terms of disaster risk finance framework that they have put in place. And they are looking to see how they could um, introduce other um, instruments because they understand that no single instrument can help you achieve the required resources. Insurance will not do it alone. Uh, loans from the CDB is not going to be enough, you know. So we do have to look at cat bonds and so on. And I'm pleased to see what the government of Jamaica is doing, where they are prepared to to launch a cat bond to help them provide that much needed resources. But I would like to see the region go much further than that. I think we can actually develop or, or establish a, a regional CAD bond facility, even using the CRIF facility. We have actually done CAD bonds um, through the World Bank, but there's no reason that we cannot do more. So, you know, the point I want to make is that there's just so many opportunities right now um, in, in the space of innovation to be able to help countries release and find the much needed resources in order to be able to respond um, to the various disasters. I mean, there's so much more that I can say, but I realize we do have a time constraint. Absolutely, absolutely. As I said, I mean, this is really, really rich. Um, I'm hoping we can probably, you know, talk with CDRI, have a, probably a follow-up webinar in their, in their webinar series at some point. Um, Sandra, I hope I'm not pushing the boundaries, but, but this, is, this is quite rich. Um, we, we have a lot of questions coming in. We're, we're battling with time. I want to hear from from Sadim, I want to hear from our discussion on all that she has heard um, today um, and, and, and really giving us a reflection as, as our, our panelists seek to unpack from challenges to solutions, looking at opportunities and approaches. So, so Andrea, over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And a sincere thanks as well to the government of India and the ICDRI for the invitation. I want to give my sincere greetings to, to you, firstly, and to my esteemed panel colleagues and the diverse participants who are joining us today. It has indeed been a very rich conversation. As you can see, I've been taking copious notes <laughs> and certainly won't have the time to explore this richness in the time that has been allocated for this discourse. But let me just um, take a few minutes, I would say, to to, to, to reflect on some of the messages that I have heard and to add Sidima's contribution to that conversation. One of the first messages I think that we have heard from the panelists is that the Caribbean is, uh, is, is multi-hazard in nature, but strategic actions are also being advanced. As one of the panelists indicated, we live in a tough neighborhood. And I will also add that we have new norms that are emerging. The history of e e economic and social dis dislocation that is resulting from the impacts of a diversity of hazards in the Caribbean 
is significant from earthquakes to cyclones, tropical cyclones, volcanic eruptions and floods. And since 1950, we have had 511 disasters worldwide hitting small states with developing economies. And of these, 324 are in the Caribbean. And the current COVID-19 pandemic is reinforcing the susceptibility of the region to biological hazards. We also know that according to the CRED report on economic losses, poverty and disasters, that 40% of the top 10 climate related disasters for absolute losses over the last 20 years, that's four out of 10, these events affected the Caribbean countries. That's Irma, Maria, Ike, and Ivan. So this is the tough neighborhood really that we live in. And uh, we recognize that we have those new norms that are emerging. We have these biological hazards, we have the COVID-19. But we do have strategic actions that are being advanced. Uh, we, we have heard already about our comprehensive disaster management strategy 2014 to 2024, and the companion 2018 resilience framework um, known as the pathway for resilience and its five pillars, one of which focuses on safeguarding infrastructure. But notably, this cannot be divorced from two other pillars that are also under the resilience framework, which is enhancing economic opportunity, because we've talked about the financing issues, as well as operational readiness and recovery. Together, this provides the opportunity for real relevance to this conversation in advancing the agenda. And so we would want to say that the, we have a good foundation in the region for being able to advance and to address the issues that are, are before us. So we need to give greater attention to them. The second matter that I think that we have heard is the whole matter of risk governance, institutional arrangements and accelerating implementation. At Sedema, we recognize that the nature of risk is systemic, and we need to move away from the traditional idea that events are isolated, and hence there's a need for systemic risk governance to appropriately match the nature of systemic risks. In the context, in that context, the, the CDM approach, which advances all hazards, all phases, and all peoples to, in an, in, as we seek to achieve resilience in an integrated manner, includes the promotion of intersectoral approaches. We've talked about the involvement of various various sectors, including the private sector, et cetera, and all peoples in this agenda and all hazards. And this also supports the, um, the Sendai Framework for Disasters Reduction. So in that context, this network approach to risk governance is inherent to the CDM approach. As such, as we move forward, we need to see better institutional arrangements as well as accelerating implementation, which can be possible with better will and coordination as indicated by one of our panelists. And within the built environment, we need to see significant changes within the building regulations, which address climate change and involve the private sector. And this is in keeping with priority area three of the CDM, which is looking at mainstreaming CDM into key sectors. There are several more, but I will highlight particularly two at this time. The whole matter of financing. We've heard the messages that resources are insufficient they're unpredictable, they are, odd, they are ad hoc, and they're not really programmed. So we do need to look at a better programming approach to, the, um, to financing. We talked about the concessional financing, uh, such as the cap bonds, et cetera. Under the CDM, we do have the uh, in institutional strengthening, priority area one, where we are seeking to address the matter of having adequate resourcing for CDM implementation. And I do think that there is a lot of investment that, that countries are making to reduce risk, but that's not fully captured. And this is something that we actually need to address better. I also want you to per permit me, because I think it would be remiss of me not to address the whole, mattery, the whole matter of reparatory justice. We know that this is named, this is aimed at the uh, at national and inter international reconciliation, given the history of the Caribbean. And this agenda is being very much pushed and being advanced. But in this agenda, there is the issue of debt cancellation for our small island developing states of the Caribbean, our boss, as we want to uh, certainly um, refer to them at this time, 
it's debt cancellation, but the, the other issue is the whole matter of the, the establishment of a fund which would allow us to achieve our development aspirations. And I think that this is something that has to be on this agenda if we're talking about having financing that would actually address the, the issues that we have. I, I know we've talked about risk informed planning and design, which is also in keeping with CDM priority area two on knowledge knowledge management, where we're seeking to look at risk informed decision making and the whole issues of technology, which is a is a cross cutting theme. And and, 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 and and we don't have time to fully explore all of these, but I, I think and I want to support your 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 um your intervention, Chair, of probably having you know another conversation on, on this. But I, I, I want to take the opportunity here to just put a little bit of a nugget here. And it really is in this whole conversation as we, we seek to address the infrastructure. In fact, the typology of hazards affecting the Caribbean region does suggest that infrastructure, but in particular housing, is most as at threat. In the Caribbean region, with our history, our on uh, in our landscape, houses were not really designed to withstand anything. They were designed ready to be to, to move and to move quickly. And if we are able to address the matter of safer housing in the Caribbean, we've talked about the, 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 the building codes, et cetera, that has come up. If we are able to address the whole matter of safer housing, we would be able to change this whole agenda significantly for us because if when we talk about housing, we're not only talking about economic losses, but there is a social dimension that is really associated with this as well. And so this needs to be, be treated with in a very direct way. In fact, if you if you look at the 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 losses emerging from major events uh, spanning from when Sidema was established in 19, well, Sidera as Sidema was established in 1991 and coming forward, from the volcanic emergency in 1995 to 97, um, I went in Grenada in 2004, the Haiti earthquake in 2010, Irma Maria 2017, with its impacts on the um, British Virgin Islands, Barbuda and Dominica, this has been a real issue. And so this is a matter that has to be treated not only because of the economic as and development aspirations, but also the social dimensions when we look at infrastructure and we relate to housing. And I will, I will rest there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. I'm um, really good. Colleagues, uh, we, we're out of time, but I have to really offer a space to our, to our, to our participants. And, and I have a lot of questions. I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick two of them and I'm going to ask that you, you, in one minute, um, each panel touch this. Um, there, there's one, you can choose which one, one which asks, from the point of view of the technical standards for critical infrastructure in the Caribbean and trying to improve them and enhance resilience, which sector would you recommend to be prioritized for investment? The, 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 which sector would you pick, looking at the Caribbean itself, which one of the sectors would you prioritize for investment in, in, in resilience um, from an infra infrastructure standpoint? And the second question is, what is the role of the end user I mean, we've talked about these barriers, we've talked about will, we've talked about what is the role of the end use and the general public in pushing countries to adopt a resilient infrastructure, you know, fast tracking and accelerating that, um, as you said. Derek, you want to touch one? If you don't, you can say pass. Um, yeah, so, so for, for us, um, we've been working closely with CDB, CDEMA, and the OECS Commission in looking at the informal housing sector. Because like Andrea say, said, where we come from, houses were meant to move. Now they have to be stationary. Um, so we need to find a way to upscale the informal to the formal because maybe close to about 70% um, of our building stock in the Caribbean is housing. And out of that 70%, maybe another 50% or more is informal. So that's so how we do that. And, you know, the, the other part of it in terms of the end user, it requires a lot of education for them to realize that it's cheaper to invest in a more resilient housing now rather than have to face the cost of repair and recovery and rehabilitation later. 
but you know necessity has its own laws. Um, sir, sir Ambassador Slater, you have to leave. You, 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 you yeah. want to pick a sector as you run, as you, you run off? <laughs> um, well, I, I already start switching my head to other issues. Okay, okay, no. um, COVID, but um, I concur with um, Derek. Um, and so let me really quickly say thank you to all of you. As I stated in my chat, it has been very engaging. And I really do hope that there are a lot of persons listening to the stream. Um, I particularly um, was um, hooked on Daniel's presentation and some of the metaphors of cricket and so on. But um, <laughs> we really have to go at an all, all, you know, all out um, attack. Um, the our Indian colleagues, however, yeah. might um, uh, want to, <laughs> to to challenge us <laughs> on that. We we don't have the attack we used to have, Daniel. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nonetheless, no, but seriously, though, no. um, yeah. I hope that we we really have this that this discussion has been di well disseminated because it's uh, uh, our will be done. It's on YouTube. This session. It's so, on YouTube, um, so we we'll give it to disseminate. It's really, um, and, and don't forget, colleagues, that we are at the not too far away from June when so we are entering start. into the season that all of us have been speaking about. And we didn't even touch issues of volcano. We have a member state right now facing that. Well, right, not touch, but we didn't go into details there, but there, there are so many things. But really, I have to run. Thank you, I'm thank you, Ambassador. Tonight. Thank you very um, much, everybody. Good. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, colleagues, I'm going to I'm going to wrap now. I'm I'm mindful of our of our host and and, and the time it is in in in, in New Delhi and, and and in India, you know. But I but I do take the call that we may have to revisit some of the very important points raised. Um, not simply because we we shouldn't only see ourselves as victims, but but also as the sometimes the architect of our own future. And Daniel, um, Isaac. Andrea and I think Derek outlined quite a, a bit of solutions, some positive things that are unfolding in the region that we need to upscale, we need to accelerate, and the opportunities that are presented there. So today we heard perspectives from innovation, the importance of partnerships in, in advancing infrastructure resilience, the engagement of key stakeholders, which must be a part in, in this process, including the, the role of the end users, the network approach and its importance in, in for risk governance, um, the, the need to look at will, whether we want to call it political will, whether we want to call it individual will, and the importance of coordinating in a, in a space of very limited resources, the, the need to change the, the, the sort of elements in the, in the built environment. And I know Andrew raised the point of the, the housing sector. When, when Sedera was created, there was a target of reducing the vulnerability of the housing stock by 80%. And, and, and we still recognize that this is still certainly a challenge that we have to, we have to tackle. And, and the role of risk informing in, in, in the development process, risk informing development uh, for decision making. These are all important things that came out, financing or programming approaches and looking at this whole issue of reparatory justice and debt cancellation, a big issue, a big talking point that I think will we'll continue going forward. Colleagues, I want to thank you very much for, for, for participating, for answering the call and, and really enlivening the debate and the discourse. Um, more is yet to be shared and we're hoping we will get an opportunity to do so. I want to thank the Government of India and the Director General of CDRI and his entire team for providing a space for the Caribbean voice to be shared in this very important international uh, gathering. Uh, thanks, and I look forward to seeing you in the future.
sorry for that that was a technical glitch in the system so let me restart uh, thank you so much ronald for the enriching discussion uh, i would not like to uh, repeat any of the uh, key takeaways because those have been so well summarized by ronald but i would like to say that the comment of daniel about the west indies space attack uh, took me back to the days of radio when we were listening to malcolm marshall and andy roberts taking their 40 paces of run up when india only had about the spinners with their three or four paces of run up so that was really uh, good remembrance uh, i will take your offer of follow up webinar in fact as you are aware the cdri is uh, planning to work with special focus on small island developing states or if we we can start calling them the boss uh, and we are exploring the possibility of having a facility within cdri uh, to work speci specially for uh, the states and uh, we would definitely like to have follow up webinars discussions because this kind of discussion will need much more time Uh, probably on specific sectoral issues like insurance or capacity building and we will be definitely happy to do that so with that i thank all the panelists uh, and the keynote speaker ambassador slater for joining this session thank you so much for spending time uh, in this last session of second day of international co uh, conference on disaster resilient infrastructure thank you friends for joining and we will be meeting again tomorrow in the th on the third day of the international conference with our session which will be at 14:30 on disaster risk finance and its associated issue so thank you good night good morning as per the geography thank you thank you ron thank you so much <laughs>